Venom went through a lot of things after the Agent Venom run, but he eventually ended up on the body of Eddie Brock. And today we're going to be exploring Eddie Brock as he finally learns a lot of the history of the Venom symbiote and how he is involved in the King of Black. This is the Donny Cates Venom run that ran from 2018 to 2021, and you are at Comic Storian, where we take some of your favorite comic books, turn them into these audio dramas, so you know what's going on in the world of comics. So today, let's do Venom 2018. There was a loud boom at the gates of a Norse fort, and as a group of soldiers backed the doors from coming down, one of the soldiers shouts, asking, Where the hell is Beowulf? As he does, a black goo begins to seep through the cracks, grabbing onto the men. And as the lightning outside strikes, the gates give way, and the soldiers are ripped from inside out and put into the mouth of a snarling dragon. The dragon chews on the men, screaming something in a language that no one can understand, until there's no one left to hear it. Just then, there's another strike of lightning over New York City, and Eddie Brock wakes up in his bed in a cold sweat. He leans up asking, Where are you? And he sees Venom in a goopy mess on the floor. He says it's okay. There's just thunder outside, nothing to be afraid of, and Venom tells him, Not scared of the storm. You saw it, right? The monster. Eddie says, Yeah. I didn't know symbiotes could have nightmares. And Venom says, Neither did I. Why does our mind hurt? What is wrong with us? Eddie gets out of the bed telling him, It's nothing. We're gonna be okay. We just need... And Venom shouts, LYING! Eddie grabs the small container taking a few pills and Venom asks, Why did you do this? We can be better. Please, don't kill your heart. Eat our brains! But as Venom goes on, his voice begins to fade until finally, Eddie can think without the voices. The antipsychotics are slowly drowning out Venom's screams, and then Eddie hears the police radio that Jack-O-Lantern has been spotted doing an arms deal and that they need backup. So he suits up even though he can no longer hear Venom speak, and he quickly rushes over to the warehouse that the police mentioned over the radio. As Eddie arrives, he doesn't actually go into the fight. He goes to take pictures. Since losing his job at the fact sheet, he's gotta make money somehow. As the police move in, Jack starts firing at the officers trying to escape. That is until Eddie knocks him to the ground. Jack falls to the ground, breaking his helmet, and the man inside yells, Please, just let me go! I won't tell anyone that I saw you! But Venom kneels down, gouging out the man's eyes, stating, No, you won't! Soon the officers run up to where Jack went, and that's when they see Eddie killing him, so they begin to shoot at Eddie. However, as Eddie gets up, he turns back, and he begins to shout something in that ancient language that he heard in Venom's nightmare. And suddenly he's covered in strange red markings. Inside of his own head, Eddie is shouting at Venom, asking, What's wrong? And then something hits him in the forehead and it begins to beep. Eddie silently begs, Whoever's there, please, just kill us. Before it's too late, kill us now! I don't know what this is. And as the explosion goes off, it engulfs the alleyway that Eddie is in, and shortly after, he leans up asking what just happened. A man stands over him, stating, On your feet, Thompson. The cops will be blind for another few minutes. We gotta hustle. Eddie asks, Thompson? I'm not Flash Thompson. And the man asks, You aren't? Well, that's kind of disappointing. Guess you'll have to do anyway. And then he fires a trank dart into Eddie's neck. A short while later, Venom's telling Eddie, You need to wake up! We need to kill this man! And Eddie screams to him to shut up! He looks around, seeing himself chained to a chair next to the furnace. And the man from before flicks a lighter, asking, Is that hot enough for you? Eddie asks, What the hell is this, and what does he want with him? And the man leans out from the shadows, revealing an old, scruffy face, stating, I'm just gonna cut to the chase. I need help. I wanted Flash Thompson, but I guess that intel's a bit outdated. The man flicks the light closed, asking, Do you know anything about Project Rebirth? And he tells him, yeah, the program that made Captain America and nothing else good. A few years back, it was started up only this time using my other. The man laughs. Never heard anyone call the symbiotes that before. Anyway, Flash wasn't the first one through that rebirth program with a symbiote. He was just the latest. The man holds up a picture of himself and a group of soldiers telling Eddie, My name is Rex Strickland, and I know more about the symbiotes than some may think. So let me ask you a question. Your symbiote is, what do you call it, other? You guys have been together a long time. What's its name? How old is it? What does it eat? What's its ideal temperature? Eddie thinks and he simply says, I'm not sure. And Rex says, well, I do, and I can help fix him. Eddie snaps. I don't need to be fixed. And Rex asks, is that all right? Had any nightmares lately, Eddie? Eddie pauses and then asks, what do you want? 
and Rex tells him, It's simple. My partners, they weren't so lucky on getting away. They went on too many missions and got themselves permanently bonded to their symbiotes. They went insane and S.H.I.E.L.D. put them on ice. Right now, those men are being brought to one of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s black box sites to be destroyed. Those men, they were good men, and I can't let that happen. Eddie looks at the photo of the soldiers all wearing symbiotes asking, Where did you all come from? And Rex says, That's a good question. You want to help me find the answer? A short while later, Eddie heads into the underground tunnel leading to the black box site, and as the transport convoy starts to pass by, Eddie suits up charging at the truck. The two cars on the side spin around, and Venom walks towards them, with a soldier getting out asking, Is that Venom? Shoot him! Venom grabs one of the cars, throwing it into the other, and with no more gunfire, he makes his way back to the transport truck. As soon as he opens it, something explodes at a swarm of ancient-looking symbiotes begins to walk out. As they get closer to Eddie, they start to speak in that same ancient language, and Venom begins to separate himself from Eddie. Eddie shouts for Venom to come back, telling him, If you don't, I'm gonna handle it myself! He lunges at one of the symbiotes, holding out its arm, stabbing it through Eddie's chest, and then making it out his back with a loud splunge sound. Eddie's body falls to the ground, and Venom returns, telling Eddie, I'm gonna fix you! And Eddie looks up, seeing the symbiotes climbing back onto the truck. Just then, there's a flash of light and an ear-piercing shriek, and the bodies of the old soldiers begin to fall out, separated from their symbiotes. A rumble starts to split the streets open, and a giant winged creature begins to shoot into the sky, with Eddie asking, What were those things saying? Venom tells him, It's a dead language, not spoken in millions of years. They're saying, God is coming, Eddie. Before Eddie could lose consciousness, Venom begins repairing what he can on Eddie, squeezing his heart to get it to beat again. Later, back at Rex's hideout, he flicks his lighter, stating that maybe he's put his faith in a nobody, looking at the picture of his old squad. A few seconds later, Eddie's voice tells Rex that his men are dead. You lied. Rex gets out of his chair as Eddie stumbles in, asking him, What the hell happened? What do you mean my men are gone? Eddie throws a metal barrel at Rex, telling him, You send me to die. Whatever game you're trying to play, I ain't buying it. As the anger builds up, Eddie begins to feel Venom change into something more primal, and then he repeats the same language that the ancients began to say earlier. Eddie corners Rex around the furnace, and as Eddie gains control, he yells for Rex to move. Eddie rips the grate off of the furnace. As the fire burns, Eddie screams in pain, falling backwards, and Rex asks, What the hell was that language? Eddie rubs his face, asking, Do you not know? Turn on the TV and see for yourself. Rex flicks on the TV to the news as a reporter begins to state that the people are describing what they say is an oil-covered dragon bursting out of the ground. He goes on explaining that whatever that thing is, it ripped the symbiotes off of your men, devouring them, leaving the soldiers as dead husks. Just what the hell did you bring us into? And Rex closes his eyes, stating, I thought it was dead. Back during the war, we were hit with napalm after being shot to death, trying to give my men some cover. When I woke up, all I could hear was Fury stating, do it, and then I was injected. I could feel the symbiote entering my veins, and I could see all of the horrible things that it did, even though it was just a piece of the damn thing. I knew it was something ancient, something older than us. It had wings, and when it spoke, I couldn't make out what it was trying to say. But now, after hearing it scream in my dreams, it says God is coming. The news continues, its report on the symbiote dragon. And as Rex watches, he says, Okay, we're gonna need to come up with a plan, Eddie. We can't just... But when he looks back, he sees Eddie is gone. And he simply says, That's stupid. Out on the streets, the police race to the scene to try and fight the symbiote dragon. But as Eddie watches, he feels Miles Morales' Spider-Man appearing behind him. Time slowly begins to pass. How much time, Eddie doesn't know. All he knows is that when he opens his eyes, he can feel the primal instincts kicking in as he stands over Miles' body. It's at that moment that he realizes while he was in control, he was killing Spider-Man. Eddie leans down to bite off Miles Morales' head, but he manages to get the words out, KILL ME! Miles tells him, Fine by me! And he punches Venom back. He grabs onto the tongue and he tells him, Just remember, you asked for this. With his other hand, he releases a shock into Venom's neck, ripping out his tongue. And he begins coughing as Venom just drips off of him. And he tells him, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what happened, but thanks. My name is... But before he could finish, Miles continues to punch him, shouting, I know who you are! You're a monster! Miles continues to beat into Eddie, and when he's finally got his strength back, Eddie suits up, grabbing Miles' foot, throwing him into a wall. He then webs him up, telling him, Stop this! Just listen! Miles yells, No! You hurt my mother! And Eddie stops asking, Wait, we what? Venom pulls back the mask, revealing Eddie, and Miles goes on stating, Something like you, I'm, I'm not sure anymore. Whatever it was hit my dad and it took my mom and Eddie stops him telling him, Look, my name is Eddie Brock and I do not know you. To the best of my knowledge, I didn't hurt your mother. But if we did, then we can settle that later. You have my word. But right now we need to stop whatever that thing is from destroying the city. So how about we do the world a favor and kill that monster? 
Miles gets up telling him, fine, but when this is over, and Eddie says, yeah, yeah, you ain't the first Spider-Man. Got any more of that thing you hit me with? Miles tells him, uh, yeah, it's called a Venom Blast. The two swing off the building with Eddie stating, good name. And Miles says, yeah, just shut up. I can release it all at once, but it pretty much leaves me wasted afterwards. The two get closer to the dragon with Miles asking, what is that thing? And Venom tells him, it's some kind of ancient symbiote like us, but... Miles says, worse, bigger, meaner, scarier, like a little uglier, but not by a long shot. And Venom yells, okay, let's do this. We need to get close so we can hit the dragon with your Venom Blast. And Miles says, how do you propose we go about doing that without getting eaten? Venom says, eaten, huh? Good idea. And then he grabs Miles, throwing him into the dragon's mouth. Miles yells back, just so you know, I hate this plan. And the dragon chomps down, swallowing Miles whole. Eddie calls out, it's now or never. And suddenly the dragon's head begins to explode. The sound the dragon makes, it's something that Eddie will remember for the rest of his life. The sound of a thousand jet engines wailing and screaming in horror. Except as the dragon falls apart, Eddie realizes that the dragon is screaming at him. Inside his head, it's roaring, screaming, and it's singing. He goes to check on Miles to see him still breathing, and then a voice calls out from above, shouting, Stop where you are and put your hands on your head. The man looks up at the police helicopter, and he holds out his arms towards it, and part of the dragon's body reaches out with him. The goop turns into a hand, grabbing onto the helicopter and then crushing it. And the man says... How small and fragile. As the helicopter explodes, Eddie can feel it again. He feels it fade away as his other takes control, but this time he lets it. The primal venom screams as his jaw unhinges and the man smiles, showing his teeth, telling him, Look at that. How beautiful. However, you cannot touch me. Venom swings, ripping away at part of that man's face, and as it slowly begins to reform, the man says, I pilot this vessel, but I am far, far away from here. The man holds out his hand towards Venom, telling him, Stop! And he hits Venom with a blast. Venom is blown away and he's ripped off of Eddie's body. And the man then uses the parts of Venom to create a dome around the three of them, stating, It's loud out there. Let us be alone. Eddie picks himself up, asking, Where am I? And the man says, My child, what has been done to you? Why are you in this place? Eddie shouts, telling the man, Answer me! And the man says, Your host is screaming. Come to me, child. Venom slowly slithers over to the man, wrapping himself around him. The man holds Venom up, stating, Your host shuts you out, silences you. You are broken. Shall I fix you? And he gets up, crawling, Please, don't, don't take it away. It's all I have. I can't be alone. The man pays him no mind, looking at Venom, stating, You have been infected. Infected by humanity. Let us burn that away from you. As a flash of light into Venom begins to screech, and Eddie yells, stop it, you're hurting him. But before Eddie could finish, the man grabs him by the throat, telling him, be quiet. You want to know what I am? Then allow me to show you. The man opens up his mouth as fangs pop out, and he tells him, I am Null, Lord of the Abyss, God of the Symbiotes. In the beginning, there was nothing, and then there was war. Light started to engulf the void with its bright light, and inside of that light were the gods. They saw his home as incomplete, so they began to mold it as they saw fit. They called his kingdom space, as if it were empty and needed to be filled. But his kingdom was not empty. The abyss was not dead. His lands were not theirs to raise and reform to remake. So he fought, showed his teeth, and tasted for the first time the blood of the light. And for that crime, he was banished. But the gods did not know what they had done. They sent him home, back into the void. It was there inside of the forge that he made inside the skull of the first god that he slayed. And it was there that the first of what they would call symbiotes was made. The symbiotes were first created as a blade, smithed under his hammer and designed to kill. His early works were unrefined, and thus the creation of the first proto-symbiote was unclean, to say the least. Even to this day, the weaker of his creations carry the scars of the progenerator's birth inside of them. They still fear the fire of the forge, and still he swung the hammer, bearing their will into something wieldy, into something beautiful. With the weapon he forged in hand, he set out to banish the bright and all that came with it. 
In his time as Living Blade would become known as the All Black, the Necrosword, the God Slayer. Together they slit the throats of creation and choked a billion stars with the blood of the Almighty until they fell. All Black, his firstborn, was taken from him by some doomed wretch who had come to curse its name. Can you imagine it? A dark god falling from the heavens and giving a gift that they cannot hope to even understand. As Null holds Eddie up, his tendrils begin to bury deep inside of Eddie's head, and Eddie tells him, Yeah, I can. Show me everything. Null continues to explain the origins, speaking of the time after that when he was alone. A new hunger arose within him, and from that a revelation. He discovered that if he had bonded his living abyss with lesser creatures, he could manifest and pilot their new forms as vessels. It was here that it truly began, and so he gathered his horde. And once he was alone, he was now the center. He became their hive mind, the god host. He could wear and control them from across galaxies, see through their eyes, and little by little the void grew darker. And then there was Earth. There were these small, gentle creatures, creatures that could hide and protect their young, and they would cry and scream and not battle. He was quite taken by these pathetic creatures, but he was not lured here by the scent of man, no, their planet reeked of light. Their thunder god, Thor, unleashed a power that he had never before felt in all of the worlds that he had wrapped his horde around. And in the blink of an eye, he stabbed him like a billion needles into their hearts. They were undone. With the connection to its children severed and a galaxy away, they would begin to unravel to reach out and seek new hosts. He could no longer hive mind them. They were alone and they became parasites, infecting his children with light. Their horrid notion of honor, the lies of nobility and light and life, it poisoned the hive. It was like venom. His children roared into mutiny. They rose up millions and more, untethered from his hive mind control, spawning endlessly, and he was consumed by the abyss of his own creation. Do you understand now? This is how my children became the Clintar. This is what they hide. They don't want you to know their history. Eddie tells him, no, it can't be true. The Clintar told my other that, and Null stops him asking, they told you that you were great warriors? My children would give anything to turn their eyes blind to what they want to conceal. They lie, they are weak, they are betrayers, but soon I will free them from their Clintar. Eddie says, I don't understand. What does that even mean, their Clintar? Clintar is their race, it's who they are, it's the planet they come from. Null no, lets out a loud laugh. <laughs> Eddie, you are but a simple and trusting host. I see why my children adore you so. You have been lied to for so very long. What you think is their home world is nothing more than the largest host of symbiotes in the galaxy trying desperately to keep their greatest secret. Do you see the shape of it now? Do you understand? There is no planet of symbiotes. Clintar is their word for cage. It is where I am right now, where I have been sleeping for eons. I am there, imprisoned, and now I am here piloting this. What do you call it, the Grendel? But now, their god is awake and God is coming home. When the Grendel is complete, the dragon symbiote, when I find its missing parts, it will come for me, the real me, and it will free me from the Clintar. I will finish what I began. I will be rid of this dark kingdom of invasive light once and for all, starting with Earth. Just then, Spider-Man, aka Miles Morales, jumps in, punching Null with his venom fist, freeing Eddie from his grasp, and as Null begins to reform, he asks, Do you think you've won? You are nothing! Spider-Man runs up to one of the walls, ripping and tearing it open, and when he looks inside, he says, Oh. Oh God, no! Spider-Man watches as the giant black symbiote dragon Grendel soars over the earth searching for what Null is searching for. A few moments later, Eddie begins to open up his eyes, but Venom tells him, don't be afraid. Eddie begins to look around and he finds himself plummeting to earth right next to Spider-Man. He asks, what the hell? Spider-Man tells him, yeah, it was either this or we stay in the belly of a symbiote dragon, so I'm here to call. Venom then says, you need to listen. And Eddie yells, not now! Does Spider-Man have some kind of web parachute? And Spider-Man yells, that's the wrong Spider-Man. Can't you do a Venom thing? And Eddie shouts, I don't know how! And Venom screams, listen! Grab the spider and go limp. Do it now! Eddie says, wait, why do you sound different? And Venom tells him, I will explain later. Trust me, we've got you, Eddie. Eddie grabs Spider-Man and giant wings sprout out of his back. And Spider-Man asks, you can fly? Eddie tells him, it's news to us too. 
Thanks for the assist back there. Just keep your head down for now. Eddie safely drops Miles off, and Miles yells, Hey, get back here! And as he tries to web onto Eddie, nothing comes out. He sighs, stating, Right, yeah, okay. Uh, you seem like you got this. Man, I hate symbiote stuff. A short while later, Eddie lands in an alleyway and he says, This is too much. I don't even know where to start. And Venom tells him, Your heart is beating very fast. You're scared. Would you want me to alter the chemicals in your body to calm you down? Eddie asks, You could do that? And Venom tells him, We could do so many things now. Says, When do you have wings? And Venom tells him, Says, When do we have wings? It is not our intent to scare you, so allow me to explain. Null tried to burn my connection to the light away. My connection to you. Null is attempting to absorb me into his symbiote and join his horde, but the connection was interrupted by the spider. And he says, what does that even mean? And Venom says, good things and bad things. We seem to have gained a new strength from our connection to the god host and his primordial symbiote. We are now capable of so much more. It has been a very long time. We've forgotten the power that comes from our numbers. And though the process was not complete for a brief moment, we felt connected. We were not. Eddie says, alone, I get it. So what's the bad news? Venom goes on telling him, The abyss, the void, Null. He stared back. As long as we are together, Null will be able to find us, to infect us. He is coming for us, and we cannot hide. As Venom bonds with Eddie, he says, we may know of a way to fight Null, but there is something else you should know. Moments later, Eddie crashes through the sunroof of Rex's hideout, shouting for him. And Rex tells him, I thought you were... Eddie stops him, telling him, We figured it out while we kept losing control. Those voices, the nightmares, every time we lost control and turned into that thing. We thought we were going insane, but we know better now. My other was just reacting instinctively. Like an animal baring its teeth to its alpha, the primordial symbiote that carried Null's darkness across the stars. The alley, the warehouse, the rooftop, my other is reacting to something else, protecting me. We should have seen it. It was never us. It was you! Eddie turns his arm into a giant spike, punching Rex through the head with a loud splorch. As the spike retracts, Eddie looks through the hole in Rex's head and he tells him, Show us your teeth! Rex's voice changes and his head reforms and he shows that he himself is a symbiote. And he tells him, I'm sorry. Eddie says, You are part of Null's Grendel symbiote. Tell me the truth. Was there ever a Rex Strickland? Rex tells him, Yes, Rex was my host, lost in Vietnam. He was a good man and he died out there. And then I became him. I am him. I have been for a very long time. I didn't want to go back to Null. S.H.I.E.L.D. was going to lock us away, and I found something in Rex in humanity that I never knew. I could not go back. I couldn't go back to the Hive into Null. When I sent you to save those men, I swear I didn't know Grendel was still alive. I hadn't felt its presence in so long. I thought I could be free. Null built us to hunt the light, but the light, it's beautiful. Rex tells him yes. Eddie says, can you hear him? And Venom says, we can hear so many new things, Eddie. Rex yells, oh god, you've made contact with Null. And Venom says, yes, he attempted to absorb us into his. Eddie stops him, stating, can we stop talking to each other through me? And Eddie goes on, Null said something about us when we faced it, something about him being completed and wanting to be freed from his cage. What does he mean? We took the other four pieces of his Grendel off those soldiers, and now he's going to hunt for them. If he ever gets them, it's over. Venom takes over and says, there's no other way. And he holds out his hand. Join us. Null wanted to absorb us, and as a result, he made me stronger. He unlocked a fraction of what we can become, but we are not strong enough alone to stop him. Rex tells him, I can't help you. I am. And Venom stops him, stating, Remember who you are. Remember what makes our species great. We are better when we are not alone. We are powerful. We are strong. We are. Rex begins to bond with Eddie and Venom, and Venom lets out a loud scream. And he finishes his sentence. We are at war. Inside Eddie's head, Rex asks Eddie if he's okay. And Eddie says, yeah. Wait, Rex? And Rex tells him, yeah, I'm here. Don't worry. Your friend's here too. He's just letting me drive for a bit. If we're gonna do this, we need to get ready. This ain't my first war, and I've spent enough time in S.H.I.E.L.D. that I may or may not have borrowed a few things. We might not be able to throw lightning, but this armory should be able to bring the thunder. Venom begins grabbing every weapon that he can, bonding into his body, and he turns Eddie into a one-man army. As Eddie gets back to the rooftop of his hideout, he asks, What do we do now? And Rex tells him, We need to reconnect with the Hive and call Null to us. Eddie says, Okay, what are you waiting for? And Rex tells him, I'm not, I already did it. 
Just then, Eddie feels the presence of something, and Grendel comes smashing down into the building, trying to eat him. Eddie picks himself up, hitting Grendel with an anti-symbiote weapon stored away from Rex's armory, and Grendel sticks out its neck, and he bites down, nearly swallowing Eddie. Eddie holds Grendel's mouth open, and Rex says that he's hanging on to these sonic grenades just for such an occasion. Rex pops the pins on them, dropping them into Grendel's throat, and a second later, they explode, throwing Eddie back. Eddie looks back, and Rex says, okay, the dragon is down. The connection is interrupted. You know what that means? And Eddie tells him, yeah, him. Null pulls himself out of the body of Grendel, stating, ah, you have something that I need. He lunges at Eddie, and for once, there's no talking inside of his head. Him, Venom, and Rex are all fighting against the end like a caged animal. Teeth, machine guns, blood against the first god of the abyss, and that's when it hits Eddie. He doesn't know what he has to live for. Null's spine stab into Eddie, and Eddie shrugs off the pain, thinking that he's not sure he's a good man, or that he can ever be one. But he knows one thing. He knows that with every blow that he takes, every bone that he breaks, every drop of blood that fills his mouth, he's not ready to give into this darkness. Null rips Venom off of Eddie, throwing his body to the side, and Eddie asks, You really wanted my other. Several sonic grenades begin to beep, and Eddie says, That's not a symbiote. That's a coffin. The grenades then begin to go off, electrocuting Null, separating him from Grendel and his mind from the hive. Null's face begins to deform, and he says, No human as good! Ah, you a god! Venom begins to bond back into Eddie, and he says, No, far from it. But I kind of figured you wouldn't be too fond of the light. You okay? Venom tells him, Yes! Rex protected me from the blast! I cannot hear him anymore. Are you okay, Eddie? And he tells him no, but I'm getting there. Null begins to gather the Grendel, towering over Eddie, asking, Do you think you've won? You have no idea what I am. I am their god. Eddie braces for the hit, and then he stops when there's nothing. Rex wraps himself around at Null, shouting to Eddie that he knows what to do. Open the blast doors! Eddie turns back, and he pries open the furnace door, and Rex begins to push Null inside. Rex yells to close the door, and Eddie pushes himself against it to keep it shut. He can feel Venom screaming as he presses, and it mixes with the sound of a god burning to death behind him. Venom begins to separate himself from Eddie, shouting, The fire! And Eddie keeps himself pressed against the door, telling Venom, We have to hold this! The fire begins to burn Eddie, and Venom yells, I can't protect you! You're burning alive! We can't take more of this or we will all die! Eddie tells Venom, get inside of me, I'll protect you, just turn off all of my pain receptors. Venom hesitates, and Eddie shouts, do it! As Venom seeps into Eddie's mouth, he says there's so much pain inside of him, he can't fix it all! It's too much! We can't come back from this, Eddie! Just keep me alive long enough to kill this SOB. The fires begin to pour out of the furnace doors, and as Eddie begins to fall to the ground, Venom tells him, We did it. He's gone. They're both gone. I'm sorry. It was too much. We're still connected. We should have told you. Eddie asks, What? And Venom tells him, We love you. Venom pours onto the floor, and Eddie says he can't hear him. Venom, where did you go? Venom! March 5th, 1966, 0250 hours. It all started with a firefight. A soldier and his platoon made contact with the Viet Cong, and they suffered massive losses. They fought for what felt like hours, slowly losing one man after another. And then, the shadows. They started to move. Things began to dart back and forth like sharks swimming in the jungle. The shooting stomped. The screaming began. The surviving members of the platoon went on ahead to see what had happened. And two hours later, a soldier finally gets the spine to take a look for himself. The jungle has gone quiet. There's no birds. There's no bugs. There's nothing. And when the soldier pushes aside the vines to look into the clearing, that's when he sees it. Something sitting on top of a mound of bodies, eating them. Just then, another one of those things jumps out of the bushes, grabbing the soldier. But that thing was wearing their uniform. The creature said something in a strange language, and then it opened up its mouth, and all you could hear is the soldier scream. A few weeks prior, along the border of Scandinavia, Nick Fury responded to a report of erratic seismic activity. Normally, this would be something that he would look into, but they believed that it might have something to do with Hydra. But what they found wasn't Hydra. It was a damned dragon. Scientists extracted a sample, only to find that what they thought was an ancient being was, in fact, something alien. And to their astonishment, it was alive. Next came the experiments on live subjects to gauge its effects, 
and they discovered that the alien was symbiotic in origin, latching onto its host. When the alien was introduced to a group of lab rats, well, the eggheads found that there were certain unforeseen results. The next step would be to move on from the lab rats to the human subjects. And despite what people may think, they're not monsters for doing it. It also wasn't exactly his call to make them not do it. S.H.I.E.L.D. is, after all, still beholden to the wills of certain officials. The men, they were chosen for the Sim Soldier Program, and they were hand-selected, and they were going to be led by Rex Strickland, codenamed the Tyrannosaurus. The Sim Soldiers were deployed four months ago in South Vietnam after learning of a weapons depot by a man who thought himself to be a future Viet Cong war hero. They wiped him off the face of the planet, along with an entire company of soldiers. And a voice asks Fury what's wrong with this, and Fury tells the man that the company that these soldiers killed was their soldiers. Something went wrong. Their Sim soldiers, their monsters, are off the leash. The man asks what would they have him do, and Fury says that he was hoping that he could appeal to his sense of patriotism. The man laughs and says, No dice, bub. I'm Canadian. Fury tells Logan that they need his help. He knows the terrain better than anyone else that he's ever, but Logan stops him and tells him, you need to put these things down. And Fury asks, what is the problem? And Logan says, nothing. It's just, you discover that life exists on other planets and the first thing you do is send them to war? What the hell kind of thing is that? Fury doesn't respond. And Logan asks, this is the first time that you've discovered alien life, right, bub? Fury ignores the question, telling him, that they have a chopper waiting to take them out in the morning. They'll be taking care of things themselves. The next morning, they fly out to the jungle and they begin their search. And Logan goes on asking, how are we supposed to find these men? My tracking is good and all, but you want me to track five killers in a country with this much death and blood? Ain't no one that good. Fury tells him that he wouldn't be able to track them if he tried. These men can camouflage themselves and blend into the area. They implanted explosive kill switch equipped with tracking devices into the back of their neck so that they could locate them if needed. And even if they didn't, it wouldn't be hard to find their trail. Logan looks at the half-eaten body scattered around and he tells him, There isn't much left, is there? Can't even tell what side they're on. Logan then asks, If they have kill switches, why haven't you just pulled the trigger? Fury says they can't, not while in enemy territory. The things that these men are wearing are alive. If the men are inside, the alien will seek a new host, and if... Logan tells him, yeah, yeah. If Charlie gets his hand on one of them, it's a bad day for everyone. But as Logan sifts through the bodies, he finds a small device, and Fury says, that's the kill switch. They dug it out of their own necks. Logan hands it over, telling him, just what the hell are we dealing with? But just then, Logan senses something. The two of them spin around and they see Rex Strickland stumbling out of the bushes with his hands up, stating, Please, don't shoot! Fury looks at Rex and asks, Where's your suit? Where are the others? Rex tells him that the suit just left him, but his men, they couldn't control the aliens. They were screaming in their minds in some kind of other language. They couldn't understand it and they just blacked out. And when they woke up, they found that there were. Rex looks around at the mutilated bodies and he says, Oh, God, what have we done? Fury tells Rex to relax and take a breath. Can he tell them why they turned? And just then another voice yells, Get away from it! It ain't me! Everyone turns back to see another Rex Strickland running out of the woods holding a flamethrower. And they turn back to the original Rex, but it changes into a symbiote. Fury and Logan begin to fire at that creature, and the creature reaches behind Rex, punching a hole into a fuel tanker. Logan runs towards him, knocking the tank over just as it explodes, shielding Rex from the blast. Part of the blast burns Rex's face, but he gets up, stating, You just saved my life. Are you gonna be okay? Logan sits up, telling him, I'll be fine, just give me a few. His body begins to heal itself, and Rex asks, What the hell are you? Fury begins to look around, asking where did it go, but that's when he feels something drop onto his arm. Everyone looks up to see the missing soldiers crawling down from the trees, and Logan yells for Rex to run! Rex hesitates for a second, but then he hurries up, shouting, I'll come back for you! As the symbiotes swarm around Logan, they begin to try and bond to them all, whispering that strange language into his ear. Fury shouts for Logan, but when Logan answers, he responds, speaking the symbiotic language. As Logan lunges for Fury, Rex runs in, grabbing one of the sonic rifles, and he hits Logan, ripping the symbiote off of him. Logan hits the ground, and Rex says they can't leave him. And Logan gets up telling him, Give me the gun. Another of the symbiotes grabs onto Fury, and Rex shouts, Wait! We could kill him too! And Logan looks down the site, stating, Yeah, planning on it. Logan pulls the trigger, and the blast knocks the symbiotes back. And Rex asks, Why would you do that? As the smoke clears, Logan looks down at Fury and says, They're called LMDs, life model decoys. Fancy word for saying coward. 
What's the matter, Fury? Not man enough to handle your own mistakes? Meanwhile, elsewhere, Fury's watching on a screen and he tries to explain, but Logan yells, Just save it! I bonded with one of those damn things. I know you were still experimenting. You want to tell me what's really going on here, bub? The LMD begins to speak, but Fury says, We couldn't have known. When we discovered that it was alive, Logan shouts, stating, You tried to figure out a way to kill it! Fury goes on stating that they had to. They had to know if they could hurt it if they were going to risk unleashing it into this war. They couldn't have known that it shared a hive mind the way that they do. They didn't know that it would drive the soldiers insane, and they didn't know that its spawn would feel the pain of the original. Logan tells him, You put something in a cage and you poked it until it broke, and then you're surprised when it came back to bite you. Is that why you thought of me for this? One animal against another? Fury tells him, We needed this cleaned up quietly. You know the score. And for what it's worth, I'm sorry that it had to end this way. Just then the eye of the LND turns red and it shows a countdown. Rex begins to panic, asking what does it mean, and Logan tells him, Detonation. If this thing is meant to clean this all up, there's no point in running. Logan looks back at the symbiotes, telling them, Don't worry though, we probably won't last much longer anyway. As the countdown begins, the symbiotes attack, and one grabs onto Rex and it begins to bond. Rex gets back up, grabbing Logan by the throat, telling him, Not animals! And he throws him across the jungle. The bomb explodes and soon everything begins to burn. Elsewhere, Rex says when he woke up, shield agents found him and here he is now. And that's all he knows. Fury tells him, you understand what we had to do, right? I would make the same call tomorrow if I thought it would make the world a better place. It ain't pretty, but it's the job. Rex looks at him and tells him, he's just happy to be alive. Fury goes on telling him as for the physical examination, he came back in good shape. The withdrawal from the suit seems to be minimal. Though, they can't say the same about the rest of the team. Those things have a fierce hold on them. If they try and separate them now, the men will most likely die. Rex then asks, What do we do now? Fury tells him, We'll put them all on ice until we figure a way out. Rex then says he's not sure if he's allowed to ask, but when they found him, this suit, did they find it yet? Fury tells him no, they haven't. But he has his best man on top of it. He knows these things like the back of his hand. Rex asks, who might that be? And Fury throws a shield badge, telling him, it would be you. You earned it. What do you say? You want to help me hunt down an alien? As Rex's eye glows, he tells him, It would be my honor, sir. On Wednesday night at the Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane, a boy was born. Cletus Cassidy. It's also the same night that Cletus Cassidy died for the first time. He was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck, choking him to death. However, he was reborn, and no one to this day knows why. Cletus himself claims to remember that moment. And if asked, he'll tell you that 19 minutes and 38 seconds later, he was sent to hell. He states vividly that when he awoke in hell, he found himself in a cage, in an endless black abyss. This was his initial trauma, that feeling of being caged, that formed the foundations of Cletus's particular devotion. In his mind, he's never mutilated his victim, he's merely set them free. The second rebirth, well, it happened inside the walls of a prison. That night, the darkness came alive, shattering the walls of his cell. The abyss set him free. And it was in that moment, whether he knew it or not, that he became an agent of the Void. That day he learned the truth. There was no right or wrong, no black or white. The universe was red and black. Truth is chaos and God is carnage. As the acolyte told the stories to her brothers and sisters, she tells them that now there is a new grand darkness before them. Many have warned their God's living darkness, stumbled into it upon it, but the darkness chose Cletus. Cassidy was born on this earth to shatter the walls of their cages. He has died and been reborn for them, and for him, Cassidy is the one. He will rise. Our god will be free. The acolyte holds a torch to the carvings on the walls, showing the downfall of their lord of darkness. Null. Struck down by the light and came back in pieces I have shared with you. She moves to the next carving, showing a picture of the symbiote god Null and yells that they do these things in his name, in servitude to the Great Dark, so that they may join the Black King Null in the final fight, forever and together in the Void, forever and together. The others begin to chant forever and together, and as they go on, the Acolyte calls out, asking the question, where is Kalidus Cassidy? Is he not dead? Aren't those rumors and whispers? They have been told that he was taken to the darkness of space, ripped apart! and left floating and dead. But then he was reborn, 
and he continued his divine work, freeing the souls in the American heartland. And then he died, only to be reborn again. Some say he was stolen, taken far away, and others say that he died for good this time, but we, we know better. The abyss, the abyss is not death. Darkness is not the end. And so what then of the man Cletus Cassidy? What became of him? How did he return from the brink? The answer is, of course, no great mystery, he burned. After we discovered his body, we performed extensive research to determine how this man could have survived re-entry into the atmosphere, but we already knew the answer. Cletus and his symbiote have a very unique bond, a perfect one. Where there is one, there is always the other. As he fell, this gentle creature breached his flesh to face the flame one final time to bring our carnage home. It was agony for the symbiote. Even after the Darkhold curse gave it its immunity to fire and sound, it must have known that it was giving its life for his. Born and reborn from the tendrils of the abyss, it was without a doubt Cletus Cassidy's most beautiful rebirth yet. However, minutes after he fell to Earth, he died. Locals found his body and turned him into the authorities. He was identified by his dental records, and his name set off hundreds of red flags across every agency. But we, we watched those lists. There was quite a battle to recover Cletus' body. Many of them died, but fewer of our brothers and sisters died. The Acolyte unveils the containment device holding his body, stating, We have waited for this day, and she holds up a vial of black liquid. She goes on stating that their men led an assault to recover the stolen remnant of Null Symbiote. This was it, the Maker, the man who stole the sample. He called it a Codex. We thought that when a symbiote leaves its host, its influence, its connection is lost. But apparently that is not the case. Every symbiote leaves behind a genetic imprint of itself wrapped around the DNA helix of its host. It was theorized by the Maker that this codex could be used to communicate information about the host to the collective symbiote hive. Do you even realize what this means? This tiny piece of Null's dragon. We can talk to a god. Every symbiote leaves a trace of itself on its host, and if that's the case, then this sample must contain the psychic remnants of Null's connection, giving us his voice. All we need is an amplifier. The Acolyte injects the Codex into Cletus' life support, and as the black liquid takes over, there's a loud bang. Cletus begins to beat on the device from inside, shouting no, but outside, the Acolyte shouts yes! Shatter your cage and be reborn, Cletus! The Covenant begins chanting again as Cletus begins to break free, and then Cletus, wearing the primordial symbiote, begins to laugh maniacally. <laughs> but after a few moments, he covers his head, shouting, LOUD! SHUT UP! One of the brothers asks what's happening, and the Acolyte says that it's him. He's talking to him. Cletus is connected to Null, a Dark Lord of the Abyss, and the mind of Cletus are fighting for dominance inside of the same body. Can you imagine the violence inside? Cletus falls to the ground in pain, and the Acolyte tells him that she knows it hurts. She knows he's incomplete, but she can help him. The symbiotes leave a piece of themselves behind in every host that they bond with, and she has one as well. She can feel it swirling around inside of her. It is their god's dark carnage made flesh. She is merely his scorn. She offers him her codex to make him whole. The surgery is difficult, but with the Maker's research, they believe that they can. But before she can finish, Cletus reaches out, grabbing her, and there's a blood-curdling strip, followed by an ear-piercing scream. He licks the blood off of the Acolyte's bones, laughing. He grabs his face, stating, Your loonies are right! I do feel better after a snack. I'm not sure what the hell that Null was on about, but Daddy needs some more. Cletus begins to grab another Acolyte, shedding the black of the primordial suit and turning it red like carnage. He tells the Acolyte, I want to talk to God again. How do I go about that? The Acolyte explains that there are codexes and they think that if he absorbs all of the pieces of the symbiotes left behind in their hosts, he can rejoin the hive and awaken Null. They can set him free. Cletus says, Goody, where are they? The Acolyte says that they are attached to the DNA of anyone who has ever worn a symbiote. They're everywhere. So Cletus squeezes, and there's a splorch. And he laughs, Ha! Well, I'll be damned! I suppose I better get to work! As Cletus turns to the wall of monitors, there are pictures of everyone who has ever bonded with a symbiote. Across 
the entire world. Eddie begins to think back as a voice tells him, Congratulations! You saved the world, but who cares? No one will ever know what you did. Nothing has changed. For most of the world, and for anyone who matters, you'll always be Spider-Man's bad laundry. Just another poor man's monster who outlived his own legend. In fact, I can relate, but also, I can change that. An extraction team was sent to the warehouse to collect a sample of whatever it is that you fought. The mission was a success, until it wasn't. The extraction team found what they were looking for, but they also found something else. The broken, barely breathing body of Edward Brock. Eddie shifts in his cuffs. Yeah, I don't die too well. This is also the part where I get an attorney and a phone call. The man in the shadows asks, where is the sample? And Eddie tells him, I don't know what you mean. You said yourself that your people took the sample. I don't even know what this sample is that you're talking about. The man with the shadow sighs. <laughs> you really don't know, do you? That's interesting. How much do you remember about that time? Or how you even got here? Eddie laughs. Do you really think this is my first time in a box? I know where I am. But isn't S.H.I.E.L.D. supposed to be dead? The man in the shadow smiles, holding up a scalpel, telling him, Oh, it very much is. And then he steps into the light. And Eddie asks him, who is he? The man responds, Reed Richards, but no, not the one you're thinking of. However, you may call me The Maker. Eddie struggles to get up asking, why am I here? What the hell is this place? The Maker tells him, well, you fought a dragon telepathically linked to an elder void god throughout Manhattan. You then detonated a rather large amount of stolen ordnance inside of said dragon before burning it and nearly yourself to death. Unfortunately for you, you gained the attention of some incredibly powerful people. The reason you're even here is because we need you to find the sample. Eddie yells, I keep telling you I have no idea what the sample that you're talking about is. Maker laughs. <laughs> I think that you'll find that you do, so pay attention. Once we retrieved the sample, it was stolen from the lab. The people that we're working for were quite insistent that we return it. The organization, well, not really an organization, more of a gathering. A group of people that answer to a higher power than, well, let's just leave it at that. They are project oversight. For now. Anyway, back to the sample. Why do you keep saying that? A sample? A sample of what? I don't even know what you mean. Maker points the scalpel, stating, A sample of a gigantic dragon psychically linked to an imprisoned primordial god. You left a piece of it alive in the incinerator to try to keep up, Mr. Brock. No, I killed it. It's gone. How the hell do you know? Maker stops him. We believe that you may have made contact with the person or persons who have stolen the sample. How could I have done that if I'd been in your custody the whole time? See, that's interesting. Is that what it's telling you to say? That you nearly died and woke up here? Eddie, that is not the whole story. In fact, the night that we found you, you killed four of our men. Not that it really amounts to much of a loss, but it wasn't difficult in tracking you down. Like a cornered animal just trying to survive, you eluded us for some time, which in itself is quite impressive, Mr. Brock. We then chased you for three weeks. You disappeared off the face of the earth. During that time, someone broke into our lab and someone stole the sample that we had retrieved and then we found you. You were across the country in San Francisco on the front lawn of your father's home. And he lowers his head. I, I don't understand. Why would I go to my father's? I've been here for three weeks. Five, actually. Three on the run, two here. How is that even possible? Because the symbiote is shielding you from trauma, instinctually erasing parts of your memory that it believes that would harm you. Makes a person wonder, what else could it have erased, right? And he says, I, I don't know. And the maker leans in. Haven't you noticed it yet? You've been saying I, not we, Eddie. Have you not realized what's missing from all of this? Don't you feel a little lonely? Eddie tells him, you, you took it off me, give it back. Give it back or I'll kill you. Maker sighs, this again? Fine. He throws the scalpel at Eddie's face. Eddie closes his eyes and suddenly the scalpel stops. Maker tells him, we didn't remove it. It's just for the lack of a better term, dead more or less. The damage to the symbiote during the fight with its god all but erased its tenuous connection to the hive. I'm afraid to say that its voice, its personality, they're gone. As well as whatever powers you may have inherited from the god host. It remains attached and obedient when needed. Maybe in due time it will regain some personality, but for now it's nothing more than a guard dog. You have to help me. We have to fix it, please! Maker stops from telling him. There's nothing we can do. The only way to regenerate the symbiote's original makeup would be to connect it and restore it from the central hive itself. The only person who has ever made contact and survived that is Flash Thompson. But with Flash dead, there's little we can do about that. Now, there's a few ways we can get this information, but sadly, they're going to be a little invasive. Eddie stops him. Wait, Flash Thompson is dead? Later, Eddie stands in front of Flash's grave telling him, Hey, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say. 
Feels kind of wrong, you know? My other, our other, I should say. It liked you better. Hell, everyone did. I always acted like it didn't bother me since I was the original, but the truth is it tears me apart. I think about it all the time. I didn't think he knew, but he could feel it. Even now with its voice gone, I can still feel it pulling towards you, Flash. It's just tough being someone's second best. Maker asks, Are you done? And Eddie sighs, Yeah, I'm done. Maker presses a button on one of the other tombstones and suddenly the environment changes back to the lab that they were just in. He then asks, Okay, where were we? Eddie watches his clothes change, stating, You just told me that my other was brain dead after it erased parts of my mind. Then we stole a piece of the symbiote to drag it and someone else stole it from you. After that, you accused me of being involved in all this insane crap without ever telling me why you would want the sample or who you even work for. So, being smart, you should have already known that I had nothing to do with whatever it is that you're accusing me of. Maker pours a cup of coffee. I suspect that you're right, but I also believe that your other may know things. So until I deem otherwise, you're staying here. Besides, where would you go if you left? Eddie tells him. I would go see the real Flash Thompson, for one. Maker then holds out a small vial, telling him, I give you Corporal Eugene Flash Thompson, or rather the most interesting part of him. Inside of the small vial, a black liquid swirls around and the maker goes on telling Eddie, Project Pegasus did keep extensive medical and biological samples of their subjects. What we found was that the symbiotes leave a imprint, a codex if you will, and it's always left behind as a way for their kind to share information about its host. Your symbiote has not been connected to its hive for some time, which is why the sample of the symbiote dragon is so important. We believe that it could contain information about the symbiote species and mankind as a whole that can revolutionize scientific progress as we know it. Maker puts back the vial, and Eddie asks, What does it have to do with me? Maker tells him nothing. Well, haha, <laughs> uh, at least not yet. We believe that there's a way to reactivate your symbiote's connection to the hive by bonding these trace amounts of its symbiotic codex to living tissue. So the next step is to exhume Flash's grave and retrieve his body so that we can... Eddie stops him right there. You want to dig up Flash's body? What the hell is the matter with you? Maker says, don't get so sentimental. It's not Flash Thompson anymore. His body has information about his kind that we need. Specifically, his pancreas, spinal fluid, and adrenal. But before he could finish, Venom wraps himself around Eddie lunging forward, slamming the maker's face into the wall. Eddie throws him and tells him, Leave Flash alone. As Eddie picks Maker's mangled body up, Maker tells him, Seems I have woken up the dog very well. Venom separates itself from Eddie, but even still, Eddie can feel Venom's rage. It wants to protect Flash. Hell, they both do. This is the first time since they've killed the damn dragon that he can even feel Venom's presence, and he would like to think that it would do the same for him. Eddie runs over, opening up the autopsy storage unit, and Venom throws Maker inside as Eddie slams the hatch shut, locking him in there. He picks up Flash's sample and says, All right, time for us to get the hell out of here. As Eddie runs out of the lab, soldiers surround him, all equipped with anti-symbiote tech. The Sonics go off, and Eddie struggles to even stand, dropping the vial. Eddie tries to think about what to do, but then Venom picks up Flash's sample, and shatters it. Venom begins to absorb the small amount of Flash Thompson, and Eddie can feel something. He can feel Flash, he's still here. Just then, Eddie punches the door as the soldiers are knocking them back, and Agent Venom's costume appears over Eddie, and Eddie hears Flash's voice asking, Hey Brock, you mind if I drive? Eddie tells him, of course. Eddie watches as he becomes the passenger once again, but this time it's different. Not like when Null was infecting his other, it feels more like backup. He knows that this isn't really Flash Thompson, just some lingering imprint of the man that Flash Thompson used to be. The symbiote is speaking in his voice because it doesn't have one of its own. And watching him like this, Eddie finally gets it, as much as he hates to admit it. Flash Thompson was a badass Venom. Later, Eddie visits Flash's actual grave and he tells him that he appreciates the help back there. He wasn't sure if he could have gotten out of there without Flash's help. Whatever was left of him in that codex seemed to have burned out from his other. He can't hear him anymore. He can't hear anything really, but... He'll carry what's left of him where he goes, brother. Now get some rest. He heads to the bus station and gets a ticket. And he gets on the bus marked for San Francisco. He tells himself that being alone is really scary, but now, not the time for him to run away. It's time for him to look back into the abyss. Maybe this time, it'll be the one to blink. Meanwhile, elsewhere, a hooded figure reaches into his pocket. It says that they've retrieved the sample from the maker. They were not followed. And they do these things in his name. A woman reaches out, taking the sample, stating, So the darkness shall devour the light. She then says the Lord will wake again at his new vessel, and they will join him together and forever in the void. Behind the woman is the biohazard container with the charred remains of Kalidas Cassidy.
After nearly dying in a fight with the symbiote god Null, Venom no longer has a personality or a voice. And without even a mind of its own, Venom subconsciously has been trying to protect Eddie and bring him back to his childhood home in San Francisco. As Eddie tries to make sense of all of this, Venom is now reduced to nothing more than a hulking dog trying to keep his host safe. Night begins to set in over the old shoddy motel as the vacancy light flickers on. Inside of the office, voices can be heard stating, Edward Brock, as a pair of mindless men reach for the keys to Eddie's room. These men's eyes are red like when Null took over someone, but this infection is different. The men shuffle their way to Eddie's room while he's sleeping, and just like a dog protecting its owner, Venom wakes up to hear them. The men put the key in the lock to open up the door, but before they can turn it, the key falls out of the knob. The men stare at the key, confused, and they try again. This time, the key is pushed back out, and behind it is Venom lashing out through the keyhole at the men. Venom bites down on one of them, but as he listens, he can hear the faint laughter of a madman. Venom pauses as he takes in the scent, and once he knows where it's coming from, he jumps down and he follows the trail. The dogs begin to growl and bark, and as they do, Venom opens his mouth, jumping down on one of them. He begins to grow in size, screaming at the dogs, causing them to whimper and whine. But as Venom listens, it can hear the same laughter coming from inside of their minds. He heads into the sewers, following the trail, passing by even more infected men, and then a man in a large metal suit begins to loom over him. Before Venom could react, a second suit appears, grabbing him, asking, Brock? Venom turns into a goopy liquid mess to escape the man's grip, but as he attacks, the first suit activates its sonic evacuators, and it blasts Venom into thousands of pieces. The two turn, but when they're not looking, Venom reforms, seeping into one of the suits. The suit falls, and when the second man looks closer at his friend, Venom bursts out through the helmet at him. The man tries to hit Venom with another sonic blast, but this time Venom separates his body to avoid being hit. He jumps through the glass, knocking the man down, but as he comes back out, he can hear the other man calling for help. Venom looks at that man and then notices a small red worm wiggling out of its nose. Venom sniffs the worm and he can hear it. He can hear the thing that he's been dreading. The laughter of Kalidus Cassidy. The other man starts to get back up asking Venom not to hurt his friend, but Venom opens his mouth, wrapping his tongue around the worm, pulling it out. He then takes it and jumps down with the men beginning to ask each other, what was that? Worms? They look over and they see the other men and they call out to them and when they get no response, they figure that the worms must have got them too. One man that asks, what do they do now? How do they fix this? And the second man says that it was a dog. He extracted the one in their heads. First man says that he vaguely remembers hitting him with a sonic blast. Maybe that helped loosen the worm's hold. With a shot, right? Venom follows closely behind the two men as they follow their friends and as they arrive at the source of it all, they see a red mutated pillar in the middle of the street. Scribbled all around it are the words, God is carnage. God is here. One of the men tells Venom that they will try to clean things up, but he needs to round up as many members of the community as he can and extract those worms. Can he do that? Venom barks in agreement and he runs back into the mines. A short while later, back at the motel, Eddie wakes up when he hears scratching coming from his door. He looks out the peephole. When he doesn't see anything, he opens it up asking, Hello? Sitting there, wagging his tail, is Venom. Eddie looks around at the blood all around the door and he asks what happened. Venom begins to hack, and as he begins to throw up something, a pile of red worms fall out of his mouth. Eddie asks, what is that? No, 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 no. Where did you find this? Did you see him? Venom sits down and Eddie tells him, come on, if you're ever gonna talk, now's the time, please. You can't, I know, I'm alone. Carnage is coming, and I'm going to have to face him alone. And he looks at the pile of worms, and he pets Venom. Good dog. As young Eddie is sitting in the waiting room, waiting to hear what's going on, he hears a voice calling out to him. He looks around to see his sister Mary, and she tells him that he can't ignore this forever. She knows that he's scared, but he's not alone. The two walk through, and before Eddie is his dying uncle Dan. Dan coughs, telling him it's okay. Old Uncle Dan isn't going to hurt them. Eddie shakes his head, reverting back to his older self, telling him no. No, this isn't real. What's wrong with me? Mary's eyes turn black and she tells him, You already know what's wrong with you. You're infected with the abyss. 
Eddie shouts, no, 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 this isn't how I remember it. Uncle Dan was sick with cancer, but it wasn't like this. Carl reaches out telling him, it's okay. We're gonna take care of you. We are family. Eddie pulls away, no, no, this is all wrong. What the hell is going on? Where am I? Outside of Eddie's own mind, Dylan asks, is Eddie okay? And the maker tells him, no, of course not. He has cancer, I think. However, it's hard to tell since he's encased by an alien life form in some sort of stasis cocoon. The problem that we are currently facing is to properly assess Eddie's situation, the symbiote must be removed, which in all likelihood would kill him. So to find out what's going to kill him, we have to risk killing him. Quite ironic, isn't it? But alas, such is the burden of science. Dylan runs out of the room shouting for help, and across the hall, Carl tries pushing his way through the guards calling out to Dylan. Dylan sees Carl frantically trying to get to him, and Dylan, he runs the other way. Back inside of Eddie's mind though, Eddie is swept up by a whirlwind of darkness, screaming for it to stop when suddenly it does. Eddie looks around to find himself in a church and he asks, where is he? Mary steps out telling him, come on, surely you haven't forgotten this place. This is where you were born. Eddie lifts his hand, feeling the weight of a gun. And Mary asks, why did you come here? He was gonna end it. He lost everything. He's dying he had cancer and mary tells him that's awful but why here and why didn't you die and he looks around stating that i came to say goodbye to god you know why i didn't fangs begin to grow out of mary's mouth as she spits the black liquid down on eddie he screams out in pain as it burns and mary tells him that it's okay there is no birth without screaming let it become you let us heal you Eddie stands back wearing the venom suit and Mary goes on stating, you don't ever have to be scared. You don't ever have to be alone. Eddie screams out again and there's an explosion as the suit separates off of him. And then he opens up his eyes and he can feel the immense pain as the maker tries to remove venom off of his body. Venom shrieks in pain and the maker tells him, it won't stop until he lets go. And not a moment before, Eddie passes back out seeing himself. But this time the link between him and venom is gone and he can see all of it, all the lies, all the truth. Mary wasn't there because there never was a Mary. They put her in his head, made him love her, but why? Why would Venom have done that? Why would Venom have manipulated his memories? Mary starts to reform, telling Eddie that he needs to calm down. He's very sick, and Eddie shouts asking, am I? And Mary says, yes, the cancer, it's returned, and Eddie yells, stop lying to me. You showed me this image of my uncle dying of cancer, but it was also a lie. I never watched him die. What are you doing to me? Why are you doing this to us? Why did you put these things in my head? I thought we were beyond this, Venom. I thought you loved me. Venom slowly forms, reaching out, stating, It was the only way to make you stay. We need you, Eddie. Eddie begins to pull back when he sees Venom's face, and Venom calls out to him, stating, No, you don't understand. We were weak. We were hurt. Just reconnect. Do not hurt us like this. We can make it all go away. Eddie turns, telling himself, I have a sister who didn't exist die of cancer, and an uncle who was never there die of cancer. And that night in the church, I was gonna kill myself because I had cancer. But it's not real, is it? Just memories that you put there to scare me, to keep me coming back to you. There was never a cancer. It was always you, Venom. You made me think that I was rotting away every time I wanted to leave. You altered my body to make the test results read that I was dying of cancer, all so that I would need you. Venom pleads, stating, We were scared! We were always scared! We cannot be separated, Eddie. Eddie shouts, asking, Why? Venom tells him, Because of you! Because of what you really are! Because of... And Eddie realizes the truth. Dylan. Eddie opens his eyes, telling the Maker to let him go. And the Maker tells him that if he removes the containment field, the symbiote would just reattach itself. If he removes the symbiote, it would likely kill him. What should he do? Eddie tells him, I need to get the hell out of here. I need to get Dylan before it's too late. And the Maker asks, why are you so upset? I'm sure your little brother is going to be perfectly fine. But Eddie stops him. Dylan is not my brother. He's my son. Eddie begins to kick the containment field and the maker says, you may not want to do that. Your vitals are spiking in the wrong direction, Edward. Images of Mary appear again, telling him not to do this. Stay with us. And Eddie yells, no, you lied to me. You manipulated me. You made me sick, made me weak. No more venom, turn it up. 
Maker types away at the controls, telling him, Very well. As the containment field intensifies, Venom bashes himself against the walls until he finally breaks free, causing a massive explosion in the operating room. Meanwhile on the highway, Carl and Dylan drive home, and Carl says that he can't keep doing this. He can't run away. He's sorry for losing his temper, but this is a difficult situation. Eddie used to do that, and they both know that he is not a good person. Dylan looks out the window, stating that at least Eddie was honest with who he was and doesn't. But Carl raises his hand, shouting, ENOUGH! Just then, there's a loud boom as the car suddenly stops and Carl's head slams into the steering wheel. Carl asks what the hell was that, and he looks in the mirror to see Venom lifting up the car. Carl gets out of the car yelling that he's gonna call the police if, but before he could finish, Venom grabs him by the throat, and Carl pleads, Okay, okay, we can work this out! Just don't hurt me, please! Venom begins to seep into Carl, and as everything goes black, Carl sees himself in the same interrogation room that he was in when he was with Eddie all those years ago. Carl asks, where is he? And Eddie appears, throwing his chair, stating that it's just the two of them now. Do you remember this room? It was the room where you made me a liar. This is where you made me into what I am today. Carl shouts, I saved your damn life! And Eddie tells him, oh yeah? I'm doing just fine thanks to you. Carl yells, you made your own damn choices! And you still ended up on prison. You still ended up hurting people. And on the wrong side of the... Eddie puts back on the Venom suit, smacking the table, screaming! He slams Carl into the wall, stating that he doesn't get to judge him. He knows what he is. He knows that he's messed up, that he's not good, but he's working on it. Every day, he's trying to make his life better, to do better. He's not going to let him hurt that child anymore. He's not going to hurt his son. Carl scoffs. Ha <laughs> ha, it's about time. Dylan is already like you. And he tells him, no, he's not, not yet. And Carl sighs. He was such a good boy. Went to church, helped people, and then, do you even believe in God anymore, Eddie? And he tells him, I met God once. He's a real, never mind. Listen, I didn't bring you here to make nice. This isn't me asking for forgiveness or making amends. I'm taking Dylan. And if I ever see you around, Dylan, I will kill you. Is that understood? Carl nods, telling him, yeah. And Eddie tells him, good. Now when you wake up, you're gonna be alone. And then you're going to stay that way for the rest of your life. Carl gasps as he wakes in the desert. And as he stands, he says, Eddie, oh God, I'm, I'm so sorry, Eddie. Back at the hospital, Venom sets Dylan down and as he turns to leave, Dylan asks, where are you going? Are you leaving him? Why won't you talk to Eddie? Venom tries to get the words out. Trying to be better. Make both of you better without me. Dylan asks by both. What do you mean? And that's when Dylan hears coughing from the operating room. He runs in to find Eddie, still lying on the floor. And when he touches Eddie, Eddie asks, Ugh, what just happened? I tried to. And Dylan tells him, it got out, but it saved me. It left. Where did Venom go? Outside the city, Venom walks down the sidewalk. But before anyone could see him, he blends in, losing himself within the crowd. The mainline Venom story ended here, and it crossed over into a series of tie-ins in Absolute Carnage. So we're going to bring you all of the Absolute Carnage event right here, so you can see how it all ties together. The snarling Venom shoes, and Andy Benton can hear one thing, taste so good. Andy screams, kicking while Venom bites down on her leg and she begins to run. Venom shouts, asking, where are you going? It's not like you can slip away. You can't get away from us. We're a part of you. Andy can feel the constricting black ooze creeping into her eyes and mouth, and all she can hear is Venom laughing, yelling that she will never be free. She screams once more, but then she opens up her eyes, finding herself in bed in Philadelphia. It was all a nightmare, but it was the fourth one this week. She gets up, getting dressed, and he sees her Aunt Sarah making breakfast. Sarah asks how did she sleep, and not wanting to worry her aunt, Andy says that she slept like a baby. For Andy, her life has changed since she met the assistant coach, Flash Thompson. Flash Thompson had a secret, which they all do, but Flash's secret was just bigger than most. He was actually the superhero, Agent Venom. In an attempt to save her, a part of Venom broke off and turned her into mania. Sort of a superhero in her own right. But that symbiote was stolen from her, ripped away in the streets of New York. Flash used to talk to her about phantom limb syndrome. He said that he could feel his legs even though they were gone. And without her symbiote, she can finally understand just how that felt. 
It took some getting used to, but slowly she was able to adjust, to make new friends. But that only helps the phantom pain. And it makes her think that if she keeps working at it, she might leave all the nightmares behind her. Except, the nightmares only come back. They're stronger and they hit harder than before. They show up while she's awake and it's the same as always. The symbiote brings nothing but death and destruction to all of those around her. When it's all over, she snaps back to reality and she sees that it was all a waking nightmare once again. Her friends smile. They laugh it off that she had an episode. But there's a falseness in their smiles, a discomfort in their laughter. And none of them ask, but they're all wondering the same thing. What's wrong with Andy? What's more, she begins to feel like someone is always there, watching, waiting. But now, the nightmares are happening more frequently. First the coffee shop, then where she works at the record store, and it's the same thing over and over again. Death and destruction at the hands of a symbiote. Maybe talking to someone will help. She realizes, yeah, maybe talking to Aunt Sarah will help her feel better, help her get this off her chest. But when she returns home, she finds Aunt Sarah sitting in the living room, and there's a slight eeriness to her. Andy asks her what's wrong, and Aunt Sarah says, Nothing is wrong. Everything is fine. Just fine. But something's wrong. Her voice seems different. Not right. Just then, red tendrils seep out of Aunt Sarah's head and they begin to rip her in half. Andy steps back, telling herself that it can't be real, but then a familiar voice tells her, Oh, it's real, girly. This ain't no dream. Come here so I can pinch ya. Carnage claws his way out of the husk that was Aunt Sarah and lashes at Andy. She screams to herself that this can't be real, and then a tendril whips out, slashing her up. And she realizes this is real. She runs out the front door, and Carnage begins to ask, Where are you going? We're not done playing yet. Not by a long shot, girly. She holds out her arms as she hurries down the sidewalk and she bumps into an old man walking his dog. The old man says that he's sorry. He didn't mean to run into her. Oh, oh God, her arm. She should go to the hospital. But before he could finish, there's a loud slush as red tendrils cut through the old man's head. Andy continues to sprint, heading to the nearby park. But just when she stops to catch her breath, Carnage slinks around the corner, yelling, Gotcha! She closes her eyes and quietly says, Rise, monsters of evil! Using the hell mark that was placed on her during her time as Mania, Andy calls forth the monsters of hell to aid her in her fight with Carnage. Carnage jumps down stating, Damn girl, you're freaky! Andy tells him that he doesn't know the half of it. She's marked, cursed by the devil. One of the larger monsters begins to breathe fire upon Carnage and he starts to scream. And then one of the other smaller ones pins him down with him shouting, No, no more, you're killing me! But just then, Carnage turns one of his arms into a giant spike, stabbing into one of the creatures, and he yells, Psych! <laughs> Andy steps back, asking how. Those flames, the hellfire, they should have turned him into ash. He laughs as he walks through the fire, telling her, <laughs> That was a nice try! But fire doesn't bother me that much anymore! You ain't the only one who's cursed, girly! As he begins to walk forward, he hears a loud thumping noise, and he looks back to see a hellfire bull ramming into him, launching him across the park. All of the monsters begin to quickly surround him, but just when they get close enough, Carnage releases a dozen tendrils, whipping and ripping through everything. He screams that he will make it rain blood and gore. You can't stand in the way of the gospel! I am the apostle of Null! Your blood will be an offering to me! Andy focuses her power, telling him that if that's the case, come and get it! But she damn sure isn't gonna make it easy. As her power is released, she is covered in hellfire armor, charging and smacking Carnage with a mace! She lifts her arm again to strike, but before she can swing, the tendrils come out, wrapping around her, and they begin to squeeze her tight! As her wrist snaps, Carnage tells her, Your turn to holler a bit! Those traces of symbiote DNA that are flowing through you, I'm gonna need them. Gotta fulfill a promise to Null. She shouts that whatever he's doing, whatever insanity has got him all riled up. It brought him to her, and she is going to send him to hell! Carnage asks, haven't you been listening? Do you think the devil scares me? I'm the one who gives the devil's nightmares! He rushes forward, grabbing Andy, telling her, Soon enough, I won't just be good old Carnage. I'll be a god! He turns his arm back into a spike, slamming it into her stomach, stabbing her through her back and out her front. 
Then one of the Hell Minions quickly smacks him away. And in that short window of opportunity, Andy is teleported away. She asks what happened. Somehow she was taken away? Demonic self-reservation? At least she'll live to fight another day. As she descends back upon Earth, she lands in New York. But why here? Well, Venom's here. The other Venom, Eddie Brock. She's got to find him and warn him about Carnage. Warn him that Carnage is coming for people connected to symbionts. But back in that park in Philadelphia, Carnage finishes off killing the last of the Hell Minions, and he states that the little snot thinks that she can run and hide. Don't you know that I can find you wherever you go? Don't you know that you're just leading me where I was planning on going anywhere? And as everything around him burns, Carnage walks away, whistling to himself. As Agent Misty Knight drives into town, she turns on a recorder to report the current situation. She is in search of her fellow agent, John Jameson, who has gone missing in Doverton, Colorado. Yes, that Doverton. The one that was taken over and brutalized by Carnage during the Carnage USA storyline. Misty parks just outside of the city limits, walking into the ruined town, recording her surroundings. As she passes some debris, she hears something rumbling. She looks over to see a hand twitching beneath a piece of metal and quickly pulls it up. On the ground, a naked John Jameson is quietly repeating, God is coming. God is coming. God is coming. Misty grabs John by the face, telling him to snap out of it. But after a few good shakes, John asks, where is he? Who is he? And why is he naked? She covers him with her coat, stating that she can't really help him with the naked part but she can fill him in on the rest. His name is John Jameson, son of J. Joma. Get me the pictures of that wall-crawling menace, Jameson. He was sent into space where he found an object known as the Godstone that allows him to change into the Man-Wolf. After coming back home, he became the head of security at the Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane, where he first met Carnage. That is why his superiors sent him here, because of his experience with dealing with that nutball. John looks around and asks, Superiors? Who do we work for? Misty asks if any of this is ringing a bell, and John tells her, Look, lady, I don't even know where I am or how I got here. Misty explains that he is in Doverton. A few months ago, Cletus Cassidy planted his flag here and essentially conquered the town, infecting the residents with his symbiote. It took a lot of people, and some heroes got infected, but Spider-Man managed to escape and lead a resistance that brought down Carnage. Any of that ringing a bell? John says actually, he can remember a little bit. It all started two days ago. He met with Sheriff Eric Morrill. Well, ex-Sheriff. Eric brought him to the cemetery where the bodies have been dug up out of their graves. Eric noted that all of the dug up had something in common. They were all people under Carnage's influence. What's more, each one of them had their spines ripped out. Back in the present, John leaves money on the counter and Missy says that she's pretty sure he doesn't have to do that. He grabs a pair of shorts and shirt from the hangar stating that it's a force of habit and he will pay her back. As John gets dressed, Misty tells him, Okay, now that you're not naked anymore, what happened next? John thinks for a moment and then says that Eric had a hunch on something. And when they went to the zoo, they found the same thing. The animals that were infected by Carnage had had their spines removed. John then recalls back, stating that even back then, the town was empty. The only people here were at the Church of the New Darkness, which seemed to appear overnight. When asking to go in, the letting people denied him, stating that only members of the congregation were allowed in. So the next step was to get answers from the church's spokesperson, Miss Deal. Their building even had a strange whirl plastered everywhere. Deal said the same thing the man at the front door said. Only members were allowed. But there was something else bugging him. What did the symbol mean? When asked, Deal smiled, stating that it is null. He is God, and God is coming. With that going nowhere, Eric allowed him to stay the night so that they could continue in the next day. Except he couldn't sleep. Call it a premonition. Something real bad was about to go down. He looked around the house as if he already knew before he even searched. Eric was gone, and there was only one place that he could be. So, he rushed down to the church since it was the only building with lights and he could hear something. Forever together. Forever together. He knew Eric's life was in danger, so he kicked in the door. Now, in his time as Man-Wolf, he's seen a lot. He's seen heroes, monsters, even gods, but nothing, and he means nothing, could have prepared him for the horrors that were before him. It all became clear that every man, woman, and child in Doverton was in Carnage's sinister grasp once again. 
Everyone gathered around Eric as they were getting ready to sacrifice him. And she shouted, for the love of God, save him. A hooded woman then says that the only God that would save him now is Null. The woman pulls her hood down and shows herself to be the spokesperson, Deal. She ruffles her hair and wipes off the makeup, stating that she should probably reveal who she really is. Once the makeup comes off, Shriek screams at John, and the next hooded person begins to pour red ooze all over Eric. He begs them not to do it, but as more ooze covers him, he says, Do it. Do it! <laughs> the chanting from the congregation begins, and John begins to transform into a man-wolf. But the newly infected Eric lashes out, grabbing John. The congregation begins to shout that God is coming. God is coming. God is coming. Back in the current time, Misty pulls off the last board on that church of the new darkness, asking if he's going to be okay seeing this. John Jameson tells her it's okay. They just need to get it over with because he's pretty sure he already knows what they're going to find. Inside, sitting in the church pews are members of the congregation, all with their spines taken out. But they all have a creepy smile on their face, as if they were happy to have their spines ripped out. John then remembers Eric too was like that. He prayed, stating that he would be willing to step into the light to be bathed in the everlasting darkness. And then a six-armed man with fangs wearing a Spider-Man costume digs his claws into Eric's back and pulls his spine out. Shriek says on behalf of her and her dearest doppelganger, please accept this humble gift, Lord Carnage. And Carnage pulls back his robe, taking the spine, stating, Don't mind if I do! After all, God commands it! Back in the current time, John and Misty get ready to leave Doverton. But John hears something, something else. Carnage's voice stating, Whether the flesh bags have accepted it or not, what they have failed to realize is, God is already here. The rain falls harshly on the streets of New York City as Eddie Brock pushes forward, the hood of his jacket pulling up high to hide his face, while the young boy who doesn't know that he is his father jogs to keep up. And then we all die. Any questions? Eddie asks, as he finishes telling the boy about his history with the Venom symbiote and the fact that Carnage is going to try to resurrect the dark god of the symbiotes, Null. Uh... Dylan responds, his eyes wide with shock and fear. He asks about the man who is trying to resurrect Null, but Eddie corrects him. Not a man, Carnage. He was resurrected by some cult that worships Null. He explains. Dylan's eyes drop and he stares in terror at the rain-soaked city around them. Anything else I should know? He asks. No, that's about the size of it. They keep moving with people passing them on the streets with their heads down. It's New York, where no one sees anyone. Eddie needs to get Dylan somewhere safe, somewhere to hold up while he figures out a plan. Carnage is hunting him down. He has to assume that Carnage could be at any turn, so they have to keep a low profile. He stops short, looking into the bright lights of the Times Square billboards, his image suddenly flashing across them as a news bulletin paints him as a wanted man and extremely dangerous. Eddie, what is this? What did you do? Dylan asks, but Eddie drops his head lower, trying to hide deeper in his hood. They need to move. He grabs the boy's hand and they begin to move quicker throughout the city streets with him glancing back and seeing no one. But he knows that someone is there. He knows someone is following them. They pick up speed, dashing through the subway, the shadows starting to run, calling for them to stop. New Yorkers are shoved aside as Eddie snarls for them to move, pushing past, with Dylan practically stumbling down the flight of stairs as he tries to keep up with Eddie, the man that he thinks is his brother, but is actually his father. We're getting on the train, Eddie explains quickly. He's right behind us. The station tunnel is filled with lights as the subway car gets closer and closer. Eddie is so intent on their escape that he doesn't notice the man behind him look up from his paper, his red hair peeking above the print. Cassidy smiles as he shoves Eddie and his son onto the tracks, the lights of the car bearing down on him. Eddie grabs his son, trying to shield him as their end draws near, but the shadowy man that followed them arrives on the tracks, screaming for everyone to get out of his way. His body then begins to shift and morph, becoming almost liquid as it slithers out of his clothes. Eddie! It screams, I'm here! Eddie's eyes go black as the symbiote bonds them quickly. You! but he is wrong. Yes! The symbiote rears up behind them, stopping the train with its immense strength. Eddie, are you okay? Dylan asks, glancing over his shoulder, and then he's startled to see Venom standing behind him. 
We're fine, he tells him. Eddie stands there trying to wrap his head around the fact that he is once again bonded with the Venom symbiote. And Venom can talk again as well, which is quickly explained away by the dark magic of the War of the Realms event. If you want to know how Eddie and Venom became separated to begin with, check out our playlist down below. Can feel you resisting us, Eddie. Not bonding fully. I'm sorry. I can't do this again. I'm not strong enough. But Venom apologizes. They must be together. He is coming. The police are suddenly on the platform above them, aiming their pistols at the trio, with one yelling for Eddie to put his hands up and step away from the boy. Despite the symbiote telling him that they don't have time for this, Eddie drops the mask. Dylan, I need you to go with these men. You'll be safe, he tells the boy over his shoulder. But there's no time to argue as the subway car suddenly explodes behind them. It's him! The symbiote screams in Eddie's mind. Oh, hello, daddy! Carnage laughs as he slides free of the car, the fire burning around his thin, otherworldly and human body. We should catch up! He smiles, the cops spinning, not knowing who to aim their weapons at. Eddie begins to back up, trying to shield Dylan from the villain. Officers, I need you to get out of here and take the kid with you. Run like hell! Eddie tries to tell them, and his mouth elongates, showing rows of sharp teeth and a long tongue that licks out. We'll take it from here! He growls. Venom launches himself forward, attacking Carnage, his fist connecting with the monster's face, but it doesn't seem to phase him. Venom tries to warn him, tries to tell him that Carnage is now wearing the symbiote dragon, Grendel. Carnage lashes out to the blow, nearly separating Venom from the symbiote. You know, Brock, I always thought you looked better in red. Carnage laughs as he begins to rain blows on Eddie's exposed head. The bones crack as the symbiote whispers into Eddie's mind. They can heal this, but they need to run. But Eddie, he refuses trying to crawl away. This is his problem and he'll end it right now. Carnage grabs him again, his jaw inches from Eddie's face. He threatens Dylan, stating that he'll peel back the skin from his body. Eddie screams, reaching out, grabbing the third rail of the subway. Electricity courses through his body and into Carnage. The monster screams, the symbiote flailing around as the psychopath falls. The symbiote pulls free of Eddie, its body melding into a face that stares with concern for its host. He probes him, trying to wake him up. Dylan jumps down, trying to lift Eddie up, questioning whether he's all right. I'm alive. Don't know how, but we gotta go. He tells them, so the two of them turn, leaving Carnage on the ground. The symbiote reforming as the body gently laughs beneath it. The rain falls down around them as the two of them make their way back into the streets with Dylan turning, realizing that Eddie is sagging slightly, and he hasn't said a word since they left. Eddie is asleep, but he'll be okay. Venom tells the boy, the strange voice coming from Eddie's lips startling Dylan. We've placed him into a coma while we repair his body, Venom tells him. The two of them then arrive at their destination with Eddie suddenly coming back, looking around surprised. Dylan asks, where are they? And Eddie finally realizes where the symbiote took them. They go inside of the apartment building and Eddie quickly knocks on apartment 616. The man who answers the door takes one look at the rain and blood soaked pair before shouting over his shoulder. Parker, it's for you. Later, Spider-Man leans forward in the diner booth after Eddie explains everything to him. I hate symbiote stuff so much, he groans as he rubs his head. Just so much. It ain't great over here either, Eddie growls as he leans back in his booth, his hood pulled deep over his sunglasses that cover his eyes. He thanks Spider-Man for meeting them and he asks if he can even help. When did you start fighting gods? Spidey asks. You come to me with carnage and gods and carnage has godlike powers. He jokes asking whatever happened to the good old fashioned evil businessman. Eddie just growls, starting to get up, stating that he knew that this was a mistake. Both Spider-Man and the symbiote tell him to sit back down. But he tries to ease the situation, asking if Eddie wants coffee or anything to eat. My other provides me with everything I need. I don't get hungry. Why is everything horrible with you? Spidey asks him. He tries Dylan, asking him the same question, but the young boy just glares at him, trying to tell him not to talk to him, and calls him a menace. Spidey just leans back, exasperated. This is great. You guys are great. Eddie smiles, placing his hand on the boy's shoulder. He's a good kid. After Dylan goes and sits at the counter, the two of them get into it. Spider-Man questioning whether Dylan knows that Eddie is even his father because, I'm hearing a lot of Eddie and not a lot of dad, he whispers. Eddie explains that he hasn't told him yet, that if he tells him, then it all becomes real. And the kid is stuck with me. 
Conversation is then cut short as Eddie glances at the news report that just popped up on the TV. The reporters tells of a mass grave that has been found in New Jersey, with many of the victims having been dead for years. Several images of the victims' identities pop up on the screen, and anger flashes through Eddie. Spider-Man pulls away, trying to figure out what has gotten Eddie so mad. You don't see it? General Ross? Fortinado? The Life Foundation? He practically shouts. The grave is full of people who have worn symbiotes and died. It's a message to me from Cassidy. He frowns. Even if they're dead, they're a target. Even Annie, his ex-wife. Dylan looks up wanting to know who that is, when suddenly the door to the diner bursts inward and two men in ski masks holding guns shout for everyone to stay down. One of them shrinks back against a wall when they see who's standing before them, though. Flip a coin? Spidey asks. Nah, you got it. Eddie says with a shake in his hand before turning back to Dylan. Come on, you can finish Spider-Man's fries. As Spider-Man flips in, disarming the robbers, tying them up, Eddie finishes explaining that Carnage is after everyone who has ever worn a symbiote. The last robber falls, and Spider-Man leans over their webbed bodies. Uh, when the police come, tell them I said something funny. I have a reputation to uphold. It's decided that they need someone who can build a machine to extract the remaining symbiote cells from someone's body. Eddie sighs. He knows someone. Later, Eddie and Dylan swing over to one of Rex Strickland's former safe houses. Walking through the door, the group sees a stretched out man with a strange helmet leaning over a piece of machinery. Hello, Eddie. I received your call. Maker calls from his work. So Cassidy is finally making his move. Eddie looks up at the vast machine sitting in the warehouse, questioning what it does. The maker turns, stretching so that he sits in front of Brock. You require a machine that can extract the codexes from their respective hosts without killing them. I built it 35 days ago, he tells him. He works for some people who have an interest in seeing the symbiote made whole again. Maker, real soon, you and I are going to have an intense conversation about what you're planning. And the Maker smiles, if you say so. Spider-Man then suddenly arrives with a child in tow. Oh look, a Spider-Man. Maker sighs. Eddie quickly introduces the two with Spider-Man offering his hand. My name is Reed Richards, the Maker explains, ignoring Spider-Man's hand. What? Like, really? Wait, what? How? Really? Spider-Man stammers. Maker explains that he is from a younger alternate dimension. Peter introduces the boy that he brought along with him, his godson, Normie. Eddie tries to comfort the boy, explaining that they are simply going to remove the piece of the symbiote that he was infected with. Maker steps forward, a needle in his hand. But before he can put Normie into the machine, he needs a sample. But Spider-Man is suddenly standing there. I'm not putting my godson into a machine before I know that it's safe, he tells him. Maker just sighs, assuring them that his calculations are correct. But if they don't want to test the boy in the machine, then... You can go fetch me someone else with a codex, he orders them. He suggests a highly dangerous, rather obvious choice that Cletus Cassidy would be targeting. He then smiles as he finishes his sentence. I don't suppose you have anyone like that in mind. Later, lightning is flashing over the rooftops of Ravenloft Institute for the Criminally Insane. John Jameson walks down the darkened corridor, the sounds of gently singing and laughter echoing past the cells that house the worst criminals. He turns at a sound as flashlights shining. All right, everyone's clear. You can come out now. He says into the darkness, John Jameson, you're a lifesaver. Spider-Man says as John shines his light up into a darkened corner, revealing the wall crawler and Venom smiling back at him. He goes for his gun, calling for Spider-Man to look out, but a quick webbing and explanation calmed the guard down. Quickly, the group moved through the halls, heading to Norman Osborn's cells. It was months ago that Norman Osborn infected himself with the last remnants of the Carnage symbiote. Once he was defeated, Norman's mind was shattered and the villain actually believed himself to be Cletus Cassidy. The three of them are standing outside the cell door when finally Venom steps forward. All right, how are we doing this? Do you have an override or am I ripping the door off the hinges? Spider-Man tells him to hold up. They need Norman sedated before they can even think about moving him. Suddenly, Spider-Man doubles over as his spider sense goes crazy and they both turn to see John's body beginning to shift and morph. I'm sorry. He struggles looking up with red eyes. He's in my head. I have to get him out. The guard turns, drawing his pistol, firing it at the door's control panel. The alarms begin to blare, the sound amplifying in the dark hallways, the sound waves piercing through Venom. The symbiote begins to writhe in pain on Eddie, screaming in his head. Spider-Man knocks John to the ground, trying to get control of him. But the man is just babbling about releasing God. 
Deeper in the prison, Cletus is walking through the hallways, his mere presence seemingly driving the inmates even crazier. He reaches into his chest, pulling the symbiote aside to reveal the red maggots wriggling in his exposed chest cavity. He pulls them free in handfuls, flicking them at the prisoners as he passes their cells. The maggots are latching on, biting into the flesh of the inmates and burrowing deep. One by one, the cell doors begin to fly off their hinges as the maggots take hold and inject their hosts. Eddie falls to the ground, the symbiote still screaming in pain inside of his head. He calls for Peter's help, but the hero is still trying to tie up John before he can change into a werewolf. Fine, I'll do it myself! Eddie growls, reaching for John's fallen gun, and Eddie and Venom scream in unison as he fires the gun, destroying the speakers that surround them. The sound lessens and the symbiote calms, forming once more around Eddie. But Venom doubles again and Peter is at his side. My other! He's screaming inside of my brain! Eddie explains. It can sense them. Strange noises start coming from down the hallway and the two look up, and at first it sounds like a plague, like a swarm of beetles clacking against the concrete, and then they realize it's not bugs, it's teeth. Carnage laughs as he and the infected come at the heroes, their jaws opening and closing with the clicks of their teeth. That's when Spider-Man realizes, ah, uh, we gotta save Norman. Venom pumps himself up as the infected get closer and he prepares for a fight. All right, Webhead, you ready? We're Cesare when we need him. Spider-Man sighs, and suddenly the wave is on them, the jaws snapping, the fists cracking against bone and flesh. Venom is alive now, making Eddie feel stronger than he has in months. They begin to overwhelm them, his arm morphing into a blade, ready to pierce the throat of the closest infected to him. Hey! Spider-Man yells, tossing aside his own infected. These are innocent people! They're murderous psychopaths that were indicted by a jury of their peers! Venom snarls. You know what I mean! No killing! Spidey orders them. The two keep fighting, trying to come up with a plan, when suddenly an inhumanly long arm lashes out, wrapping itself around Spider-Man's throat. Oh, little bug! Carnage laughs as he pulls the hero from the crowd, tossing the wall crawler across the hall, slamming him hard enough into Norman's cell door to knock it off its hinges. Well, well, well! Norman smiles as he leans forward, a blade hidden behind his back. Isn't this a treat? Venom flies into the room, kicking Norman in the face and launching him back. We're trying to save you, dummy! He snarls, quickly grabbing the fallen door and slamming it back into place, holding it there with his body. Let hold the door, you get us out of here! He snarls, but when Spider-Man questions him, Don't be clever, be strong! The infected keep pounding against the door as Spider-Man crosses the room. This is gonna hurt! He sighs as he webs up his hand and begins to punch the three-foot-thick concrete walls. Venom cheers him on as every blow is against that wall, and Spider-Man's web and costume begin to shred. Blood begins to drip, and the infected keep pounding on the door. Enough! Carded snarls as he kicks in the door, sending it, Venom, and Spider-Man against the far wall. His symbiote slithers in, taking the unconscious body of Norman Osborn in its embrace. The symbiote then begins to slither inside of Norman, turning his eyes red, and he smiles up at Spider-Man. I'm not here to kill! I'm here to make friends! Cletus tells them as Norman Carnage turns looking at them. The sun begins to set over a small neighborhood in Carrington Cottage. Down the street a dog walks. It looks like any other dog, but this one is a bit different. It's a bit dirty. As it stops, it hears the cries of a young girl named Sadie. So it walks over, and Sadie asks where did it come from. The dog just stares, and Sadie asks, what's the matter? Cat's got your tongue? So it licks her face, and she tells him, okay, okay. Easy now. She's never seen him before, and without a collar, there's no telling who he belongs to. She begins to scratch the dog's fur when suddenly a voice from inside the house shouts, Sadie, get back inside and pack. Sadie sighs, telling the dog that she's sorry, but she's gotta go. She would invite him in, but it's not really her home anymore. Her mom and dad have been fighting for months, and her mom wants to take her and her brother away. Before going inside, Sadie can hear the screaming of both her mom and her dad as she sits down crying. She says that they're always arguing. All they can do is say mean things to each other. They don't care if they hurt her or her brother Billy. She just wishes that they could stay here, in their house. Stay a family? Maybe she can sneak him in and get him something to eat, just until they find out where he belongs. Sadie gets up and quietly opens the door, leading the dog in, sneaking past her parents without them noticing the dog. Except the dog sits to listen to the argument. She hurries upstairs to the attic, knocking on the door. As she opens it, Billy tells her she forgot the password. 
She says, Zemnu, happy? Now hurry and come downstairs, I've got a surprise for you. She helps her brother down and just as she says that she would like to introduce him to her new friend, both children freeze in place. Before them, the dog that Sadie let in splits apart and begins to attack her parents. A blackish ooze covers her father as he screams for help, and once he's fully covered, Riot stands up screaming, come to daddy. Sadie's mother tries to get away from the purple ooze, telling Sadie to get away. However, as she finishes, the purple ooze jumps on top of her. She screams as she covered, and then a purple hand reaches out, and agony crawls over. Sadie runs over to the door, with Agony slamming it shut, telling her to stay. They're all family. Isn't this what she wanted? Isn't this what she asked for? To be one? Just as Agony and Riot reach them, the doorbell is rung. Agony quickly reverts back to Sadie's mother, answering it, asking if she can help them. And one of the neighbors says, hey, sorry to bother, but it sounded like I heard screams. Is everything okay? Agony tells him, of course it is. Couldn't be better. She was just making lemonade for the children. Sadie pushes her way out, shouting, help them, help them. So Agony spits acid into the man's face, stating, the lemonade is freshly squeezed. Sadie grabs Billy by the arm, running into the attic, telling him to be very quiet. And Billy starts to go through some of the boxes, stating that it looked like Venom, like Venom was attacking them. Spider-Man used fire and sound to stop them, right? Those must be his weakness. Just then, there's banging on the hatch. The banging continues over and over until finally Riot's hand punches through and he crawls out. He looms over them stating, There they are. We've been looking everywhere for you. We heard your cries. We heard your pain. We've been looking for a safe haven, a place to hide, a place to call home. But we can heal you, all of you. We can be together again. Complete. Your mother, your father, isn't it what you wanted? One big happy family. Out from behind, Laster looms over and Sadie throws herself into a wall, giving her and Billy an escape route. As the two run as fast as they can, Riot reaches out, grabbing Billy by the leg. He shouts for Sadie and she quickly turns back, grabbing Billy by the hand and pulls. Once the two of them make it to the bathroom, Sadie sits Billy in the tub, telling him it's going to be okay. Mommy and Daddy are going to be okay. But through the faucet, the orange ooze leaks out covering Billy. Before Sadie has a chance to save him, the ooze completely covers him and Phage walks out. Soon, all of the symbionts are now surrounding Sadie, and in a panic, she grabs a lighter and air freshener sitting on the toilet. Phage asks what's wrong, they can be a family again! Come, take my hand! But Sadie shouts that they are not her family. She flicks the lighter on and pushes the button for the air freshener, igniting the three of them. Riot smiles, stating, come, we need our family to be together. Don't you want quality bonding time? Sadie holds down the button until the air freshener fizzles out, and she runs downstairs. She heads straight for the door, and as she passes the dining room, Agony asks, Where are you going? We're about to have dinner. Sadie looks over at the table to see the neighbor from before spread open on the table. Agony says that they need to hurry, for supper's getting cold. Lasher reaches out, grabbing hold, forcing her to take seat at the dinner table, and everyone sits down with Riot asking, Shall we say grace? So everyone holds their hands, and they all chant, Good bread, good meat, good God, null, let's eat. The symbiotes all begin to pick at their food, discussing their day. And Agony asks what's wrong. Sadie has barely touched her plate. Well, how about this then? A toast. A toast to the family. To Sadie for making all of this possible. Agony holds up a glass and each of the symbiotes all drip some of their ooze into it and hand it to Lasher. Lasher tries to force Sadie to drink it, but she slams it on the table and uses the broken glass to free herself from Lasher's grasp. She runs outside, but before she can get far, Lasher grabs her and slowly drags her back in. The next day, Sadie's parents begin packing, telling Sadie and Billy to hurry up. It's time to hit the road. As they begin to drive, Sadie's father asks if they're ready to take a big bite out of the Big Apple. Billy bounces in his seat, stating, we are, we are. And Sadie's mother says that if anyone gets hungry, she packed a snack in the cooler. All they have to do is ask. So Billy says we should play a game of I Spy. And as Lasher wraps itself around Sadie, she smiles, stating, With my little eye, I spy something red. Smoke curled from the Nicaraguan village as Alejandra Jones entered. Her cloak drifts around her in the wind as she inspects the damage done. The destruction, the claw marks. She has been here a long time and wiped sin from these people. She believed that she was saving them. Instead, 
They are reduced to nothing more than drooling drones, devoid of any humanity. She turns her flaming eyes upon the village, and as penance for her own sins, she protects this place. She has faced militia, narcos, but today, something new has threatened these people. Movement from a nearby home draws her attention and Alejandra investigates. As the simple door is pulled open, an evil voice drifts into her ears. Alejandra Jones, I believe you have something that belongs to me. Carnage hisses, his sharp tendrils a lashing and piercing members of the village. Meanwhile, in Brooklyn, Danny Ketch signs for a shipment of whiskey for his bar. The delivery man tips his hat and walks out, leaving Danny to cart the booze to the back of the bar. He pushes open the door to the stock room, startled by a voice that greets him. Danny! A voice hisses at the sound of broken glass, hot gravel, and lost souls. Fear leaps through him and only a second in the box of whiskey falls to the ground shattering. I need your help! Johnny Blaze, the Ghost Rider, the King of Hell, tells him. Fear gives way to annoyance as Danny looks at the images of his former friend, ally, and enemy. You scared the hell out of me, Johnny. Alejandra needs our help, Johnny tells him, ignoring his words. Danny ignores him, continuing on about how the whiskey he just broke cost him $300. Forget your liquor for a minute, Johnny snarls. I need you to go to Nicaragua and help Alejandra Jones. I don't know who that is. Danny tells him as he bends down to try and salvage what's left of his booze. All of them broken, he mutters quietly. So Johnny tells Danny that Alejandra, she was the ghostwriter that Johnny tried to mentor, tried to lead her through what it means to be a spirit of vengeance. I failed her, he tells him. Danny barely seems to be listening as he throws the box of shattered liquor away. So why don't you go help her, he asks. But Johnny can't. He's stuck in hell until he learns how Mephesto got out all the time. Until then, the best he can do is astral projection. Johnny wants to change the way things are done, to stop forcing every ghostwriter to go at it alone. Finally, Danny looks up from his mop, jabbing a finger at the projection. Fine! I'll clean up your mess! But you need to find a way out of hell, because I'm done being the devil's puppet. Later, Danny cruises past an 18-wheeler at 700 miles per hour, the tires on his hell bike leaving a trail of fire in his wake. Inside, the cultists are alarmed. One asks if they should alert Carnage, but their leader tells them to do nothing. Carnage ordered them to keep their distance, and if they all want to keep their spines, they need to obey his orders. Danny parks his bike in the flaming village, dismounting, staring at the destruction around him. Hello? Anyone? He calls, heading to the cantina before him, pushing open the bat wing doors, stepping into the dimly lit building. He's greeted by a man, pointing a double barrel shotgun at his face, ordering him to stomp or he'll shoot. So Danny throws up his hands, his eyes straying over to the women and children hiding in the back. No need for a gun. I'm just looking for my friend and maybe a drink. The man doesn't lower his weapon, telling Danny that he is a stranger and doesn't belong here. I don't necessarily agree. The man asks if Danny came with the monster of blood and oil to fight their guardian ghost. Is she a lady? Danny asks, his hands still up. Looks like she's been to hell and back. Eyes on fire. That her? Danny asks them where he can find her. He believes that she may need some help. The children look scared, pointing out the window. They were fighting in the hills. But now, they're back. Carnage swirls his tendril blades, trying to cut the spirit of vengeance. Come on, girl! Just let me suck the marrow from your bones! Is that too much to ask? He cackles, but Alejandra is moving too fast, her flaming sword holding the monster at bay. I will not lie down for you, dog! She hisses back. Danny watches through the window, his mouth set in a grim line as his face twitches, and the flesh melts away. You might want to get somewhere safe. He tells him, his voice the sound of the grave. He turns back to the man, the rider completely revealed now. The spirit of vengeance does not hide. Outside, Alejandro stands ready against Carnage. He lashes out his tendrils trying to stab her before it's sliced from the sky. Danny screeches to a halt next to him, twirling his hell chain over his head. You must be Alejandra. He tells her. She looks confused. Johnny Blaze? She asks, but Danny shakes his head. Not Johnny. I'll explain later. The chain snaps out, wrapping around Carnage's throat, pulling him to the ground. Quickly, Danny crosses the ground, pulling the chain tighter as he goes. Thought you were dead. He hisses at the madman, but Carnage lashes out, sharpened thorns from his symbiote flying across the distance, stabbing into Danny's skull. The spirit of vengeance shrugs the attack off, calling for Alejandra to get ready with her plan if she has one. 
Alejandro rushes forward, ready to deal the killing blow with her sword, but Carnage breaks free of Danny's grasp, his arm morphing into a blade, and he pierces her chest. No! Danny screams as Carnage devours the woman's spine, and he watches the flames in her eyes finally die out. As Carnage devours Alejandro's codex, his eyes suddenly alight with flames, and his skull bursts into hellfire! Oh yeah! Papa likes this! <laughs> he cackles. Danny rides forward, his hell chain lashing out again, but Carnage avoids it, his own arm morphing into a form of hell chain that pulls Danny from his bike. Meanwhile, Alejandra opens her eyes to the new world around her. I'm sorry, Johnny tells her as she struggles to her feet. A world of fire and brimstone greet her. Johnny stands before her with a flaming crown over his head. You're dead. This is hell, where ghost riders come when they die. Alejandra stares at her former ally, ordering him to send her back, but Johnny looks away. I can't. So she slaps him. You're the devil. I fought enough devils to know the power that you possess. Johnny tells her that he just can't send her back. He could help her possess someone. Alejandra pulls him close, telling him to do it. I need to make sure they're safe away from that monster. But back on Earth in our battle, Carnage swings Danny again, slamming him hard onto the ground. I thought a real Ghost Rider would put up more of a fight! He snarls, but Danny suddenly moves fast, pulling the monster in. Look into my eyes! He snarls, his voice of fire. Every moment of pain, of torture, of cruelty that you have visited upon others, feel it tenfold! Briefly, it seems to work. But Carnage's screams of pain seem to change to screams of joy, and pain rushes through Danny's body as he's thrown away. <laughs> The monster laughs, I feed off pain and chaos, showing me my past sins has only made me stronger. Danny is stunned as Carnage lifts him up, his hand morphing into a blade again. He lashes out, stabbing Danny through the chest. Meanwhile, in hell, Johnny finishes the spell that will send Alejandra back to Earth, but he doesn't know how long she'll have. I don't need long, she tells him, closing her eyes. Back on Earth, the man and his family are trying to hide within the cantina when suddenly his teenage daughter stops and begins to twitch. Her eyes alight with fire, and Alejandra's voice pours from her throat. It worked. And then she turns to her family, telling them that they must fight. Outside, Danny tries to crawl away as Carnage grabs him once again, suddenly charging away on his own Carnage hell bike. Danny struggles, reaching for his chain as he bounces along the ground. It lashes out, snagging the bike's tires, sending them both flying through the air. Man, you wrecked my carnage cycle! Carnage hisses. Danny struggles to his feet once more, prepared to continue the fight. He dodges another attack, but his movements are now slow. When suddenly, a Molotov cocktail sails from the village, shattering and exploding on Carnage's back. The villagers all stand ready to fight, with the girl Alejandra is possessing standing out in front. Anyone who threatens these people will pay with their lives, she shouts, when suddenly the cultish truck comes barreling through and Carnage leaps atop it. My ride's here, toodles! He cackles as he disappears into the night. Though injured, Danny summons his hell bike and prepares to give chase. But Alejandra stops him. Though different, Danny recognizes the spirit of her within the girl, and she thanks him for aiding them. I barely did anything, he tells her returning to his human form, but she disagrees, looking back at the villagers. Without his aid, Carnage would have attacked and killed them. She thanks him one last time, releasing the girl and leaving her standing there very confused. The villagers all wave goodbye as Danny rides off into the night. And as the truck drives away, the powers of the spirit of vengeance are already fading within Carnage as he lashes out at his followers for disobeying his orders. Now, who's next on my butcher's block? He asks those who are surviving. Back in hell, Alejandra stares down at her own hands again, with Johnny leading her deeper into his kingdom, telling her that he has some spirits he wants her to meet. Alejandra, welcome home. He tells her, revealing the past ghost riders that reside there. The door flies inward and the creatures that have been overtaken by Carnage push their way there. The walls buckle as the monster that was Cletus Cassidy pushes past them, roaring at the two heroes that they find themselves trapped. I'm kind of getting low on web fluid, Eddie. This is kind of, Spider-Man tells his former villain turned ally. We know we can't win this, Venom says as his arm begins to morph. Spider-Man begins to fire his webbing, trying in vain to hold back the carnage monsters. 
but Venom turns, his fist becoming a massive orb of hardened symbiote. With a mighty boom, the wall collapses outward into the rain-filled night. Come on! He cries over his shoulder to Spider-Man, but the web swinger has his hands full as the monsters overtake him. We can't leave Norman like this! He yells, realizing that Norman has been overtaken by the symbiotes that Carnage has been pushing out into the world to take over his minions. But Eddie isn't waiting around. He snags the hero with his webbing, pulling him free and yanking him through the exit that he made. He's dead and we have to go. Spider-Man dangles as Venom starts to lower them down. When suddenly the symbiote morphs again and great bat-like wings form out of Venom's back. Don't worry, Pete. We've got this. The wind and the rain rush past them as Venom flies away with Spider-Man hanging from his arms. What is going on right now? I hate all of it! Spider-Man screams into the night, and back in the prison, the carnage monsters watch through the hole that Eddie Brock created. Norman Osborn once again sheathing the piece of the carnage symbiote, turning back to his new master. Why are we not following them? He questions, still thinking himself to be clean as Cassidy. Carnage merely turns away. We are. There's nowhere that they can run, he tells his children. But Norman doesn't like that answer, preferring to run down his kill and slit their throats. The young wolf runs, he kills one. The old wolf walks, and he kills them all. Carnage watches as the risen corpse of Cletus Cassidy, the man that he believes that he is, walks away. What are you talking about? Meanwhile, in the distance, Venom swoops low over a rooftop, tossing Spider-Man to the ground. Spidey's screams are cut short as he rolls onto the ground as Venom collides next to him, and they both lay gasping for air in the rain. Eddie, what was that? What are we fighting? Spider-Man asks. The symbiote slides away from Brock's face, revealing a look of surprise and fear. I don't know, but I don't think we can fight it, Pete. Well, that's a bad attitude to have in the apocalypse, Spider-Man notes as he sits up. The two men sit there in the rain trying to come up with a plan. If they can't defeat Carnage, they just need to pull the codexes out of the symbiotes that he's bonded with. So Peter thinks that he should probably go deal with Captain America and Wolverine. They both have had a symbiote before. And I guess that I'll go talk to all the low-life criminals, psychopaths, and murderous aliens on the list. Cool. Eddie scoffs. Peter nods. It sounds like a plan. They get all of the people that they're trying to protect together. And then he thwips off into the night. But before he can leave, Eddie's phone buzzes in his pocket and he picks it up to hear the sound of the maker on the other line and he questions if Dylan is all right. Uh, yes, yes, everything is fine. Th that screaming? Oh no, the boys are just watching television. The evil version of Reed Richards tells him. Maker lets Eddie know that he managed to hack the FBI database and learn something interesting about the mass grave of symbiote hosts that they found that set off this whole event. The body of Eddie's ex-wife and Dylan's mother. Anna Weying wasn't in it. I believe that she passed her codex on to Dylan, Maker tells him. Your son is a target. Fear overtakes Eddie and he tells the Maker to let Dylan know that he'll be there soon and he orders him to protect him. Nothing will harm the child while I stand in the way. You have my word. The call ends and Eddie looks back at the city before him. He can feel them. The infection that is the carnage symbiote spreading and growing. They are moving through the city, hideous monsters. And deep beneath the city, Carnage sits on his throne in the spire. His creatures, his horde, move and they stir around him. And Norman stands by his side, wondering at the vastness around him. Irritated, Cletus turns to him. I'm trying to wrap my hands around the planet's throat, Norman! Do us a favor and shut up! He hisses, but Norman suddenly stops turning to his new master. What did you just call me? Cletus leans forward, informing Norman that he's allowing him to believe that he is the real Carnage because it amuses him. But let's get one thing straight. He hisses as he wraps his claws around the man's throat, pulling the symbiote free so that he can look into Norman's terrified eyes. There's only one Carnage in this house. Norman struggles from where he fell, letting Carnage know that one day they will square up against each other so that all of the pieces of the Codex can be collected. And on the streets above, Miles Morales fights alongside the villain Scorpion as the horde swarms around them. Get behind me, he orders, but Scorpion just snarls as he continues to fight. Behind you? You ain't doing much better, kid. I can do this, Miles shouts, fighting off another horde. And finally, he smacks them with a venom strike that knocks the monsters away. Because of Spider-Man! He keeps hitting the monsters over and over again. But with everyone that falls, it seems that two more take its place. Scorpion suddenly breaks free, using Spider-Man as a distraction to get away. 
Sorry, kid. I know we used to be Venom and all, but I ain't no Spider-Man. Venom snarls a curse as Scorpion almost runs straight into him. He reaches out, taking Scorpion by the shoulders, throwing him back into the horde. We'll talk after I save the boy, but now you fight! He snarls when suddenly Carnage is there, his tentacles reaching out grasping for Scorpion. No! Venom yells, trying to leap to the villain's rescue. Gorgon, get away from him! Carnage spins the criminal around, one of his tendrils morphing into a blade, and Scorpion sags as that blade pierces his back. Miles leaps in trying to save him, his venom strike knocking the symbiote clear of Norman's head, revealing the screaming madman. And as Norman is momentarily distracted, Venom tries to drag Gargan free, but the villain can't stand. He can't feel his legs. His spine was just severed. Eddie lifts Mac to his feet, trying to clear the horde. The kid! Scorpion struggles, but Venom turns back, seeing the horde and Osborne focusing on Miles in their rage. Spider-Man reaches out his hand, fear in his voice as the creatures pour over him, and he calls out to Brock, Eddie, please, don't go! But Miles suddenly rises up, his voice changing as the carnage horde bonds with him. We're just getting started! He laughs maniacally into the night. <laughs> His name is Eddie Brock, their name is Venom, and this is the day they die. Carnage is back, powered up by Null's dragon symbiote, the Grendel. And right now, Carnage is hunting down everyone who has ever worn a symbiote. Spider-Man and Eddie went to Ravencroft to save Norman Osborn, but between the both of them, they're fading fast. Eddie can feel it. Cletus is down the hallway, crawling around in his head, laughing as the bones break. They won't make it out of this one, and it's his fault. Carnage is an evil that he created, and now all he can think about are the regrets, about his father, about Anne, about how Dylan will never know who his father is. And maybe that's for the best, but he does wish that he could have told Dylan that he loved him. Meanwhile, at Rex's warehouse, Dylan sits on a box stating that he's not home. Maker continues putting together his machine, asking who? And Dylan tells him, Eddie, you remember my brother? Maker looks at Dylan for a moment, then goes back to work, stating, Ah, yes, I'm sure Eddie will be fine. Normie Osborne walks off eating chips, asking what's wrong with him, and Dylan says that he has no clue what's wrong with the Maker. Maker then takes off his helmet, showing his misshapen head, stating, Ha ha! The machine is all done and ready to. The two kids stare, asking what happened to his brain, and the Maker puts the helmet back on, sighing, telling them, Nah, yes, my cranial augmentations must seem frightening to young eyes. This is, well, it doesn't have a name yet, but essentially, it performs a symbiote codex isolation and thermoheated extraction process. In short, it removes the codex attached to the victim's DNA without killing them. The codex is then destroyed using a, Dylan shouts, S-C-I-T-H-E. That's the name of it because it's the symbiote codex ISO. But Maker stops, I'm telling him, acronyms are for children and comic books. Machines don't have names. Either way, it is time. You, Osborne child, you're first. Dylan jumps in front of Normie yelling, No way! Eddie and Spider-Man said that they didn't want Normie going into the machine until they tested it first. So make her sighs. <sighs> and what if they don't return? What if Cletus Cassidy is on his way here right now, hunting for anyone with a codex wrapped around their spine? I would not want the life of an innocent child weighing on my soul. Now shall we? Dylan shouts, No! You're a creep and the answer is no! You want Normie, you're gonna have to go through me. So Maker stretches out, telling them, I am not accustomed to being threatened by anyone, especially one that I am so desperately trying to save. Now stand aside, or... Dylan places his hand on his waist. Or what? You have to explain to Spider-Man and Venom how you hurt two little kids to do a science experiment? How do you see that going? Maker scowls. You really are just like you are. But before he could finish as a loud bwamp, Maker looks back, asking, what could have gotten past the proximity alarms? Just then, the Life Foundation symbiotes, Phage, Riot, Lasher, Agony, burst in and make her sighs, telling the boys, Gah, get behind me. I've heard little about these ones. Phage then asks, Do you really think you could protect them? You don't know us. We will happily rip your heart out. Maker scoffs, and you don't know me. Well, you're about to. As Maker begins to press a button on the computer, it asks to input a command. And Maker smiles, Kill all symbiotes. Several turrets drop out of the ceiling and they begin to fire, and while the symbiotes try to protect themselves, Maker tells the boys to get to the armory and lock the door. Dylan and Normie run to the back, with Normie asking what happens now. 
Won't we be trapped back here? What do we do if the symbiotes get in? Dylan looks around at all the weapons spread across the room, stating, If the symbiotes get in, we fight. Back outside, Lasher whips a tendril, grabbing Maker, stating, That is enough! Carnage will kill us if we do not return with the child. We will not die today. As Lasher pulls himself in, Maker calmly says, I'm not so sure about that, while grabbing a sonic rifle. He tells the computer to set the gun to maximum payload, and when the computer confirms that it has been, Maker puts the rifle to Lasher's head and pulls the trigger. The symbiote is blasted to pieces, and from it, its host, the little girl Sadie, falls to the ground asking, What's going on? Where am I? Where's my family? Maker looks down. Well, that's interesting. Many people would view your age as a hindrance to this confrontation. I, however, am not one of them. Rifles set to live rounds. Before he could pull the trigger, the remaining symbionts grab onto the Maker, giving Agony time to spit acid on the sonic rifle to destroy it. While holding Maker down, Riot tells Phage to get the child. Inside the armory, Dylan holds one of the guns, telling Normie, Stay down. If anything comes through the door, I'll handle it. Just then, there's a loud crack -a -coom coming from outside the door, and Phage begins to rip it off its hinges. Phage pulls apart the door, yelling, Hello, boys! Mind if I come in? As he gets closer, he sniffs the air, telling Dylan, You reek of the smell of your father! You reek of venom! I will kill you for fun! But the goblin boy, he dies for carnage. As Phage gets ready to lunge, a pair of hands appear around his head, and then they twist, snapping Phage's neck. His body slumps to the ground, and from behind him, a black and yellow symbiote appears, and he tells the boys, Do not be afraid. I am Sleeper. You can trust me. I am family. I am the seventh spawn of the one they call Venom. I have been gone for a long time, exploring the cosmos in search of answers. Answers I wish I did not know. While traveling, I felt something pulling me, speaking to me, calling me, telling me that this planet was home, this planet of symbiotes. Then the Horde tried to claim me, to aid their fight. I did not understand it, but in its thrall I saw the truth. What this lie of a planet held at its core. I heard the sleeping prisoner's voice. I am coming, it said. I will be free. So I burned any connection away from secreting a powerful Badoon acid with my chemokinesis. It's a unique ability to produce chemicals from my form. After that I raced back to Earth to find you. I am the son of Venom. Dylan stares for a moment asking, Who are you though? Like underneath. Sleeper tells him, My host was a Kree soldier named Telkar. Though as you can see now, I am the one in control. Sleeper pulls back, revealing the skeletal remains of a Kree soldier, stating, Even though I am in control, we are much stronger when we aren't alone. Just then a sonic blast rips Sleeper to shreds, and Maker tells them, Rest easy, that should be the last of them, no need to thank me. I'll get this one with the others and dispose of them accordingly. As for this body, Dylan shouts, No! Sleeper is good! He's not like the- But Maker stops him. We don't name them, and we certainly do not trust them. Dylan looks at Sadie and the rest of her family in stasis chambers, asking, What are you going to do to those people? You're not going to- But Maker tells him, No, I'm not going to kill them. I'm going to extract their codexes. The symbiotes, though, those will be killed. After that, we can get your little friend into the machine and- But Dylan yells, No! I already said we're going to wait until Spider-Man and Eddie come back! I do not require your permission. Now step aside, there are lives to be saved. As Maker activates the computer, Sadie's father is shocked and he screams in pain, shouting, Please! Stop! It hurts! And Maker looks at them. Huh. They shouldn't be conscious at all. Well, that's interesting. Back in the armory, Normie says that he's scared. Please don't let the Maker put him into that machine. And Dylan tells him, I won't. We just have to get out of here. And to do that, we need to do something, something stupid. A few moments later, as Maker is continuing the extraction process, Dylan calls out to him and Maker sighs. What is it now, boy? Dylan, holding a gun and several grenades, says that they're going to be leaving and there's nothing he can do about it. Maker laughs. <laughs> and why is that? Because you're going to what? Kill me? Dylan smiles, telling him, no, because you're going to be a little busy. Dylan starts shooting, but as the bullet passes through the Maker, they begin to hit the canisters that contain the Life Foundation symbiotes. The boys begin to turn and run, and as Maker tells the computer to activate evasive defenses, the symbiotes grab him by the head and slam him into the console. Normie asks what's going on, and Dylan looks back, stating, I'm not sure. The symbiotes are all coming together. They're joining into one massive hybrid. Hybrid screams, and Dylan yells to Normie to run. As the two get outside, Hybrid comes bursting through the walls, clawing his way towards Normie. Normie tells Dylan to go ahead. They only want him. He can distract. But before he could finish, Normie is grabbed, and Hybrid says, This one has something we need. The goblin kid is in the way. Hybrid throws Normie to the side, and Dylan asks, What? 
What do you want with him? And Hybrid asks, You have no idea, do you? Together we can sense, and Maker knows, and now we know. Hybrid reaches out with Dylan screaming for them to get away, but there's something else within him giving off power. And Hybrid then says, There it is. Now! But before he could finish, a giant rock fist punches Hybrid in the face, followed by a red, white, and blue blur. The power fades within Dylan, and Captain America asks, Do you mind if we cut in? And with him is Spider-Man, Thing, and Wolverine. Along the streets of Soho in New York City, the young hero Miles Morales is brought to his knees, and all it took was a pair of sneakers. He stands there staring at the window, telling himself that he must have them. He will have them! And Genki asks him how he'll do that. They cost $300. Has he ever even had $300 at one time? It's not like money just falls from the... But before Genki could finish his sentence, there's a loud explosion and money begins to rain from the sky. As the two try to figure out how this could be happening, down the road, an armored truck crashes into a sign and Scorpion yells, You could have given up the goods nice and easy, but now the Scorpion has to hurt you. Scorpion climbs up onto the hood of the truck, telling the driver that he may have lied. He doesn't have to hurt him, but he wants to. Just before Scorpion could strike with his tail, it's pulled back with webbing, and Miles tells him, I know how it is wanting things that you can't afford, but you can't take it out on innocent people. Miles begins to web up Scorpion, but before he can finish, Scorpion tears through it, shouting, I'm gonna kill you! He whips his tail around, grabbing Miles by the leg, throwing him down the street. Miles gets back up, telling him, Okay, that one hurt. Scorpion charges at Miles, asking if the Spider-Man Jr. is still breathing. Let's change that. As Scorpion gets close, Miles jumps up, shocking Scorpion with a venom blast, stunning him just long enough to web him back up, slamming him into the ground. Scorpion whips his tail again, but as Miles knocks him to the ground, he asks, Can't you just give up? It's raining and... But Scorpion wipes his mouth, telling him, You must not know Mac Gargan. I... But before he could finish, dozens of Carnage thralls rush at the two of them, yelling, Gargan! 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 The thralls of Carnage all pile onto Scorpion, with Miles starting to pull them off, stating, I can't let you eat this guy! He's on his way to jail! However, as Miles throws one of the Carnage Thralls off, they all look at him yelling, KILL! KILL! And Miles sighs, telling them, Great! Now I got their attention! As Miles and Scorpion lean back to back, Miles tells him, These guys are trying to kill us both! Truce? Scorpion scoffs, telling him, For now we do. The two fight the Thralls back, with Miles asking, Who the hell are these people? And Scorpion tells him, Based off the orange uniforms of the inmates of Ravencroft, the place where the real cycles are put. In fact, the huge one there is the same tattoo as Happy Dan Andrews. Miles punches the thrall, asking, Happy Dan Andrews? As in Happy Dan the serial killer? He looks to take a closer look at the thralls, noticing a spiral pattern on their heads, one that he saw when he fought Venom. As more and more thralls begin to pile up, Miles asks, Can we do this without killing them? A scorpion throws a thrall, asking, Where's the fun in that? The thralls begin to overwhelm the two of them, and Scorpion yells, well, I've had enough of this. The only way I'm going to make it out is if we slow these creeps down. But before Miles' spider sense could kick in, Scorpion smacks Miles down with his tail and begins to escape. Before he could get far, a voice tells Scorpion, That was dumb. The kid could have helped you against, well, me. Miles looks up to see Carnage perched on a van, but with his current injuries, he's even struggling to move. As Scorpion runs, Carnage shoots out his fingers, grabbing him, asking, And where are you going? There's still an itsy bitsy piece of you inside of me. Carnage pulls his arm back, lifting Scorpion into the air, telling him, We're just gonna have to take your spine out so we can get to it. Carnage slowly stabs his fingers into Scorpion's side, with Miles yelling, No! and he hits Carnage with a Venom Blast. Carnage screams in pain, and Scorpion yells, well, I gotta get the hell out of here. But that's when another voice tells Scorpion, Carnage won't kill you, not if you come along. Scorpion looks up to see Venom looming over him, but before Miles could even say a word, Venom picks up Scorpion and escapes, leaving Miles alone with Carnage. Carnage gets back up, and Miles says, Sure, it's just me now. That'll be enough. But Carnage tells him, Ha ha, don't worry. This will be the last time you'll ever be alone again. It's time to bring you into the fold, Spider-Man Jr. Just then, dozens of tendrils shoot across the street and begin to cover Miles until the weight of it brings him to the ground. 
He begins to fight it off by ripping them off of him, but Carnage watches, stating, He's strong! I can feel him trying to fight, but it's no use! It's time for him to become what he really is! A perfect little monster! Just then, Miles claws his way out of the Carnage and Symbiote tendrils as one of Carnage's newest thralls. Miles' vision begins to fade to black and he begins to see everyone in his life slowly fade away. He was bound by stupid little ties to stupid little lives. But now, he's been reborn in this flesh and he's become a part of something new. He has found his true family! All that remains is the dead spirit of his former self. It tries to regain control, begging for its body back, crying a hopeless crime. Their father, Null through carnage, has destroyed the little lives they lived before being transformed. And now they are their true selves. Carnage looks down at the transformed Miles, asking, And how are you feeling today? You look like you're ready to kill a man, which is good, because I'm going to be sending you to kill a man. He's a real pain. One of those whose death will sow confusion and fear in those around him. Take Happy Dan and go get it done. As Carnage finishes speaking, the transformed Miles can hear his former self struggling to break free. The cries are smothered and pushed down, though. The symbiote is winning against Miles' own internal spirit. There's no room for weakness in their father's perfect design. They are sure in their purpose. They have been pointed at prey. And so, they hunt! As the two make their way over the Brooklyn Bridge, Miles remembers a time when he was younger with his uncle Aaron. The transformed Miles tells himself again that the dead spirit of this flesh is trying to rise, and again, they smash it to nothingness. Soon the target appears in a building, the man that Carnage wants dead, and that man is J. Jonah Jameson. Miles and Happy Dan crash through the window, screaming, kill, kill, and they begin tearing their way towards Jonah. Jonah tells the man that he's with the run. Those freaks are always after me. As Miles and Happy Dan jump through the offices, Jonah runs through telling everyone to evacuate the building. There is no time to explain. Just do it. But before Jonah could get out, Miles and Happy Dan jump on him, pinning him down, yelling, kill, kill. Jonah looks at them, telling them, whoever the hell you're working for, you got to want something, right? Whatever it is, we can. But before Jonah could finish, Miles is shot in the head as Silver Sable says, don't you worry, Mr. Jamison. Vault Communications is under our protective services. Happy Dan leaves into the group of security guards, ripping away at their chest, shouting, KILL! Miles lunges at Sable, and as the two begin to fight, Happy Dan gets up after killing the last guard, yelling, KILL! The two take turns hitting Silver Sable, and she falls to the ground with Miles getting in position to kill her. But before he could, a stapler is thrown at his head, and Jonah yells, Leave the young lady alone, you degenerate lump of toxic waste. It's with that hit that Miles Morales, the real Miles Morales, begins to try and take control of his body again. This isn't him. He can barely remember his name, but this isn't him. He knows that. As Miles runs off, he begins to yell, Not me! And Happy Dan follows, asking, Kill? Miles hurries outside, telling himself his name over and over. Miles Morales. Miles Morales. He's trying to make his transformed self remember. And Happy Dan asks, No kill? Miles tells him, No, no kill. We've done some bad things, but this isn't us. We're still human beings. Happy Dan pauses, He's telling him, I can feel them inside. I can feel them. Just then, Happy Dan is shot in the back with Sable yelling, you're not getting away that easily. Miles screams, webbing up Sable's gun, taking it away from her. And once she's disarmed, he proceeds to beat into her again. As the three set of arms punch her down, the transformed Miles stops feeling his former self clawing his way in, making them hesitate. The symbiote version of Miles knocks Sable away, stating, I will not let the dead spirit rise again! And he charges at Jonah Jameson. As Miles jumps down onto Jonah, he sinks his teeth into his shoulder, and he says, This is it! We are ourselves again! The blood begins to fill Miles' mouth, and he knows that it is not his blood. And seconds later, he pushes Jonah off, shouting, No kill! Jonah tells him that he can see that he's struggling. He doesn't have to do this. The symbiote Miles shouts in his mind that they have to smother the spirit with the inevitability of Null. But his former self shouts, I won't let this happen! Miles Morales and the symbiote Miles begin to battle inside his mind, struggling for power, with Miles charging up his venom blast and hitting himself in the chest. The shock causes the carnage symbiote to release returning Miles to his former self. 
Sable gets up and begins to help Jonah back inside, but that's when Happy Dan stands up. Kill! Miles tells him, no, no kill. I'm free of this thing. We can get rid of yours too. Happy Dan yells, free? Not fair, not fair! Happy Dan throws himself into Miles, sending the two of them off of the building onto the roof of another one. They land in a pool with Miles scrambling to get out, telling Happy Dan that he needs to fight this. You could be your own, uh, psycho killer. But back with Sable and Jonah, Sable tends to Jonah's bite and tells him to stay put. She's gonna get some help. As she begins to step away, the symbiote that was attached to Miles crawls onto Jonah, converting him into symbiote J. Jonah Jamison, a thrall of carnage. He stands back up, shouting, kill, kill. Over with Miles, he keeps Happy Dan at a distance, telling him that they can work this out. You might be a killer, but you're your own killer. Happy Dan asks, no kill? No kill, no kill, no kill. Miles tells him that's it, that's it, just. But before he could finish, Jonah jumps down onto the building, slamming Happy Dan's head into the ground, tossing him over the ledge. Miles runs over to try and grab Happy Dan, but Jonah stops him, and the two go over the ledge onto another building. Miles quickly jumps out of the pool, stating that he would love to stay behind and whoop his ugly behind, but he's got a life to save. Miles swings down to the lower part of the building to see Happy Dan laying there. And as he checks his pulse, he's happy to see that Happy Dan is still alive. And to make sure that he doesn't run off, Miles webs him up with enough webbing to stop the Hulk. Maybe. Miles then jumps down onto the streets to try and find Jonah, and after a few seconds, he does spot him. The two begin to battle, but as a passerby with headphones walks past, Jonah turns his attention to the kid. Before Jonah can hit him, though, Miles throws himself into Jonah, knocking the two of them into the shoe store that Miles was at earlier. Miles pins Jonah down, telling him, this is it and he hits him with a venom blast, stunning the carnage symbiote. Miles gets off trying to catch his breath, telling him that that should do it. And the store owner runs over asking if he's okay with Miles telling him, yeah, I'm real sorry about your window. The owner tells him it's fine. The assurance will cover it. But as for these shoes, they aren't mint anymore. Do you want some sneakers? The owner holds them out, telling him to think of them as a token of appreciation for everything he does in New York. But at that moment, the symbiote releases its grip on Jonah and it begins to make its escape. Miles quickly follows, stating that this is the only link that he has to Carnage. And since he was able to break it from its control before, maybe he can. Miles grabs the symbiote, pressing it against himself, letting it take control of him, taking his own symbiote. His body twists and it warps as the symbiote covers him, but his mind is his own. He stands back up in full control of the symbiote's suit, stating, All right, Carnage, here we come Eddie lost him the younger Spider-Man Miles Morales now taken over by the strange offshoots of Carnage crawls towards him his claws clutched at Eddie's throat as his wicked jaws open in a hideous grin I'm sorry kid Venom gasps I know this ain't your fault Venom lashes out, wrapping his hands around Miles' throat. He twists, using the strength of a symbiote to throw the creature away. We've had enough, he snarls. Eddie can hear Venom in his mind, telling him to kill the carnage spawn while they have the chance, but Eddie refuses, telling Venom to calm down. Their conversation is interrupted, though, as a familiar voice calls out for help. Eddie, help me, man! You gotta help me! Mac calls out as the spawns begin to overwhelm him, but another voice calls out, and that one is Norman Osborn, himself bonded with one of the Carnage spawns behind him. Is daddy scared? He cackles, lifting a truck over his head. After Norman Osborn's battle with Spider-Man in the Carnage suit, he now thinks that he is Cletus Cassidy and thinks that he is actually Carnage. Eddie turns, trying to reason with the psychopath. We don't want to hurt you, Norman. We're trying to help you, trying to fix your grandson, Normie. We can help you too. Eddie tries to explain as Venom shifts over his face once more. For a brief moment, recollection suddenly appears on Norman's face and the symbiote drops away. What did you say about Normie? Now, Eddie! Kill him now! Venom screams in Brock's head. The symbiote suddenly begins to pulse and it reaches out from Eddie's chest. No! What are you doing? He questions. He is weak! Vulnerable! We will kill him! Eddie hears it snarling in his head. He tries to stop Venom. He tries to tell it to listen to him. No! Not anymore! Venom lashes out, its form becoming a blade that pierces Norman's chest and throws him away. Shock fills Eddie's voice as Venom returns to him. You stabbed him in the heart, he whispers. Someone had to, the creature replies. 
The two are interrupted again as Mac Gargan calls out to Eddie again. The carnage swarms still forming around him. Eddie stands beginning to move towards Scorpion, but Venom quickly detaches itself from him, standing over the fallen Norman. We have to help Mac, Eddie yells, looking over his shoulder in surprise at the alien that is now leaving him. No, Venom tells him, looking down at their stunned enemy. We have to finish this. We have to kill him and take the codex before my spawn can repair him. Do it then. I'm going to go help Mac. I'm going to save the only person that I can. Your call. Eddie yells to Venom, rain pounding on them from above. For a brief moment, it seems as if Venom didn't hear him at all. Suddenly, the alien lets out a bestial roar, sliding across the wet cement to merge with Eddie once more. Fine. It hisses in his ear. But don't be mad at me when we lose. Venom comes in, charging his fists, knocking the carnage spawns away. In their minds, they continue to argue as another backhand knocks Scorpion clear of the monsters. Venom can no longer allow their spawn to kill, regardless of what Eddie thinks. Venom reaches down, picking up Gargan and swinging away. Understand this! If you're not going to be strong enough to stop this, I will find someone who is. Quickly, the pair make their way back to the safe house where he left Dylan, Normie, and the Maker. With a thud, Venom lands outside of the warehouse, rain still pouring down on their heads. Mac Gargan struggling slightly in his arms. I need a hospital, man. Where are we? He questions. I'll take you to the hospital and you go to prison, Venom tells him. But the villain just slumps in his arms, telling Eddie that he can't even feel his legs. Shut up. I got a guy in here that'll take care of you, he tells him, opening the door. The pair are greeted by a group of heroes. Wolverine, Captain America, The Thing, and Spider-Man all turn to see Eddie. Hey, Spider-Man waves. Quickly, the wall crawler explains that the heroes know that it wasn't Eddie at Rikers Island. That's right, Brock. You can relax, Captain America tells him. The cavalry is here. Brock takes Cap's outstretched hand and gives him a firm shake. He tells them that Mac's spine is broken and he needs medical attention. Is the maker here? He asks, but Ben Grimm merely smirks and cracks his knuckles, rocks popping loudly in the enclosed space. Yo, little Reed? Nah, that little guy ran away before I could give him a proper Yancey Street welcome. From behind them, Bruce Banner subtly crosses the room, checking a few of his notes. I disdain the use of a child as a test subject, but his science is sound. The machine works. Normie Osborne is completely free of the symbiote codex. Eddie steps forward, thanking the man. Bruce Banner, we've actually met a few times. We both looked a bit different, though. Eddie suddenly looks shocked, asking if Venom ever infected Bruce Banner. Surprisingly, no. The Hulk has never worn the symbiote, Bruce assures him. Eddie turns, finally seeing Dylan staring at him. Hey, buddy. He pulls him in for an embrace. Quickly, Dylan fills him in as to what happened, and finally motions to the strangely colored cat at his feet. His name's Sleeper! Hello, Eddie. It is good to see you again, the cat says, blinking its four eyes. Eddie just nods at the symbiote, thanking him for saving his son. Spider-Man finally comes up, letting Eddie know that it is time, and that they need to get everyone into the machine. Eddie is shocked, though, when Peter tells him that he won't be going into the machine. What? Eddie hisses as the other heroes stand and watch, but Peter tells him that this was all his fault. I brought the first symbiote here to Earth. If I hadn't, we wouldn't even be in this mess. Tell him that our kind has been here since the Dark Ages, Eddie. Since the time of Beowulf and Grendel. Tell him he doesn't have to carry this burden. Venom whispers in his ear, but Eddie only nods. Yeah, you're right. You're going in last. Finally, he turns to the heroes and he claps his hands. All right, who's first? The rain continues to pelt from outside the room with lightning flashing, bringing the sound of close thunder. Hours pass and Spider-Man enters the chamber to discover Eddie standing over the machine that Captain America is currently sitting in. You okay? Pete asks him, but Eddie just nods and Peter asks him if he's nervous about how they have to face this new dark carnage. We'll be okay, Eddie tells him, his finger tracing along the glass in the machine. You're going to tell Dylan before we go to war, right? Peter asks him, but Eddie just continues tracing along the glass, his finger pressing harder and scratching into it. Tell him what? That you're his father. Suddenly a shout erupts from the back of the room and Eddie comes charging in. Peter, get the hell away from him, he shouts. The fake Eddie begins to laugh and turn as the carnage symbiote swirls around him. The image of Eddie shifts in morse, and for a brief moment, it reveals the skeleton beneath. But that moment is gone, and the visage of Cletus Cassidy now stands before them. Bruce, can he break the containment pods? Peter asks as the three men back away. I don't think so, Bruce tells him. Uh, let's not find out, Eddie nods. Finally, the monstrous form of Carnage stands tall and the roof shatters above him as his spawn crawl into the building. 
Peter yells for Eddie to find Dylan and Normie, but Venom subtly screams in his ear, No! No more running! We finished this! It snarls as it morphs and shifts onto Eddie. What's the matter, Daddy? Performance anxiety! Carnage laughs. Venom suddenly lashes away from Eddie, its visage taking on the form of a monstrous face with open jaws. We told you, Eddie! It snarls as the jaws now engulf Bruce Banner. If you aren't strong enough to end this, we will find someone who will. Bruce Banner begins to scream as Venom flows over him, calling out for help. But Carnage lashes out his tendrils, piercing Bruce's chest. <laughs> well, that was anticlimactic. I don't know who that nerd is supposed to be. But he's cut off as a massive fist slams into his face, knocking him away, revealing the skull beneath the symbiote. I felt that! Who are you? The massive creature rises, one the size of the Hulk, but covered in a symbiote, letting out a blood-curdling roar. We are Hulk! The room is black around him as Bruce Banner enters. He crosses the floor, placing a chair in the center of it, and he sits, adjusting his glasses on his face. You know, it's actually been a long time since I've had a conversation like this. I guess I should be thanking you for providing the venue. He introduces himself, telling the other that they have actually fought alongside one another before. After talking to your friend, I think that we could help each other. Maybe combine our strengths. Once the others get here, of course. Bruce leans forward, telling him, Trust is kind of a big deal for us. So why don't we start by telling you how we got here? Weeks ago, Bruce stands in a hotel room. Once he has the personality in control, he never knows how he got here. In his hand is a crumpled note from Joe. The note telling him that the room is paid for and that his friends are in the next room over. And it says to not bother them since he is too needy. Gently, he knocks on the bathroom door asking for Betty. He opens it to find Betty in her harpy form, sitting on the tub. And inside the tub, Rick Jones lays in an almost zombie-like state. Yes. This is me. Rick Jones is in the bathtub, getting better. Maybe. She tells him her voice, both a growl and a sound of exasperation. Jackie can tell you more, she says. And she slams the door closed in Bruce's face. Jackie would fill Bruce in on the whole story. How Shadowbase turned Rick into the new abomination. How Hulk ripped Rick free and now he's in some sort of recuperation. But none of that matters to Bruce. As he crosses the room, plopping down on the bed and the TV clicks on with him flipping through the news hoping that it will fill him in on some of the events. But the reporter tells him a different story. The images show a military cemetery that was desecrated while the anchor reports that red slime was left at the scene, and the body of Thunderbolt Ross is missing. Quickly, Bruce turns it off and leans over the edge of the bed. The body of a gamma mutant was stolen and red slime was left at the scene. Bruce could only come to one conclusion. This was about me. He explains in his seat from the black room, and he turns at the sound of a new voice and Joe Fixit enters the room. Hey, so this is happening, huh? He asks, and Joe crosses the room, leaning over Bruce's shoulder, speaking to the other. You see this face? It ought to be gray and a hell of a lot uglier. Bad enough I'm a shrimp out there. I gotta look puny in here too? Bruce tries to interrupt him, and finally Joe leaves the room, offering to go find the others. But back in the hotel, Bruce is finishing up explaining what happened to her father to Betty. She barely responds, so Bruce explains that he feels that they should investigate. Can you find your father? By scent? He asks, and Betty turns, nodding. Yes, alive or dead, I can find him. Bruce nods, a plan formulating in his head. We need to get out to West Point, so he asks her what her top flying speed is. Alone? Ten hours, she tells him. Carrying you? Longer. Too long. We'd be seen. Bruce looks at her quickly, his voice small in the bathroom. What if you folded me up small? He asks meekly. Betty doesn't respond, merely reaching out, taking Bruce's face in her hands, almost gently. He never remembers what happens when he dies. The next thing that he knows is that the Hulk is standing over a mass grave, and Betty is flying away in the moonlight. Betty was here. Hulk interrupts the story as he enters the black room. Betty is friend. Or was friend. Hulk not know anymore, he mutters. But Hulk gets mad, angry that he only comes out to hurt people. He snarls at the other as Banner tries to calm him down. Whoa! Stupid Banner! Stupid Banner knows nothing! He snarls as he stomps off, and with a sigh, Banner turns back and continues his story. Banner explains that the mass grave was out of the way, and while someone might have found it, they didn't have that kind of time. So Hulk did something he's never done before. He called the news. From the woods, Hulk watches and listens as two detectives begin to go over the list of bodies in the grave, and as he realizes that the people in the mass grave all had symbiotes, he stalks gently back into the forest. 
Meanwhile, in the city, Spider-Man is swinging along, headed home as the sun comes up when suddenly a massive water tank flies by him. Hulk just wanted his attention. The wall crawler moves fast, grabbing the tank and webbing it up so that it can't hurt anyone. Swinging back down to the roof, the wall crawler is prepared to fight, but instead, he finds Bruce sitting there. A short time later, Peter gives Bruce some extra clothes that he stashed around the city, and Bruce quickly fills the hero in that they found a mass grave. But suddenly, he turns, and look of concern on his face. Tell me about Venom. Spider-Man explains that Venom is not the problem, it's his offspring, Carnage. He wishes to pull the Codex out of everyone who has ever bonded with a symbiote in order to raise the Dark God Null. He's Cosmic Satan, Peter explains. The one below all, Bruce explains, once again in the black room. He believes that Null could possibly be some facet of the one below all, or some creature that it controls and works through. Like my father. Bruce looks up at the other again, which means this is definitely my problem, and I have to help. It ain't and you don't, Devil Hulk growls as he enters the black room. Getting involved with this is a mistake. Ross is back at his grave, that part's over. So we're done, he tells him, leaning over Bruce's face. Betty and Jones are waiting in California, where we need to be. We got work to do, remember? But Bruce just turns away from the Devil Hulk. I'm well aware, but that doesn't mean that we run off and let some space god end the world. He turns back with more determination in his voice. We're ending the world. Our way. Devil Hulk just grunts and stomps off with Bruce calling after him. It's too late to go back now. We're already involved. Back with Spider-Man, Bruce hooked up with Captain America and Wolverine, and they found Eddie's safe house. And Bruce managed to figure out the Maker's machine. And when Carnage and his spawns attacked, Venom lashed out, engulfing Bruce. It's been less than a second since then, Banner, Devil Hulk explains with the rest of the personalities behind him. It just seems like longer in here. That's all. We can still reject this thing. He explains, staring at the other, and Bruce shakes his head. I'm willing to accept him, to work with him, he tells the Devil Hulk. But Devil Hulk just turns and looks amazed. It don't work that way! Gesturing to the other that Bruce has been talking to the whole time. Just look at it! The starling face of Venom stares back at them, its eyes large, its toothy mouth open wide as its tongue slithers back and forth. The symbiote makes up the black room that they stand in now. It's an alien parasite. It infects people. It uses people. All it wants is our strength. So, Hulk is strongest one there is, Hulk explains. Ain't like we're gonna get out of this without a fight, Joe adds. New kid's got some moxie. Let's see what he could do. But Devil Hulk tries one more time explaining that they are a system, and the symbiote isn't a part of it. It'll mess things up, it'll gum up the works. But Bruce smiles and shakes his head. Three to one votes. You're with us now, Venom. Back in the safe house, as Spider-Man, Eddie Brock, and Carnage look on, Hulk roars to life, now bonded with Venom. Because we are Hulk! As Deadpool and Spider-Man run through the streets of New York, Spider-Man yells as he tries to catch his breath, telling him, I really, really don't get it, Deadpool. And Deadpool asks him, what do you mean? Really, Deadpool? Take a guess. It could be the fact that every single villain you have ever fought is currently chasing us. Like, what were you even thinking, man? Deadpool shrugs. What? I just wanted to throw you a surprise birthday party. Spider-Man webs up grabbing Deadpool, telling him, first off, it's not even my birthday. Second, why invite all my enemies? And Deadpool tells him, okay, well, one, how was I supposed to know what day your birthday was on? You know, secret identity and all, bud. And all your enemies? Well, that circles back to the not knowing the secret identity part. How was I supposed to know who you're friends with? As the two swing away, the villains stop and Rhino asks, Am I the only one who actually brought a present? Spider-Man shouts out, The only person you didn't invite was J. Jonah Jameson. And Deadpool says, yeah, about that. Elsewhere, J. Jonah Jameson is sitting in a party room by himself, muttering, Freaking wall crawl and menace. But back with our hero, Spider-Man lands on top of a building and Deadpool asks, How about we get some pizza or something? And Spider-Man stomps over to him shouting, You! Insane! Irresponsible! Extremely dangerous moron! This friendship? It's done! You need help. Serious help. Not just a once a week shrink, but people, teams of people, round the clock, Deadpool. Spider-Man hands Deadpool a piece of a business card and tells him, Call this person, and don't bother calling me until you do. He then swings off the ledge with Deadpool asking, Where are you going? <laughs> Whatever, I'll get this over with. How could anyone say mad at Deadpool? No one! Deadpool swings down to the street where Rhino dropped his present and Deadpool finds a Rhino hoodie, which obviously he took. Weeks later, you know, when Spider-Man didn't get over it, Deadpool decides that maybe 
just maybe after numerous unanswered texts, calls, self-restraining orders, and blocking him on face space, that maybe Spider-Man is still mad. So why not go see the person on Spider-Man's business card? John Jameson at Ravencroft. Sure, why not? This place looks happy. Deadpool kicks in the door shouting that he's ready for his sponge bath, Dr. Phil. Then after a few moments of silence, Deadpool says that this is not the reception that he was expecting. He walks up to the guard watching the security cameras and says that he's going to check in. Can he inform John Jameson? Made sure to leave all the guns home, even the cavity search gun. The guard doesn't answer. So Deadpool says, all right, I get it. You're sleeping on the job. Say no more, my friend. Just gotta go this way. As Deadpool whistles and leaves, he doesn't notice that the guard sitting there has his throat slit and is clearly dead. Meanwhile, back at the facility, Carnage begins to tell his symbiotes that God is coming, cult of Carnage. God is coming and he is angry. Hell, he's pissed as if we didn't have enough problems with the spine scavenger hunt. Now missing that Shawshanked her way out of here thanks to an all-American werewolf in stupidity over there. The Carnage converted John Jameson as a werewolf pulls down the hood to his robe, stating, I promise that I'll make amends. Just let me. And Carnage stops him, telling him, Oh, don't worry. You will make amends. Otherwise, we'll see about getting you fixed. Just then, Carnage hears somebody clapping, and Deadpool tells him, Oh, oh, oh this is perfect. I've heard of this kind of immersion therapy before, but I gotta ask, why pick Carnage? Carnage is a loser. You should have gone with Stiltman. Now, that would have been more threatening. And what's with Fido over here? Feels like he's got some real fur on him, possibly fleas, and that dog breath. Hey, <laughs> you! Carnage stares for a moment, realizing that Deadpool just walked into his sanctuary, and he tells everyone, KILL HIM! Seconds later, Ravencroft's halls are filled with the screeching screams of Deadpool as he begins to run away from Carnage and his horde of symbiotes. So what is Deadpool to do when he doesn't have any guns? Well, the next best thing, microwaves! Everyone and their mother knows what happens to a microwave when you put metal in it. And there's going to be more metal in there than Iron Man's underwear! That is, if Iron Man wears underwear. Or is he naked in there? These are the world's greatest mysteries! Just as the symbiotes start to beat on Deadpool's makeshift barricade in the kitchen, he begins to set the microwaves off, asking himself, Do I have time to heat up a burrito? Nah, probably not! A few moments later, the symbiotes break through and they begin to grab the flaming microwave, stating, I would like all of you guys to meet my friends here. This one's Bernie, this one's Explody. As Deadpool begins to make his escape, Carnage watches Ravencroft burn down and shouts, I knew it! I warned you! Now it's time to put the old boy down! Carnage grabs John by the throat and John tells him, Wait, we can get Missy Knight back. Just give me a chance. And as for Deadpool, how was I supposed to know that he would come dressed here like a unicorn? A tendril forms out of Carnage's shoulder and he says, not that it matters, but that was a rhino, not a unicorn hoodie that he was wearing. But then Carnage stumps. Unicorn! Unicorn Jameson! You're a genius! Saying that made me realize something. That clown Deadpool's the only human alive that has merged with four symbiotes. His spine is like hitting the friggin' Codex Lottery! In other words, Deadpool's a damned unicorn! And because of that, my children, Deadpool's my top priority. Well, because of that, and another possibly more important reason, I really hate that guy! But later, at Deadpool's not-so-secret secret safe house and comic store, Deadpool goes through the list stating, I love this one, and this one, and especially that one. But this one? They probably should have just stayed friends. But the rest of you, I love you all! I'll never part with you beautiful guns ever again. It felt like leaving the house without any underwear. Again, and the 44 Magnum? You are missed most of all. Just then the phone rings with Deadpool sighing, asking, Can't a guy have an inappropriate intimate moment with his guns and bees? This better be good. But Deadpool answers as Spider-Man yells, Thank God! I really need your help right now. Really? Last time we spoke, you were really mean. Our friendship is important, but you just threw it out the window, Spidey. Our friendship was like the pizza with pineapple on it of friendships to me. The Spider-Man tells him, Look, when this is all over, I will take you to the New Yorkiest pizza place of all time. Hell, the Statue of Liberty and Derek Jr. will be serving. But right now, as someone who hasn't bonded with a symbiote before, I need you to help me fight Carnage. And Deadpool tells him, Right, about that. Well, looks like Carnage already sent some symbiotes my way, so we'll have to talk later sometime, other buddy. Bye! <laughs> Out in the streets, Venom rips apart another symbiote, stating, I told him we didn't need your stupid friend, now that you have us. But back at the safe house, three of Ravencroft's inmates, Willow of the Wisp, Conundrum, and Freak, who have recently been converted into Carnage symbiotes, kick in the door and Willow of the Wisp simply says, That is a lot of guns. The three spot Deadpool sitting in his chair and Freak charges forward telling him, There he is! Carnage wants your spine! But he said nothing about your head! As Freak swipes, Deadpool's head falls to the ground and he yells, Ha! I done good! 
Think Carter's will let me keep the head? But Conundrum tells him, I don't see why not, especially since it was a fake. Will of the Wisp lights up the area, stating, It's fake. Face it, lads, we've been had. But as the three look at the dummy, they notice a note that says, Blank goes the dynamite. Conundrum reads the note, asking, What is that supposed to mean? And a second later, Deadpool's safe house explodes. Conundrum's body falls out of the sky with Deadpool looking down, stating, Oh, this is gonna be good! Deep fried conundrum. Now where's that Szechuan dipping sauce? Conundrum begins to get back up, but before he can, Deadpool stabs his sword down into his chest. And then he tells him, that's funny. Why do I hurt when I'm stabbing somebody? Will of the Wisp shoots several more tendrils through Deadpool, telling him, life is full of disappointments. Might as well get used to it now. Deadpool rolls over onto his back, taking out a flamethrower, asking them about, what about the trick where I pretend to be mortally wounded? He pulls the trigger of the flamethrower on Freak, asking, what gives? Aren't symbiotes supposed to hate fire? And Will of the Wisp tells him, other symbiotes, yes. But I became intangible, and Freak here can regenerate. Freak then chomps down on the flamethrower, and Deadpool asks, Okay, how about a crap load of bullets to your face? Freak punches Deadpool back down, and Willow of the Wisp picks him up, telling him, Okay, it's time to end this. Here's another power not many people know that I have. The power of the mind. Look into the lights, Deadpool. You will take your blade and insert it into your own back, removing the all-important spine. Willow of the Wisp waits as Deadpool begins to carve into himself, and then suddenly feels a sharp pain. He lets go of Deadpool, falling on his back with a sword in his side, asking, How? And Deadpool tells him, The powers of the mind sometimes don't work so great on me, since I am absolutely out of my mind. Figured I'd play along, knowing the intangibility thing only works when you know it's coming. Freak then lunges at him, telling him, It's all well and good. But how are you going to deal with me? I'm practically invincible. Deadpool first starts with machine guns, then a grenade launcher, then a bazooka, and then a big, ridiculous Leidfell-esque gun that may or may not have been stolen from Cable and also gave him a hernia. Freak falls to his knees, stating, Ow! I'm supposed to regenerate! And Deadpool asks, You know what I think? Maybe we finally overload your healing factor to the point where even the tiniest drop of water could kill your ugly ass. And so Deadpool takes out a squirt gun and shoots. The water makes contact, and Freak explodes with a loud splat. And as it rains down Freak's internal organs, Deadpool tells him, Great! Now I'm wearing your ugly ass! Sure, I won, but at what cost? I can taste spleen! At least I hope it's spleen! But before he could finish, Tendril's lash out, grabbing Deadpool by the neck, and a voice simply says, It would seem the old saying is true. Don't send symbiote boys to do a Cassidy's job. As Carnage holds Deadpool up, Deadpool tells him, Wait, are you Norman? And the Norman Osborn, who thinks that he's Carnage, which is kind of a long story, and you should check out our other video if you want to get a better understanding of that. It's the Red Goblin one, where Spider-Man defeats Red Goblin and Norman. Anyway, tells him, No, I'm Cletus. Deadpool then asks, Are you sure? Because you really sound like Norman Osborn. And as Norman Osborn squeezes down, Deadpool gasps for air, telling him, If this isn't the pineapple with pizza out of, of the Who's Hunt First for Teeds, then I don't know what is. Which, by the way, I wasn't. A few moments later, after being slid up and stabbed by a set of claws, Deadpool asks, Are those Wolverine claws? Why did it have to be Wolverine claws? Also, extra points for being able to recreate your own man musk stench. Norman tells him, It's quite simple, really. It's all about having the right tool for the right job, whether it's cracking someone's skull open, cutting their lungs out, or crushing the very life out of them. As the tendrils tighten and squeeze around Deadpool's body, he tells him, Okay, fine! I'm ready for the tinkler tool now! Inappropriate or regular, I will let you decide! Norman pulls him close, telling him, You don't know how special you are, huh? Simply put, your specialness to Null lies in the fact that you have merged with four symbiotes. Or to put it another way, you're a damned unicorn, Deadpool! Deadpool thinks about it, stating, I don't feel like a unicorn. Maybe some other kind of mythological creature, though, like a cyclops or a minotaur. Norman says, what you're about to feel like is a man without a spine. Now hold still, and... But as Norman gets ready to cut into Deadpool's back, a web grabs him by the hand, and Spider-Man swings in asking, Can I interest you in a nice fist to the face as an alternate, Norman? Norman cuts the webbing, shouting, For the last time, I'm Cletus Cassidy! And Spider-Man asks, What is he talking about? And Deadpool tells him, I don't know either. Norman thinks that he's Cletus Cassidy for some reason. Norman then grabs Spider-Man's webbing and pulls him in, clotheslining him, telling him, Not only do I get to offer up Deadpool to Null, but now I have the lovely gift of Spider-Man as well. Deadpool jumps up, slashing into Norman's back, telling him, me and Spider-Man wouldn't make very good gifts, to be honest. Now, one of those funky recliner chairs that massage the butt, that's what an insane symbiote space god would have wanted. Spider-Man gets up and the two take turns beating into Norman, but after a while, Norman shoots out dozens of tendrils, stating that he has a bad habit of letting people think that they've won. I must admit, Mama always said I play with my food too much. 
she was right. Norman focuses his attentions on Spider-Man and Deadpool says, that since they've already established that he's a bad friend, a friend that you thought so little of Spider-Man that you demanded I go to a mental institution or else be cut off. Now it's time for me to be cut off and cut out. Deadpool begins to run away from the battle with Spider-Man asking, are you being serious right now? Wait, wait. Norman bashes Spider-Man into the ground telling him, I'm pretty sure Deadpool is dead serious. Later, as Carnage is sitting on his throne, he sighs. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I sent you to get Deadpool, and while they're both annoying as hell, that ain't Deadpool. Norman tosses Spider-Man to the ground, telling him, Regrettably, Deadpool escaped. Thought bringing a spider to squash would be the next best thing. Carnage picks up Spider-Man, telling him, You thought right. Spider-Man asks, Next best thing. Come on, I am a much better catch than Deadpool. I don't stab my friends in the back and make stupid jokes about chimichangas or B. Arthur. Just then, Deadpool says, Say what you want about me, Spider-Man, but I'll be damned if I'm going to stand there while you badmouth B. Arthur. Either way, surprise! Guess who decided to trade himself for Spider-Man? That's right, I may be a bad dancer, cook, meteorologist, but I'm not going to be a bad friend as well. Spider-Man gasps for air, telling him, You're an idiot. I appreciate the attempted save, but you do know that they're just going to kill us both, right? And Deadpool tells him, <laughs> Carnage would do that. Carnage then says, The wall crawler might be onto something, but I got to hand it to you, Deadpool. You might just be the only person crazier than me. He tosses Spider-Man and latches onto Deadpool, and as he squeezes, he stops, telling him, Your spine feels different. Carnage pulls Deadpool in and starts to rip into his back with Deadpool telling him, You might be right about the crazier thing. I am crazy. Crazier than you. Crazier than just about anybody. But sometimes, just sometimes, mind you, I'm crazy like a gorilla. As Carnage pulls out Deadpool's spine, he sees a note inside stating, Blank goes the dynamite. And Carnage simply says, Oh, crap! The bundle of dynamite that is in Deadpool's back then explodes, engulfing the entire room in flames. And once that smoke begins to clear, Spider-Man throws his web shield away, asking Deadpool, Deadpool, please don't be dead. Just gotta move this symbiote, Ed. The symbiote begins to groan, and Spider-Man chucks him, telling him, Yikes! Maybe you're not dead after all. Spider-Man then sets Deadpool's torso up, telling him, I'm pretty sure the saying that you are going for is crazy like a fox, Deadpool. And Deadpool tells him, ha ha, it's like a gorilla. Gorillas are nuts. The women kidnapping, the building climbing, the feces throwing. So much feces throwing. But uh, where'd my legs go? The two look up to see Deadpool's lower half plastered onto the ceiling. And Spider-Man says, uh, looks like your legs went all Apollo 13 on you. And we don't have time to retrieve them. Cletus and not Cletus are coming after us. So a few weeks later, at one of Deadpool's many crummy safe houses, Deadpool sits on the couch yelling, Hello! What is taking so long? My feet aren't going to massage themselves, you know. As Spider-Man walks in in an apron, Deadpool's playing his video games, telling him, It is about damn time. Wait, are those brownies burnt? They smell burnt. And it's not time for Thanos puppet theater yet. And after that comes my sponge bath. Also, this Maximum Carnage game, it sucks. Spider-Man sets the brownies down asking, How much longer is this going to take? Seems like you should have been healed by now. And Deadpool responds, Not for a spine, it doesn't. Spines are like the pizza with pineapple on it of body parts to be healed. Now, go make more brownies and do it right. Spider-Man drops the Thanos puppet and leaves, and Deadpool gets up, grabbing it, stating, I will go for some Thanos puppet theater now, though. But as he picks it up, Spider-Man is walking back in, asking, You can walk? And Deadpool asks, uh, You gotta define walk. And a few moments later, the gentle screams of things breaking, and Deadpool's screams can be heard throughout the safe house. All seemed lost. Carnage was winning. He was collecting the codex from every person who had even worn a symbiote. Scorpion was next on that list, and when Miles Morales intervened, there was hope. He had stunned the Osborne Carnage long enough for Eddie to save Scorpion. However, Miles wasn't so lucky. Elsewhere, the Avengers were dealing with a hybrid maker who had his sights set on Dylan and Normie Osborne. Hybrid maker was proving to be too much for Captain America, Wolverine, and the Thing, so Dylan knew that they only had one last chance to fight back in the form of one of Venom's other children, the Sleeper. Dylan and Normie ran back to Maker's lab to free Sleeper, and as Dylan opened up the container, Sleeper asks, Are you ready to fight alongside your brother Eddie and save all of those that Carnage is hunting down? Dylan holds out his hand to the symbiote and tells him, Yes. So Sleeper begins the bonding process. As Sleeper begins to wrap himself around Dylan, Dylan's eyes turned black and he began to speak in another language. Sleeper released his grip, screaming, Get away from me! Whatever's in your mind is something else. And Sleeper asks him, What are you? 
Dylan looks at himself, telling him he doesn't even know. Back on the streets, Hybrid Maker is laughing as he easily beats down the Avengers, asking, Is that really it? Is that all you've got? Just then, Hybrid Maker is hit in the chest with an arrow, and a second later, a sonic blast disrupts his connection to the symbionts. Hawkeye then jumps off the jeep that he was riding and sends it into Hybrid Maker, telling him, Sorry I'm late, LA traffic was murder. The jeep goes crashing into a wall and Hybrid Maker pulls himself out shouting, Do you really think that was enough? Do you even know what I am? Dylan walks up with Sleeper as he takes the form of a wolf, telling him, No, not really, but my friend might. Sleeper, kill! Sleeper roars as he lunges forward at Hybrid Maker, biting into his chest, and Spider-Man yells that they have to help, but Dylan tells him, No, wait. Sleeper jumps back and Hybrid Maker asks, What is this? Did you intend to slobber me to death? Dylan tells him that Sleeper is capable of making any chemical from his body. So no, it's not slobber. It's napalm. And Hawkeye laughs, telling him, Metal! And he fires a flaming arrow. Soon everyone hears a loud whoosh as Hybrid Maker's body bursts into flames and the fire burns bright, causing everyone to cover their eyes. As it dies down, they see Hybrid Maker slipping away into the sewers. And a few hours later, back in the lab, Bruce tells everyone that he and the Hulk had their own run-in with some symbionts, but everything regarding Maker's machine is sound. The miscalculations have been adjusted to relieve the discomfort that the boys have heard earlier. So if everyone is okay with it, they can proceed and try to remove the codex of a symbiont from Normie's body. As Normie begins the process of removing the codex, Spider-Man tells Dylan that he did good back there. His brother would be proud of him, and Dylan says, yeah, if he ever comes home. He then sits down along the wall with Sleeper, and Sleeper tells him, Never do that again. So Dylan apologizes to him. He had to do something, and it just sort of kicked in, like instinct. He didn't even know that he could. Sleeper stops him, telling him, Controlling a living thing against its own will is unethical, and... So Dylan asks him, How's Telcar, your original host? Sleeper looks at him for a moment and tells him, Napalm was a good idea, but why a wolf? Dylan tells him he's not sure. Maybe it's because he saw Eddie do it with his symbiont, but to be honest, he really isn't much of a dog person. Sleeper tells him that he understands, so maybe this will suffice. After changing form, Sleeper looks like a cat, and Dylan smiles, telling him, yeah, I'd like that a lot. That's when a familiar voice calls out to Dylan, and he looks up to see Venom walking his way. Eddie pulls back the mask, showing his bruised face, telling him, hey buddy. Without a word, Dylan jumps up to hug his brother. Sleeper watches from the shadows, telling him that he'll stay by Dylan's side for what's about to come. He'll protect him and never betray him. But there's one thing that he must ask. When are you going to tell Eddie what you really are? Venom smash! And the wall explodes as Venom Hulk's fist connects with Carnage's face, throwing the two of them out onto the concrete. Carnage cackles, screaming for more, and Spider-Man stands guard, watching the Carnage spawns, joining the fight, as Eddie Brock, now Venomless, pulls open the door from within the old safe house. As he opens the door, the fact that Venom abandoned him keeps running through his mind. And Dylan calls out, Eddie, we can't go! Sleeper's back there! Dylan tries to explain, referring to the symbiote that had recently bonded with a cat, the Sleeper symbiote that is one of the children of Venom. Sleeper can take care of itself. Eddie tells the boy, and the group move into the next room with Eddie slamming the door behind them. A brief moment passes while he tries to regain his breath. All right, all should be good. Spider-Man, stay in here and don't let anything get in, he tells the wall crawler. He then clicks on a light, revealing the anti-symbiote tech that lines the walls. Eddie, you go out there, you're gonna die. Do you understand me? Spider-Man tries to explain, but Eddie turns to him, determination in his face. I can't protect the beat. I'm useless in here. At least out there, I can make sure that they don't kill the Avengers in their sleep. His face turns to one of anguish as he talks to his once enemy, now friend. You're all I have, please. For whatever I've been to you over the years, just do this for me, promise. Pete nods, putting his hand on Eddie's shoulder. As long as I'm standing, nothing gets to these boys. You have my word. Eddie quickly begins to sort through the pile, pulling out a gauntlet. And Spider-Man explains that the rest of the Avengers will be out for at least another 10 minutes. Eddie nods, picking up Captain America's shield. Got it. I got 10 minutes. I can pretend to be a superhero for 10 minutes. He explodes into the room, with Carnage spawns turning towards him, and he charges into them. Cap's shield cracking against their skulls, and he grits his teeth. Another blow knocking away another spawn. Oh, Eddie! The spawn that was once Miles Morales hisses at him from above. Eddie turns up, looking at the hero. Hey, kid. And with that, Miles leaps upon him. 
Outside in the pouring rain, Carnage and Venom Hulk begin to trade blows. Carnage knocks them down, endlessly shattering. So Hulk punches him in the face, stunning him for a brief moment before he grabs his jaw, trading to force it open and snap it. From Carnage's throat, tendrils snake out and they pierce Hulk's skull, snaking into his brain. Yeah, go! Hulk screams and he can hear Cletus's voice in his mind, screaming for him to get out. Inside, claws are slashing across Eddie's back, bringing pain and blood, and he turns, swinging the shield to try and knock aside Miles. But the creatures leap onto the shield. You know what, kid? That's enough. Most people will try to talk you down right now. Say something like, you're still in there. Fight it. But I've been where you are, swallowed by the darkness, making you watch horrible things. Eddie strains, placing the gauntlet against the shield. Last time it happened to me, you broke me out by nearly shocking me to death. Remember that? You called it a venom blast. Electricity then surges through the vibranium and into Miles, and he rears back, screaming in pain as he's launched across the room. He then stands up with the symbiote falling off of his body, and he looks around confused. Did I hurt anyone? Miles Morales asks Eddie Brock meekly. You're fine, kid. Come on, we ain't done. As the spawns begin to recover, Eddie and Miles charge outside. They know that if Carnage gets a Venom, he will be unstoppable. And outside, the symbiote begins to peel away from Hulk's face, making him roar in the pouring rain. Carnage keeps working and Hulk drops consciousness, allowing Banner to emerge. Carnage holds up the tiny scientist laughing into the night. And with that, Eddie and Miles arrive watching as Carnage rips Venom out of Banner, absorbing Venom into himself. The symbiote surges around him, adding to his power. Now that's more like it! <laughs> Cassidy laughs, turning his body, now augmented with horns erupting from his head. Where were we, Brock? The two stare, stunned at what stands before them. Oh my god, Eddie whispers, but suddenly a hand is placed on his shoulder. You've done a good job, Brock. The voice tells him, forcing Eddie to turn around. Captain America smiles, his fist flying out, knocking away a spawn that was coming up behind him. Now what do you say? He smiles, taking his shield. Think I can have a turn with that thing? He leaps into the fight with Carnage, and Wolverine and the Thing are right behind him. The three heroes charge, meeting the monster blow for blow. And Eddie watches the fight, but Miles grabs him. They begin to fight their way back through the spawn who are attacking the Maker's machine. And Miles explains that he could sense it when he was bonded. The machine doesn't destroy codexes. It collects them. The Maker wasn't saving people. He was amassing power. Eddie stares at the enemies that are before him, and he can sense that the heroes have already fallen outside. The monsters are ripping at the door that protects Spider-Man and the boy who still doesn't even know that he is Eddie's son. Osborn charges through the wall, and Spider-Man readies himself. This far, Osborn. Not another inch! He snarls, and Eddie walks up to the machine. Miles begins to fight the spawns behind him. Outside, Carnage is stretching, his venom wings expanding to their full width. If you'll excuse me... I have a god to awaken. <laughs> Eddie can feel it through the codex that is still within him as he places his hand on the machine. The other codexes that the Maker was collecting are surging inside. He feels it for the first time since this fight began. Hope. Outside, Carnage leaps into the sky and inside, Spider-Man tries to hold Osborn back. So Eddie punches through the machine, revealing the swirling symbiotes within. The liquid surges forward, pouring over Eddie Brock. And the codexes writhe and twist around him, combining. And they melt together inside of him, the voices of many hosts. The power surges through him, and it is nothing like Eddie's ever felt before. He falls to his knees, his back arches and great leathery wings sprout free. This ends with all of us. He snarls in his head, leaping into the air. We're stronger together. Together, we are Venom. Riker's Island, years ago, Cletus Cassidy looks up with a smile of an insane person pulling across his lips. Would you like to know why you're gonna die? He asks. I mean, I'm happy for the company, but you know you're basically gonna die, right? The guard shuts the door, telling them to play nice. And Eddie continues to stare at the man before finally speaking. I want the bottom bunk. I ain't having you where I can't see you. He grumbles and Cassidy just smiles. Smart, smart, smart. More than the last guy that was in here. Earned my 11th life sentence on that one. Did he just call you Brock? Cassidy asks. Yeah, Eddie Brock. So Cletus pulls himself onto the top bunk, looking back on the man. I've heard of you. You're that Venom guy. You're like me. 
Maybe I won't kill you. And he pulls off his shirt, telling Cletus that they're nothing alike. Now shut up and go to sleep, he snarls. But Cletus just keeps smiling, putting in his earbuds. You don't have to be so rude. We can be friends. In fact, I think you and I have a beautiful future ahead of us. And back in our current day, Carnage laughs as Eddie catches up to him, slamming the monster into the wall hard enough to crack the concrete. They tumble with Eddie rolling up fast. Isn't it so wonderful, Daddy? It's all happening! Can't you hear him? Breathing! He's almost awake! <laughs> the psycho cackles, with Eddie responding by hitting him across the jaw again, knocking him further back. Shut up and die! The truth is, Eddie can hear him. He can hear them all since he bonded with all of the codexes. Cartage's arm snaps out, gripping Brock by the throat, lifting him up, and he throws him away, crashing into another building. Cartage glides over to him on his new wings, taunting him. I can see through the eyes of every one of my horde! Do you know what I see? Below, the heroes are fighting against Carnage's horde, his cult, all of his followers, with even Ben Grimm starting to get overwhelmed. Hold them back! We just need time! Captain America orders them, and in the next room, Osborne has his arm around Peter Parker's throat. They hear a bloody and bruised as he's trying to protect Eddie's son. You know what happens next, don't you? Carnage asks, stalking forward. I kill you, and I have everything that Null needs to grind this world into paste! <laughs> Why fight it? Give me your codex, and together we can rule this world! But Eddie interrupts him as he struggles to his feet. Cletus, I'm begging you, for once in your life, shut up! I don't care about your god. I don't care about you. All I know is I'm taking my symbiote back, and I'm putting you in your grave. And he can see through the eyes of the Horde as well, and he sees the reinforcements are arriving. Other heroes who have worn the symbiotes turning the tide of battle. Carnage screams in anger as Eddie is charging at him, slamming him hard into the wall and then knocking him off of the rooftop. Below, Spider-Man slams his fist into Osborne, knocking the villain to the ground with a mighty blow. He turns back to the two children. Okay, boys, don't worry. All good. He's down. You're, you're safe. Spider-Man then falls to the ground, unconscious, as Dylan and Normie stand over him. I think he's asleep, Dylan nods. And as Carnage and Venom fight through the air together, the psycho begins to laugh again, telling Eddie, You are going to lose! You're going to lose your little boy! <laughs> Inside the room, the symbiote begins to crawl off of Norman Osborne, sliding across the room towards the kids. Get behind me, Normie! Dylan orders, and in the air, Eddie begins to steer them, his fist cracking into carnage again and again. Dylan, go! He's screaming out, and in the room... Dylan's eyes fade to black with a swirl of a codex behind him. The symbiote grows closer, its jaws opening in a jagged grin. You know what? I hate all this symbiote crap! He snarls and the symbiote is suddenly blasted to pieces, spraying it across the room. Normie is shocked, asking Dylan what he did. But the boy passes out, and Normie barely catches him before he falls to the ground. The roof begins to collapse up above as Eddie and Carnage explode through it, with the monster crawling across the floor weakened, and he reaches out for Eddie's son. It's over, Daddy! Little Dylan is the last piece I need! He cackles as Eddie is grabbing at his foot. The symbiote snakes out, wrapping around both children. You've already lost. I kill the boy. I take his codex. Maybe that's enough. Maybe I wake up our god. I'm willing to take that bet. Carnage stands, lifting Dylan into the air. But if you kill me to protect him, if you take your symbiote back, you complete the circle. Eddie struggles to his feet, finally realizing that this was Cletus' plan all along. You see, I win, I win, I lose, I win. <laughs> he laughs, revealing his corpse-like face beneath the mask. I kill your son, or you kill the world. And he stares at the villain for a moment until the symbiote begins to form a blade within his hands. Fine! Screw the world! He snarls as he stabs out with the symbiote blade. Get away from my son! The blade slashes through Carnage's spine, severing it. And he rips back and the corpse of Cletus Cassidy falls to the ground, dead once more. The symbiote wraps around Eddie, bonding with him, and he can hear Venom screaming in his head, asking what he's done. The hive is complete. 
the symbiotes have bonded and Eddie can see it. In the darkness of space, the planet that has become the cell for the dark god Null swirls with Klintar. Deep within its core, Null awaits when suddenly his eyes snap open. He bellows and the Klintar that are holding him there are thrown away. But they begin to return, sliding over the body of the fallen god, melding with him and bonding with him. Others forming horrid creatures. Null is coming. And back on Earth, Eddie stares in the sky, the rain pouring onto his face. Uh, did we win? Spider-Man asks as he struggles to his feet. Yeah, Pete, we won, Eddie tells him. The two stand with Spider-Man telling him, I'm gonna go check on the others. We good? After a brief pause, Eddie pulls Spider-Man in for a hug. We're good, Pete. Thanks for everything. I, I owe you, seriously. Hell, we are whatever we are to each other, right? Spider-Man leaves taking Normie with him and alone, Eddie and Dylan sit on the ground, resting from their ordeal. The two sit, staring off, lost in their own thoughts. And then Dylan finally asks, Uh, did you say that I was your son? Now that Absolute Carnage has ended, we're gonna go back into the Venom storyline. All seemed lost. Carnage was winning. He was collecting the codex from every person who had even worn a symbiote. Scorpion was next on that list, and when Miles Morales intervened, there was hope. He had stunned the Osborne Carnage long enough for Eddie to save Scorpion. However, Miles wasn't so lucky. Elsewhere, the Avengers were dealing with a hybrid maker who had his sights set on Dylan and Normie Osborne. Hybrid maker was proving to be too much for Captain America, Wolverine, and the Thing. So Dylan knew that they only had one last chance to fight back in the form of one of Venom's other children, the Sleeper. Dylan and Normie ran back to Maker's lab to free Sleeper, and as Dylan opened up the container, Sleeper asks, Are you ready to fight alongside your brother Eddie and save all of those that Carnage is hunting down? Dylan holds out his hand to the symbiote and tells him, Yes. So Sleeper begins the bonding process. As Sleeper begins to wrap himself around Dylan, Dylan's eyes turned black and he began to speak in another language. Sleeper released his grip, screaming, Get away from me! Whatever's in your mind is something else. And Sleeper asks him, What are you? Dylan looks at himself, telling him he doesn't even know. Back on the streets, Hybrid Maker is laughing as he easily beats down the Avengers, asking, Is that really it? Is that all you've got? Just then, Hybrid Maker is hit in the chest with an arrow, and a second later, a sonic blast disrupts his connection to the symbionts. Hawkeye then jumps off the jeep that he was riding and sends it into Hybrid Maker, telling him, Sorry I'm late. LA traffic was murder. The jeep goes crashing into a wall, and Hybrid Maker pulls himself out, shouting, Do you really think that was enough? Do you even know what I am? Dylan walks up with Sleeper as he takes the form of a wolf, telling him, No, not really, but my friend might. Sleeper! Kill! Sleeper roars as he lunges forward at Hybrid Maker, biting into his chest, and Spider-Man yells that they have to help, but Dylan tells him, No, wait. Sleeper jumps back and Hybrid Maker asks, What is this? Did you intend to slobber me to death? Dylan tells him that Sleeper is capable of making any chemical from his body. So no, it's not slobber. It's napalm. And Hawkeye laughs, telling him, Metal! And he fires a flaming arrow. Soon everyone hears a loud whoosh as Hybrid Maker's body bursts into flames, and the fire burns bright, causing everyone to cover their eyes. As it dies down, they see Hybrid Maker slipping away into the sewers. And a few hours later, back in the lab, Bruce tells everyone that he and the Hulk had their own run-in with some symbiotes, but everything regarding Maker's machine is sound. The miscalculations have been adjusted to relieve the discomfort that the boys have heard earlier. So if everyone is okay with it, they can proceed and try to remove the codex of a symbiote from Normie's body. As Normie begins the process of removing the codex, Spider-Man tells Dylan that he did good back there. His brother would be proud of him, and Dylan says, yeah, if he ever comes home. He then sits down along the wall with Sleeper, and Sleeper tells him, never do that again. So Dylan apologizes to him. He had to do something, and it just sort of kicked in, like instinct. He didn't even know that he could. Sleeper stops him, telling him, controlling a living thing against its own will is unethical and... So Dylan asks him, how's Telkar, your original host? Sleeper looks at him for a moment and tells him, Napalm was a good idea, but why a wolf? Dylan tells him he's not sure. Maybe it's because he saw Eddie do it with his symbiote, but to be honest, he really isn't much of a dog person. Sleeper tells him that he understands, so maybe this will suffice. After changing form, Sleeper looks like a cat, and Dylan smiles, telling him, yeah, I'd like that a lot. 
That's when a familiar voice calls out to Dylan and he looks up to see Venom walking his way. Eddie pulls back the mask, showing his bruised face, telling him, Hey, buddy. Without a word, Dylan jumps up to hug his brother. Sleeper watches from the shadows, telling him that he'll stay by Dylan's side for what's about to come. He'll protect him and never betray him. But there's one thing that he must ask. When are you going to tell Eddie what you really are? As Edward Brock stares at himself in the mirror, he thinks that it's only been a few weeks since the devil gave him a choice. Save his son or kill the world. He did what any father would have done, and maybe it's not what a hero would have done. The needs of the many and all. Either way, his son Dylan is still standing, and Null is still coming to take the universe. And all they can do is wait. As Eddie looks at his cleanly shaved face, Dylan knocks, stating that the car is here. He'd better hurry. Also, he looks weird without a beard, not really liking it. Eddie asks if he's gonna stick to calling him Eddie. Has he given any thought to calling him, you know, Dylan walks out telling him that he's going to be late. This is important, right? Eddie sighs and Venom tells him, it's going to be okay. Dylan just needs some time to get used to you being his dad. Eddie walks outside where a man is waiting by a car and Eddie tells Dylan to take care of himself while he's gone. He'll be back later. Dylan tells him, yeah. Good luck, Eddie. Eddie pauses for a moment and simply tells him. Yeah, uh, okay. Once Eddie gets into the car, he asks where exactly are they going? Some super secret hideout or... But the driver just doesn't answer and tells him. Please put on your seatbelt. We'll be lifting off shortly. Before Eddie has a chance to ask anything, the wheels on the car flip out and the car shoots into the sky. An hour later over the Arctic Circle, Eddie looks down at the giant dead celestial and the driver says that he apologizes for the turbulence. They've arrived at their destination. Welcome to Avengers Mountain. Cap welcomes Eddie as they land, stating that he appreciates the visit. There are a few things that I and the other Avengers would like to discuss with you. As the door opens up, Venom can feel Eddie panicking and he tells him, Calm down, just breathe. Eddie asks, Do you guys want me as an Avenger? And Cap says, Maybe, maybe not. We're here to have a conversation, Eddie. Eddie looks at Thor and Venom says, We know this one. He defeated Null in the ancient times. We need him as an ally for what is to. And Eddie stops him. No, we don't deserve this. Thor offers his hand, telling him, I've heard great things of the two of you. You've been through hell and stood valiant against the forces of Meliketh and Carnage alike. I, for one, would be honored to have a warrior such as the two of you fighting alongside me. But before Eddie could shake his hand, there's another voice in his head screaming. A twisted, evil voice. A voice that shouts, KILL HIM! SLIT HIS THROAT OPEN! SEE WHAT GOD GUTS taste LIKE! Eddie asks, why would I? And the voice tells him, DO NOT SHUT ME OUT! YOU DON'T GET TO SHUT ME UP! YOU THINK YOU CAN KILL ME?! Everyone sees Eddie pull away and Thor asks, Is something wrong? Are you unwell, Edward Brock? Carnage screams inside of his head. You killed Cletus! And Eddie says, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just, think about it. It's been a rough time for me and Dylan. Venom asks, can you hear me? Where did he? But then Carnage's laugh takes over Venom's voice. <laughs> Cap tells him, of course, you've been through a lot. Here, take this card. If you need anything, just call us, Eddie. No questions asked. Eddie takes the card and he looks at Captain America telling him, okay, yeah, uh, thanks guys. So later that night, as Eddie returns to Liz Allen's home, he opens up the door and heads straight for the bathroom. Dylan asks, how did it all go? And Eddie passes right by him, slamming the door shut. He frantically digs through his bag with Carnage asking, oh, what's the matter? This is what you wanted. You absorbed me into your mind. What the hell did you think was going to happen, Eddie? Eddie begins to take a bottle of pills and Venom shouts, No, not the quiet pills. Please, we can fight this together, Eddie. He opens up the bottle and begins to pour several pills in with Carnage shouting, There's no fighting. You can't shut us out. Take all the pills that you want. Eddie stumbles into his bedroom telling Carnage to shut up. Just shut up. He falls into his bed and he begins to feel as though he's fallen into a lake, a dark black lake. He swims through finding Dylan and as he reaches out towards his son, he then sees Null. Null grabs a hold of Dylan with Dylan shouting, Dad! And he screams as he wakes up. And as he leans up, he feels a wetness on the bed. He looks around to see blood all over and he asks, what did he do? 
As he stands up, he looks in the mirror and sees the words, God is coming, carved into his back. He tells himself, no, not this time. I'm not going to let this evil inside me live. He writes a note for Dylan, giving him a kiss in the cheek, and then he heads outside to make a call. As the person answers, yeah, hey, Cap, no questions asked, right? So a short while later, Eddie is flying a Quinjet to the Isle de Husos, the island of bones. The island has been deserted since a mining disaster in the 40s, and people believed the place to be cursed. Maybe it is. But long ago, he kidnapped Spider-Man, and he took him here. Spider-Man faked his own death, and him and Venom stayed here. They were free. But now that Carnage has returned, it's time to burn every atom of him off the face of the Earth. Eddie grabs a parachute, but soon Venom begins to ask, Can you hear me? We don't have time! You have to be careful! Carnage is! And that's when Carnage lunges out of Eddie into the Quinjet's controls, shouting, Rise and shine! You wanna kill me? Burn me? Good! Let's all burn, Eddie! Soon, one of the engines explodes and Eddie goes tumbling out of the plane. As he plummets to the earth, he crawls out of the burning wreckage, with Venom shouting, Wait! Carnage pulls away from Eddie, asking, Was it worth it? Is this how you wanted to die? Crawling on your belly, begging for your life? Eddie begins to get back up, telling him, You took my other. I'm going to get him back. Carnage asks, Oh, is that right, Papa? And what am I supposed to do? Cower in fear? Eddie tells him, No. I want you to run. As he pulls out the fire. As the fire is roaring behind him, Eddie runs away to a graveyard and begins to look around. He sees one of the grave markers and he begins to rip up the ground, revealing a heavy metal hatch underneath it. He jumps down thinking that he can't imagine the pain that his other is in, but he forces himself to think about it because hate is the fuel of war. These old weapons will help them win the war. Meanwhile, back at the States, Dylan finds himself dreaming, holding Eddie's hand. Voice asks why. Why did he keep it? He's trapping it in a cage, Dylan. Dylan looks up to see Null's face and Null tells him, Show it. Show it. Dylan pulls his arm away, ripping Null's hand off, and Null tells him, Show me. Dylan yells for his father as he wakes up screaming, and Normie asks if everything's all right. Who is the king in black? He kept saying it in his dream. Dylan says that he doesn't know, he just doesn't know anything. And Normie tells him, all right, well, I'm gonna get some breakfast, buddy. Dylan gets up and he pulls out a small box from under his bed and inside of it is a piece of carnage. Back on the island, Eddie gears himself up. The weapons are old and rusted, but he still needs it to work. A flamethrower and with it, he'll put an end to carnage once and for all. Once he's ready, Eddie winds up the old raid siren, knowing it'll attract carnage and whatever the hell he took over when he fled. It'll be excruciating for them, but he'll be ready. As the crazed island animals all charge in, Eddie turns on the gas, creating a ring of fire around him, forcing the animals to go through it to get to him. He pulls back on his bow, stating, We should talk. If you don't want this to end with every living thing on this island dead, Carnage, we should talk, make a deal. Release my other. Release Venom, and you can have this island. No one will bother you. No one will know you're here. You'll be free. If not, then we all burn together. What do you say? We can go our separate. But at that moment, Carnage lashes out from underground, gripping Eddie's hand so he'll break the bow. His head appears and he asks, A deal? You must not have been paying attention. I will force you to dance to the song and slit the throat of every baby on earth. There is nothing you can do about it, Eddie, because you wouldn't hurt your precious other. You wouldn't hurt Venom. Eddie tells him, You're right. That's why he's coming back. Eddie takes out his machete, cutting off the hand that Carnage is trying to infect. After cutting off the hand that Carnage was trying to infect, Eddie sits by a fire, telling himself that he's hearing a voice that he hasn't heard in a long time. His own. Normally there's venom in his head, or somebody else infecting him like Carnage, but this, this is different. Eddie pulls off one of the strings to his boots and begins to wrap his arm up trying to slow the bleeding, but he knows that he only has one chance to really stop it. 
His vision blurs as he reaches out for the machete that he left at the fire, and as he lifts it up, he presses the flat side, cauterizing the wound. He screams as the blade melts the flesh together, and though the pain is excruciating, Eddie forces himself to stand up, because he has a long climb ahead of him. Over in Liz Allen's apartment, Dylan sits atop the roof with his box, and Sleeper tells him that this is insane. He cannot keep a piece of the Carnage symbiote. It must be destroyed! Dylan tells him that it isn't the Carnage symbiote, though, remember? This was a piece of the dragon that his dad fought, the Grendel. It was bonded to Cletus, so he made it all crazy. But when he bonded with that evil alien dude, he did bad things right. But he isn't normally bad. So let's hope that this works. Dylan opens up the box that contains the piece of the symbiote, and Sleeper, the other symbiote that is with him, shouts, What are you doing? It'll kill you! The symbiote wraps around Dylan's arm, and he can feel it trying, but he won't let it. He can feel that it's confused, it's lost, it's trapped. Dylan begins to pull the symbiote off, and Sleeper tells him, I don't understand. When I tried bonding with you, it burned. What is happening? Dylan tells Sleeper, it isn't infecting me. I'm infecting it. Sleeper realizes what's going on, shouting for Dylan to stop. I can feel that it's in pain, Dylan! And Dylan tells him, no. I can see it in my dreams now. It talks to me every night. It threatens me. It threatens my dad. Dylan looks at the symbiote and tells it, show me. Show me, Null. Meanwhile, over at the island, Eddie is crawling his way up the side of the cliff, telling himself that he needs to keep going. He has to keep pushing. He can't let the dark in. He has to get higher. And back with Dylan, he begins to feel something. He can see something. A hive. Soon the image appears in Dylan's mind, and it's not an image, but a vision. A place somewhere far away. What is Dylan seeing? And at that moment, he hears a voice. Venom's voice. And he is calling out for help. He says that Eddie is in trouble, and he needs help. Eddie climbs up higher and higher until he reaches an old radio tower as Carnage's creatures are ripping and tearing into him. And a Carnage yells, This is pathetic! Do you really think that this would work, Edward? You were going to try and call the Avengers to come and save you! Eddie tells him, No, I came up here to pray. Carnage laughs. <laughs> To who? To what? What god do you think can help you now, Eddie? Eddie reaches out, grabbing the tip of the tower, telling him, The only god that has ever beaten you. Thor! Lightning strikes the tower, and Carnage is ripped away from Venom, and Eddie falls to the ground. Both Venom and Carnage skitter towards Eddie, trying to bond. But before he has a chance to see which one gets to him, he falls unconscious. Later, Eddie wakes back up to see Cap asking him, Hey, can you hear me? Eddie shouts, asking what the hell is going on? Where is he? And Cap tells him, hey, it's okay. We received an emergency beacon from a downed plane. We got here as soon as we could. Don't worry, though. Everything's going to be okay. Eddie realizes what's going on. Wait, my other! We have to go back! Cap tells him, I'm sorry, but that's not an option, Eddie. Eddie looks out the window of the helicopter, and he sees a missile fly by. And before he could even ask... That missile makes landfall, nuking the island that Venom and Carnage were left on. Later, as Eddie lays in a hospital bed, he thinks to himself that he can feel it. Phantom limb syndrome is real. The sensation of a missing or amputated appendage that feels like it's still there. Like it's having an itch that you can't scratch, a ghost of what once was. It's been three weeks now, and the pain that he feels about the missing part of him isn't his hand. He can see it in everyone's eyes when they look at him. They'll smile and nod, but it's the look of, when are we going to put the old girl down? At that moment, the door opens with his son running in. Dad? And Eddie tells him, hey, come on in. As Dylan walks over, he stays back, and Eddie asks what's wrong. Dylan sighs, and Cap says, it's okay, son. Just tell him. Dylan hesitates, and then he says that he can't live with them anymore. Cap follows up, telling Eddie, This might sound like a bit of a shock, but with everything that's going on, it would be best for Dylan to be... elsewhere. Eddie yells, No! Wait, I can protect him! I'll keep Dylan safe, it's only been three weeks! Cap asks, Three weeks? Eddie, it's been months. Look out of the window. Null isn't coming. He's here! Eddie watches as Null destroys the city, and Dylan tells him, We might have been able to stop it, but... You left, Dad! Cap tells him, the death toll is already in the thousands. If we had just had some kind of a warning, 
Maybe we could have done something, Eddie. But before they could go on, the nurse tells everyone that he has to ask everyone to leave. Eddie needs his medicine. And Cap tells him, it's okay. We were just leaving. As Eddie calls out to Dylan and Cap, requesting them not to leave, the nurse puts in an IV drip. And Eddie notices something that's different about it. He looks at the red liquid asking, wait, what is this? What are you putting inside of me? And Eddie looks up to see Cletus's face staring right back at him. Time to take your medicine, Pops! Cletus bursts out laughing as Carnage quickly takes over Eddie's body and Eddie realizes something. Back on the island, Venom didn't get to him first. It was Carnage. He is still on the island! Carnage laughs. <laughs> now do you get it? See, you can't win! Now let's work together and go slit them throats! Oh, how about we start with your son? But meanwhile, over with Dylan, he continues to watch, stating that he can't find him. He can't see Null, there's too many. The hive, it's connected all of them, he can see. Wait. An image of Venom appears, and soon the strand of the symbiote explodes into a bright red ball. The ball flattens and turns into a portal, and Sleeper asks, what is going on? Dylan says that he isn't sure, but he knows that he has to go through. He needs to go through and save his dad. As Dylan walks in, he calls out into the darkness, asking if anyone can hear him, and Venom responds, who, who's there? Dylan tells Venom that they need to connect. His father needs him, and Venom asks, Do you think you can remote pilot my kind? Only Null has that power. Are you sure it's... Dylan tells him, It's okay. I can do this. Now where's my dad? Venom begins to apologize, stating that he couldn't stop the red one. He took Eddie. I'm so sorry. I am too weak. Dylan tells him that it's okay. They are stronger when they aren't alone. And Venom says, If your physical form isn't here, we don't have to take the shape of a human. We could be anything. Carnage hears the thundering footsteps. He hears something coming closer. He hears his doom and he turns to ask, What the hell is that? As he turns around, a giant T-Rex Venom crashes through the trees and Dylan shouts through it, Get the hell away from my dad! But we go somewhere else. And as Eddie begins to take a seat, he says that he knows what they hear about him, about them. It's fine, really. He's been hearing the same question ever since the whole thing started. Hell, even from his own kid. Is Venom a good guy or a bad guy? Now, that question, that's a bit tricky. They've been on both sides so many times that it's hard to even keep track. And the answer is that Eddie just doesn't know. It's not that easy. When this all started, he genuinely thought that killing Spider-Man was the right thing to do. Honest, that was Venom's purpose and he agreed with it. But looking back on it now, God, what was wrong with him? It doesn't really answer the question though, but it really kind of does. If he didn't think killing Spider-Man made him a bad guy, then how can he trust himself to answer that now? The truth is he so wants to be a good guy, to be looked at the way that people look at Spider-Man. They see him and they know that everything is going to be okay, but maybe they aren't good enough. But Venom, Eddie, they're trying every day. But before we can go any further, can they agree that it's been an insane few years? Right up top, he lost his job and he's losing his mind. He lost everything. Then the God of the symbiotes came, but we're gonna get back to him. The important thing is, that they are able to push Nell back. But his other was lost in the process. They lost their voice. That, that was a really dark time for Eddie. He was out of control, he was alone, and he didn't like being alone. Then there was the Maker. He came into their lives and ripped everything apart. He made Eddie question everything. He made him face the truth, the demons. But it wasn't all bad because along came Dylan, his son. And Dylan is his whole world now. He looks at him like that, like how people look at Spider-Man. And for the rest of the year, well, first there was a bunch of goblins, then fairy tale monsters fell out of the sky. That one wasn't even his fault. He then got infected by this dreamstone thing and turned into an Asgardian warrior. Then there was the resurrection of Cletus Cassidy and the whole absolute carnage event. And it didn't exactly end when it ended. Because now on the island, Dylan has remote piloted Venom and turned it into a T-Rex while he was being controlled by Carnage. Right now, Eddie is being controlled by Carnage and he is about to fight his son. Dylan fought hard. God, he fought Carnage hard. 
It went back and forth, but then Dylan appeared inside of Carnage, at least in Carnage's mind. It's kind of hard to explain. That's when he found out that Dylan had powers to control the symbiotes. Neither of them really understand it, but the fact is he has the power. While Venom and Carnage fought on the outside, Cletus came inside and that was tough. But Dylan focused himself and he did something that no one else was able to do. He defeated Carnage for good. It was finally over and Cletus and Carnage were no more. Yeah, that about sums it up. They're still trying to figure out everything with Dylan though. There's a lot to unpack there. Eddie then stands up telling the Avengers that that brings him to the next part. They need to know about Null. Cap asks, what is this? No, and Eddie tells him that it's a real bad thing. His other, they can feel something in the air, in the vibrations of the web, so to speak. It's all connected in ways that he's only beginning to understand now, but it feels like the end of the world is about to rain down upon them all. Threats from the inside and out, the old and the new. What's coming for them? He's not so sure they're going to survive in one piece, if they survive at all. They have trusted him this far, and frankly, he's not sure why. But he can promise them that this is the beginning. And what comes next is going to be the hardest thing that they've ever faced. But if you're in, so is he. So if this is their final days, let them come. And this time, Venom will face it with the Avengers. They will face this together. And back on that deserted island where Carnage was defeated, something crawls into the ocean. Something red. We go to a dark alley with a man running away from a beastly figure in the shadows. The man screams out for help, but then slams face first into the broad chest of Eddie Brock. Eddie tells the man to calm down. What's got you so spooked? And the man points back yelling, that, that thing! Eddie looks past the man stating, oh, is that thing all? I'll take care of that. We realize that the monster chasing the man is Venom and he returns to Eddie and the man stares asking, the hell man, what are you doing? Eddie looks back as Venom covers his face, telling the man that he got a little tired of running, thought he'd let his partner bring him in instead. He's a hard man to track down. Now, you've got some information, and we're gonna have a little conversation. Know this, you can lie to us, or you can live, but you cannot do both. So after a short time passes, Eddie hands Dylan his bag, telling him that he got the location mapped out on the GPS. Let's go and get this taken care of. Dylan sighs, asking if they have to, and Eddie tells them that they have to figure out Dylan's connection to the symbiote hive, find out what his nightmares about Null are, they have to figure it all out before Dylan stops him, before Null gets here, but Eddie stops him, no buts, as your dad, this is what we're doing. And as Dylan and Eddie continue, and they talk about preparing for the arrival of Null, they swing off into the night as a large armored man watches from afar, telling them, Oh, now, now, where are you off to, Eddie? A few moments pass and Eddie jumps out in front of an abandoned warehouse. He knocks on the door, but when he gets no answer, he throws his weight into a punch as the door swings open and he comes crashing to the ground. Dylan begins to laugh, asking if he's okay, and Eddie tells him, yeah, yeah, if only the door could have opened up when I knocked. Maker looks at him. What? Oh, yes, sorry, had headphones in. Also, you could have just called me, Eddie. Eddie asks what is he doing and Venom whispers that something isn't right. Maker says that behind him is a gate, a chronal gateway to other universes. It tracks a being's specific DNA pattern and directs them towards, well, I'm not going to waste your time trying to explain it. Dylan says that he can feel something wrong. He can't sense the symbiote on the Maker. And Eddie asks, what does he mean? And Dylan says that he doesn't know how to explain it. It's like there's a hole in the Maker. So the Maker continues his work stating, ah, so you know, that's good. Uh, you are fascinating. Your ability to sense others, what you've become, Dylan. Hopefully it will help when Null arrives. That there's something left in this world when it's all said and done. Eddie asks him, what is he talking about? Where are you going, Maker? And Maker laughs, telling him, Once upon a time, I would not entertain answers about my plans. I would have taken you questioning me as a threat, Edward. But simply put, I will not explain. I am leaving, or rather, we are. A Venom symbiote begins to cover the Maker, and Eddie lunges in, but the Maker holds out his fist, punching into Eddie, expelling him from Venom. Maker then explains that before they begin fighting, the reason they cannot sense his symbiote is because it is not of this world. And what's more, it is different, Edward. The symbiote was made in a lab, which makes it synthetic, artificial, which means it can be improved. As Venom quickly returns to Eddie, Eddie says that he doesn't really care where he's going or what he's up to. He just needs the Maker to look at Dylan and 
But just then, the alarms begin to blare, and the maker says that it would seem that we have an intruder, Edward. Don't be alarmed. It would take the collected ordinance of an army to breach this. Suddenly, Venom screams out, It's Virus! And a second later, Virus blows open the door with pumpkin bombs, asking if he thought he could run. Eddie shields Dylan, and Maker asks, And who the hell are you supposed to be? But Virus ignores him and opens fire on Eddie, asking, Did you think you could get away from ruining my life? You and your little boy are about to. But Eddie launches himself at a Virus, yelling, I don't even know who you are, but if you threaten Dylan again... Virus punches back, asking, You'll do what? While the two of them begin to fight Maker size, asking, Why can I never get any work done while this man is around? Suit? The symbiote suit responds, stating, Yes, sir. And the Maker holds out his arms, telling it, Wrist cannons. The Maker opens fire, with Virus using Eddie as a shield, stating, At least you're good for something, Eddie. Eddie responds with, And what are you good for? Your taped up armor couldn't even take a bullet. And what is that thing you're flying on? An old goblin glider? Who are you? Virus chucks him into a wall. You want to know who I am? I'm the man whose life was ruined. My name is... But before he could say it, another explosion goes off with the maker screaming out, No! The portal begins to activate, and it begins to suck everybody in, sending them all to different alternate universes. The Maker wakes up first, realizing that he is home now, that he is in 1610, the ultimate universe. He looks around at the destroyed cities with signs on them stating, where are the ultimates? And he states, oh, oh, this, this is perfect. Elsewhere, Venom yells at Eddie, wake up, this place is maddening, cannot think, too many voices, need your help, please wake up. Eddie slowly picks himself up, stating that he is there. And when he sees Dylan, he runs over asking if he's okay. Dylan groans, waking up, stating, It's so loud! Where are we? And Eddie tells him that he isn't sure. They just need to get home. But as he looks out into the city, he sees dozens of flying vehicles and realizes he's not in Kansas anymore. As Eddie begins to take it all in, though, something doesn't feel quite right. Something feels off. Normally, Venom could pick up on its surroundings, but Eddie asks, where is it? And Venom tells him, I have no freaking idea, Eddie. Dylan gets up asking what's going on, and Eddie tells him that he isn't too sure. His memory's still a bit foggy. He remembers they went to the Maker to try and help Dylan. But then there was a fight in, wait, Virus! At that moment, almost on cue, Virus jets in attacking, shouting, What did you do to me? Before Virus could even get a hit in, though, Eddie quickly pushes Dylan out of the way and is launched over the side of the building. Virus follows up with a punch, but for some reason, this one actually hurts. Eddie groans and Venom tells him that Virus is using vibrational frequency gauntlets. They need to end this. Fast! Eddie roars as he bites onto Virus's arm, telling him, You have no idea how lucky you are! We try to make it a rule that we don't kill people in front of my kid, but my kid's not here! The two continue exchanging blows as they fall faster and faster down to the ground. But then Eddie webs up Virus, locking his arms in place. Venom tells Eddie that he's trying to focus so that he can help, but there's so much interference in this place. There is a hive mind that is so close, so powerful, maybe. Virus breaks free from the webbing, shouting, You have no idea what pain you've caused me, Eddie! And Virus rockets forward, with Venom realizing that by tapping into the hive, we have learned things from the hive mind. We are capable of so much. It's beautiful. Eddie tries to ask what he's talking about, but wings sprout out of Eddie's back, and he flies straight up into Virus. Eddie slams Virus into one of the buildings, and Virus kicks back, unlocking his suit's payload. Virus gives chase, asking, Have you had enough yet? Are you going to try and run? Well, you don't get to run. You don't get to outrun death. Before Eddie could respond, Virus unleashes a devastating beam, burying Eddie into the ground. Venom tells Eddie to get back up. We've learned something. Eddie looks at his arm and it begins to split apart and he asks, What is happening? That hurts. It feels like it's going to explode. Venom tells him to focus on Virus. They can take his energy. We can store it. We can redirect it. Virus flies in to deliver the final blow, but as Eddie aims his arm, he releases a blast more powerful than Virus is sending him flying across the city. He looks back at his hand, stating that it hurt like hell, but this, this feels amazing. Just then, Dylan calls out for help, and Eddie quickly slingshots himself into the sky, growing out the wings, slamming back down onto the rooftop where he left Dylan. But when he looks up, he sees Captain America. 
and all of the other Avengers behind him, all with a symbiont emblem on them. Cap says that he's going to need him to step out of the symbiont and put his hands behind his head. Eddie stops, stunned. Hang on a sec. You know who I am. What are you? But Cap pulls out his gun, telling him, We have no idea who you are. And I'm going to ask you again, nicely. Remove the symbiont and put your hands on your head. Now, Dylan nervously says, Uh, I can sense them. Something is wrong with them. They aren't. At that moment, a red beam is fired into Eddie and Virus climbs up again, yelling, You cannot outrun me with the tech that I have. It would take an army. All of the Avengers turn their fire onto Virus, and during the confusion, Eddie webs up Dylan and yanks him off the building with him. Dylan yells out, we can't leave Virus! And Eddie says, oh yes we can, and we are! Getting you to safety is what is important right now. Besides, Virus can handle himself. Back up on top, everyone takes their turns of beating down Virus. And just as Cap gets ready to bring down his shield, Virus says that he always wanted to kill an Avenger. As Cap closes in, Virus opens up with his cannon, blowing away most of Cap's torso. As the pieces of Cap slowly begin to pull themselves back together, though, he responds with, Oh, that hurt. An anti-symbiote tech is illegal. You just earned yourself a trip to the hive. Meanwhile, down below in the sewers, Dylan asks, what are they going to do? Eddie says that they just need to find somewhere to lie low for a bit. There has to be an explanation for all of this. Someone they can go to for help. And at that moment, a blinding light shines on them and a voice says, I don't know who you are. But if you're running from them, come with us. However, for Virus, the ones that he met aren't so welcoming. He's dragged off through a long hall, asking what are they doing? Let me go! The symbiote Thor punches Virus so hard that his helmet breaks, and a man on a throne asks, Why have you brought this man to me? Thor says that this man possesses forbidden technology. He wears anti-symbiote armor. What shall we do with him? The man on the throne stands up. Remove his helmet, and as the symbiotes do, the man leans in, stating, I have no idea who this man is. Down below, the group asks Eddie, where is he from? And Eddie says that that's going to be a little hard to answer. The leader says they can tell that he is human, mostly. They are the only ones left who haven't been taken over by Codex and his hive. Eddie asks, Codex, who's that? And what does that even mean? You're the only ones left of what? The leader tells him that they are the only ones left of humanity. Eddie then says, Are you the leader of this underground thing or whatever? And the leader steps forward, stating that they are just an agent. Eddie sees the Agent Venom suit in front of him, and he runs up asking, Flash! You're Flash! The person is stunned, asking, Do you mean Eugene Thompson? You think that I'm the ex-president of what used to be the United States? No, sorry. How about we start off with who you are? Eddie pulls back his symbiote, showing his face. My name is Edward Brock, and this is my son, Ed. At that moment, the leader pulls back their symbiote to show their face, and a woman in tears pauses. Eddie? Dylan asks who is that, what is going on, and his tears roll down Eddie's face. He sees his ex-wife. Annie? Eddie steps forward, thinking that he'd never see his ex-wife again. And Annie pulls her gun, telling him to stop. Don't do this to her. He works for Codex. Tell her now how he is here. Tell her! Eddie tells her that he was chasing a man in this world. He calls himself the Maker. They fell through some kind of wormhole and they landed in this crazy future. He's just as confused as she is. Annie tells him to prove it. How did he get his symbiote? And Eddie explains that one night he was at a church when he lost his job and her. It was going to end it all. She holsters her gun telling him that this, this is all because of him. And Eddie asks how that is even possible. She says that in this world, her world, that night he went into the church, he pulled the trigger. Eddie steps back. What? No, I never meant to. I, I can't imagine what. Annie stops him, stating that she mourned for him. She almost lost her mind. She hated him for leaving her, hated his father for never being there for him, and hated herself because she could never make him believe how much she loved him. She was so lost, so confused, so angry. She was so mad at herself, his father, and that Parker idiot who drove him to this. And then something dark felt that anger. It came to her, and then Eddie tells her to wait. Her symbiote looks different then. And Annie says that it's probably like his. Her started immediately spawning, preparing for something horrible that was coming. At least their lead scientific officer thinks so. 
She was drafted into a shadow unit by their sadly former president to train new recruits. They were led by a man named Rex Strickland, the first human to ever bond with a symbiote. Rex and President Thompson died in the big war with Codex, and now they're all that's left. Do you want to meet them? Each of the soldiers behind Annie pulls their symbiote back to reveal their faces. The first is a smiling, mustache-wearing Peter Parker, stating that he is that idiot reporter from, well, you know me. Next is Cletus Cassidy, then Agent Wade Wilson, and Wade says that the people around here call him dead, but the final member, Andy Benton, tells him that they don't. No one calls him that. Eddie shouts, asking, Cassidy, you have that lunatic on your team? And Annie holds out her arm, stating that Cletus was the first to join them, and yes, he has a past. But with Rex's training and a lot of help from their science officer, Cletus is one of their best agents. Peter says that his spider sense is going off. Something is coming. They have to move. And as he finishes that, a symbiote juggernaut bursts in, followed by a symbiote Sabretooth thing, Omega Red, and Wolverine. Annie yells that they must have tracked him in the kit. Get your game faces on. The team charges in, with Annie telling everyone to not pull any punches. Remember, they aren't human. Eddie punches Juggernaut, stating that he is way ahead of him. But Juggernaut gets back up and nearly punches Eddie's head off, shouting, We are Juggernaut! Omega Red wraps Annie up, slamming her into the wall, stating that they will end this quickly. And that's when his head is shot off, as Wade busts out laughing. But while he isn't looking, Wolverine steps in, slamming his claws into Wade Wilson's back. And as Wade pushes off, he rips open his suit, telling everyone, You've arrived to play an X. And the X stands for SPLODE, by the way. Eddie sees all the C4 strapped to Wade's chest, and he tells everyone to run. And as Wade says, All right, for everyone staying, let's go out with a joke, huh? Knock, knock. The thing asks, who the hell does he think he is? And Wade says, I'm the only guy who's going to survive this. Cue the laugh track. A second later, the entire tunnel system explodes, bringing down tons upon tons of rock and rubble onto the symbiotes. But back in Codex's lab, symbiote Doc Ock says that they have been successful in achieving full symbiosis. Codex says to release him and Virus falls out of the test tube with Codex telling him that he has been cooperative. His name was Virus, yes. We'll need to change that. Virus stands up and he tells him, No, Eddie paralyzed me. He took my legs. He ain't taking my name. From now on, call me Scorpion. I'm Mac Gargan. Codex tells him, Very well, Mr. Gargan. Now, get back on your knees and sweat your allegiance to me. And bring me Eddie Brock. Back with the others, Annie brings Eddie to the base, stating that she would like them to meet their science tech and leader, Reed Richards. Eddie looks at the old mangy beard and hair, the goofy looking metal skull cap wearing cross-eyed Reed Richards, and he says, great, another one. Annie says that she knows that he's off his rocker a bit, but he's all they have. So Reed shakes Eddie's hand and then moves to Dylan asking, and what is your name? And Dylan answers, and Reed says, D -d 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 Dylan? Annie pulls Eddie to the side, asking, Wait, is it Dylan your son? Is he yours? Eddie tells her yes. Now will you please tell me what the... Annie tells him that in their world, Dylan is Codex. So she explains, they had a normal life, as normal as a single parent could provide at least. But one night she came home with something to eat and noticed that something was wrong. There were all these drawings, and Dylan was stating, coming, yes, the light is, has to die. She tried to reach out to him, but when she touched him, he took part of her symbiote, and that's when she lost him, and it all happened so fast. Reed and the others tried to help him, to free him of whatever was going on, but it was too late. Using the piece of the symbiote that he took, he was able to spawn hundreds more symbiotes, and then thousands, and then there were more of them than people. In the beginning, he seemed to be bonding to them, wearing symbiotes like all the others. But as the war waged on and his powers grew, he began to shed the hosts, to reject them, to control them in a way that no one thought possible. Dylan became a living hive mind, able to control the symbiotes even if he wasn't bonded to them. And together, they spread across the planet smothering whole continents and leaving nothing in his wake but darkness and the people he had assimilated into his hive mind. No one was prepared. No one could stop him. He destroyed the world. Her son killed the world, Eddie. She's going to assume that his Dylan is like that too. Does he have the same powers? Is he able to remote pilot the symbiotes? Is he able to sense them, hurt them, even destroy them with his mind? Eddie tells her no, but then yes. His Dylan can do all of those things, but he is not the same. His Dylan isn't able to bond with the symbiotes at all. 
He's not a danger to them, he's just a little. But as Eddie reaches out, Annie pulls away, telling him not to touch her. She isn't his Annie. He is not her Eddie. And that, that thing that he brought here is not. Dylan steps out of the shadows. I can hear you. It's okay, I'm not a baby. I'm not like him, the other one. Codex, you called him? I know that I'm not your son. I know that I don't have a mom, but that's okay. Please don't be afraid of me. Annie places her hand on Dylan's shoulder, but as her suit pulls back, she says that she's sorry. She can't do this. She leaves and she hears Wade calling out to her, and as she gets ready to run to him, Wade's head falls into the water, rolling over, telling them that they need to get the hell out of there. Annie asks what is he talking about, but Wade tells her to just shut up and get everyone out now. We've been tracked. They sent. But before he could finish, Scorpion bursts through the wall, clamping down on Annie's head, shouting, Where is he? Where is the child? Eddie pushes everyone back as he grabs a hold of the exposed wires and Reed says, Wait, no one can survive that amount of energy coursing. But Eddie tells him, I know, I'm counting on it. He tightens his grip, turning his free arm into a cannon, firing it into Scorpion's head, yelling, Get off my wife! With Scorpion stunned, Eddie turns back to Dylan, telling him, Now! Dylan focuses his power, and a few seconds later, the symbiote covering Scorpion explodes. And he gets up asking, who is that man? And Eddie grinds his teeth, grabbing Scorpion, telling him, That's Mac Gargan! Or is it a virus now? It was you. My other kid sense it. It was you in that ridiculous suit. This is all your fault! Scorpion shuts. You paralyzed me! And Eddie stops for a moment. What? Scorpion struggles, telling him that Carnage almost ripped out his spine. And they just left him there. They can't walk away from that. It's not fair. Eddie sets Scorpion down, telling him, No, I can't. So we're gonna make a deal. That symbiote came from Codex. We can smell it, which means you know where Codex is. And you're gonna take us to wherever that is. A short while later, after Scorpion's examination, Reed says that he's talking with Mac here, and the armor that he was wearing is from an alternate world's version of War Machine MK3, designed by their world's Tony Stark. The good news is that the armor came standard with an automated environment and technology scanning equipment for the purposes of engaging multiple targets at once. So if he can get his hand on, oh, this tracking unit, they'll be able to build a gate back to Eddie's world. Eddie says, Okay, assuming we can even get that suit, how long are we looking to build it? Reed scratches his metal dome, telling him that with the limited resources that they have, he can confidently state for maybe five years tops. Annie tells everyone okay, meeting adjourned. They have been working nonstop and they need to get some sleep. They'll regroup in the morning and plan their attack. A little while later, after everyone goes to bed, she preps her guns, stopping. She says that she can hear them sneaking about. She doesn't care which one of them it is. She can't sleep and is a bit cranky. So now is not the... Dylan walks in. It's okay. I couldn't sleep either. Annie says that when they touch, her symbiote didn't burn. How is that? But rather than answer, Dylan hugs her. A few moments of silence go by and Dylan says, Because I'm not him. I'm not a part of Codex's hide and neither is Eddie. And Eddie's symbiote doesn't get hurt by my touch either. So I figured it'd be the same for you. I know it's weird for you to be around me since you lost your Dylan, to see me walking here, but I was lost too when I was a baby. You at least have memories of the things you lost. I have nothing of you. And when it was all over, if the machine can get us home, I might not want to leave. Maybe you'd let me. But Annie just hugs him before he can finish. Later, over at Codex's base, he looks at the images of Eddie and Dylan, and Doc Ock asks, what is this? Doc Ock tells him that Scorpion's suit had a considerable, one could even say obsessive, amount of reaches on his target. One that he calls Venom. Their world's version of it, at least. Codex says his father. He's here. In their world. But he's not a part of the Hive. On the other world, there's a connection. A voice that calls to him. Speaks to him to save it. It's almost as if, in their world, this voice. This black god is coming. Just then the alarms go off and Doc Ock types away at the computer stating that the enemies are inbound. Looks like one craft, unmanned. Why would they? Codex says, ah, I see, brace for impact. The ship is not unmanned. In fact, I believe daddy's home. A few seconds later, Eddie comes crashing in on the Fantastic Four hover ship and Annie charges in with her agents. Codex tells Eddie that he will bow. Wait, your symbiote, it won't. And Eddie asks, what, won't obey? We ain't from around here, boy. As Codex swings, Eddie reaches out, grabbing the mask, and Codex asks, 
You can't help but see your little boy, huh? But what you face is not a boy, but a god! Behind them, Cletus opens fire on the Avengers, telling everyone to keep pushing. Andy tries to shoot Codex and tells Eddie that this is his chance. Eddie grabs a hold of Codex, and Codex asks him, What? You can't even fight your own son! And Eddie says, no, I can't! It reminds me too much of how I failed! This world is everything I tried to protect my Dylan from! This is every nightmare that I've ever had about my son! So no, I won't fight! But Venom will! Venom seeps into Codex as he shouts, No, you can't! This is impossible! I can't bond with! At that moment, Venom whispers into Codex's head, telling him, Please, we don't want to hurt you. We just want to show you a world where... But before Venom could finish, Eddie is shot from behind, and Scorpion wearing the virus armor tells him, Look what I found, Eddie. Eddie looks back. We had a deal. And Scorpion tells him, Yeah, and you're gonna put me back in prison when this is all over. At that moment, Scorpion charges in, and he is hit with a blast that dismantles the virus suit. Reed walks in with his giant gun and stating, No matter the universe, I know the MK3 war armor machine. And how to shut down with one localized reactor EMP. You see, in this world, and I suppose any other, Tony Stark was a friend of mine. Andy then helps Dylan, stating that it's time. And Venom whispers to Codex, We're gonna take over for a moment. Please be calm. Codex is confused. Who? What is... But as Dylan touches Codex's hand, the two begin to see what their lives could have been. The shared memories between them, the life they've never known of, and that this is how they will win. How they will beat the darkness that was given to them. How they can beat it together because they are stronger when they aren't alone. Dylan slumps over and Annie asks if it worked, and Eddie says that he thinks so. They got him. Without the symbiote influence, Codex says, Mom? And Annie runs over asking if he's okay. He closes his eyes as he tells her, You were supposed to bring dinner home. And with his words trailing off, Annie tells him to wake up. Please, she's here. She's here now. Years go by and the world is slowly being rebuilt without Codex's symbiotes controlling everything. As Eddie, Annie, and Dylan walk through the park, Eddie asks if there have been any other updates and Annie says, not yet. The doctors state that the damage done to him could take years to recover from, that that thing, that null thing that they talked about, that it has claws in him deep. But he's alive and that's all she cares about. Coma or not, her boy is home. Another few months pass, and Reed gathers everyone stating that he's done it. He's been able to assemble a functioning version of the dimensional gate in less than quarter of the time. Now the machine is quite sound, but he is ethically bound to tell them that he is legally insane. So honestly, who knows? Ha <laughs> ha! Anyway, please step forward. As Eddie and Dylan walk forward, Eddie returns back to Annie, stating to give it some time to, but she stops him. She says that she's not going to go. Her Dylan hasn't awoken yet, and when he does, she wants to be there for him. Besides, from what he said about how he left his world, he's got his own messes to clean up. But remember, when Scorpion attacked, he screamed, get the hell away from my wife. Eddie begins to tell her that he's sorry, but Annie leans in kissing him, stating that she liked it. She liked having that for a moment. She turns to Dylan and says that he's going to need to take care of Eddie, and if he hears the voices, the voice is calling him away. Just remember hers. As Eddie and Dylan get ready to pass the gate, Eddie tells Annie goodbye. Maybe in another world. And Annie says, maybe then. A few moments later, back on the prime earth, Dylan asks if they made it. Are they home? And Eddie tells him, yeah, we are, but where did the stars go? Thank you for watching today's episode of Comic Story in a Full Story. Let me know in the comments down below what you thought about this and who your favorite superhero is. And don't forget, you can check out the Comic Story in main channel to get daily videos. You can join us over at Comic Story in Movies, aka Absolutely, the podcast channel, to get our opinions on everything going on in the world of superhero movies, comic books, and video games. Or you can join us over at Manga Story, and where we talk about manga. And don't forget to click the link down below to support us further. This hot sauce is a hot sauce that we have created. Hatch and Jalapeno is a flavor that we created which involves infusing whiskey into a hot sauce. No, it's not alcoholic and yes, it is FDA approved. Anyway, once again, thank you so much for watching today's video. I'll see you next time right here.